Okay, we'll reconvene the city council. We just had a closed session. We'll now reconvene in open session with a study session. Mr. McGlynn. Yes, 3.1, progress, progressive parking review, Kim Nadeau and Raisa De La Rosa presenting. And can I can just confirm too, is council member Combs on the line? Yes, I, I'm on. Great, welcome Julie. Thank you, I'll, I'll keep it muted so you don't hear everything here. Good afternoon. Hello. I, I'm uh, waiting for the projector to work. <laughs> uh, I'm Kim Nadeau, parking manager, city of Santa Rosa, and I'll be here to give you this um, study session reviewing the parking program since the implementation of progressive parking. Uh, can we take a little bit of a break so we're not waiting? Technical difficulties will be resolved shortly. Sure, we'll temporarily recess this meeting. And it looks like we're back. the city invited Professor Donald Shoup to come here and uh, review the parking inventory that we had and to speak about his philosophy of parking management. At the time, he was a professor at UCLA of economics and urban planning. He observed that there was a high demand uh, areas in the downtown where it was difficult to find a place to park and that there was plenty of available parking in garages and some off-street lots. His philosophy to best manage parking supply is market-based and related to demand, setting the price at the lowest rate that achieves 85% occupancy or one empty space per block. Following his visit, the city council established as one of its council goals to explore the feasibility of implementing Dr. Shoup's philosophy, also known as progressive parking. In 2016, the city hired Nelson Nygaard to review the city's parking program and occupancy data and made recommendations on strategies that could be implemented to improve access to these high demand parking areas and utilize Shoup's market-based pricing philosophy. In 2017, the council approved new garage and parking meter fees based on demand to better distribute the use of parking through the facilities and to improve access. This included establishing two meter pricing zones known as the premium and the value zones. Council also authorized the chief financial officer to adjust parking meter rates up or down by no more than 25 cents an hour, not more than every six months to achieve that 85% occupancy goal. So, in um, 2017, September of 2017, a low wage employee discount permit was implemented at the 1st and 7th Street garages, which um, are offered at half off for $31 a month. In November 2017, we implemented the first hour free at the 1st and 7th Street garages and also lowered the hourly rate to 50 cents an hour to encourage use of those facilities. In February 2000, uh, 2019, a discount commuter permit was implemented and that is offered at the First Street Garage, which is located next to the Transit Mall, and that permit is also $31 a month. And then in August 2019, um, we implemented free parking at the Fifth Street and D Street Garages on Sundays, and also implemented, matched the free parking on holidays at the meters is matched at the garages as well. So in January of 2018, we implemented the value and uh, premium zones. And the premium zone area represents one third of the parking metered spaces. Those rates went up to $1.50 an hour and the hours of enforcement were shifted two hours later. It used to be 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and now it's 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. in the premium area, and that was based on the occupancy data that had been collected that showed that there was a strong demand for parking in this premium zone after six o'clock. The value zone, which again is two-thirds of the parking meters, had those enforcement hours 
reduced by two hours. So it no longer started at 8 a.m., it started at 10 a.m., and it still stops at 6 p.m. And the objectives of all this were to make parking easier to find in those high demand areas, to reduce people circling, looking for a space in the high demand areas, and to increase and maintain turnover of spaces in the downtown for people who are running errands and, and shopping, and to provide more options for residents and visitors coming downtown at different price points and different um, time limits. So we have places where you can park for all day and then we have shorter term places where we are hoping that you're gonna be moving along and then we have different price points. So this is a map that I'm sure you've all seen before but just to, to recap, it shows the, the blue area is the premium zone, the green area represents the value zone and the, the lots and garages are also shown on there. So looking at the data, this, um, graph is comparing 2018 occupancy data, peak occupancy data to 2019. And um, the first half of the year, you'll see that the, the red peaks, which are for 2019, are generally exceeding 2018. The second half of the year, you'll see more of the blue or the 2018 peaks being the top peaks. But across the board, you're seeing that 85% occupancy is, it regularly exceeds the 85% occupancy target. And you might notice those two drops in May and July, those are from Iron Man when a lot of the streets are closed and so the spaces aren't available and you, you won't have occupancy data for that, for that time frame. Another way to look at the data is by looking at the average occupancy, and then we can look at it by hour. So here you can clearly see the two peaks um, of demand that we have. Uh, we've got the noon hour roughly, you know, 11 to one, and then we've got the, that dinner time evening peak of six to eight o'clock. And you'll see that in looking at Monday through Friday, there's been a slight drop in 2019 um, occupancy at that noon hour, um, and that the six to eight o'clock hour is, is pretty much, it's almost identical. And then looking at Saturday, you see a little drop at the noon hour, and then you see a, a small increase in demand at that six to eight o'clock uh, time frame for um, parking in the, in the premium zone. This slide compares the data that we have from 2017 before we implemented the progressive parking and 2019 when we had, uh, while we've had progressive parking in place. So here you can see that, again, you see the two peaks and you'll see that the demand at the lunch time period is higher in 2019 than it was in 2017. And then you see the, the same, um, strong demand from six to eight o'clock. Of course, you don't see that in 2017 because paid parking stopped at six o'clock. And this slide demonstrates why the hours were shifted in the premium zone because you can see that the occupancy in the morning at 9 a.m. was only 27%, whereas the occupancy at 7 p.m. is over 80%. And so that was the thinking behind making the changes based on the Shupian um, model is looking at where the demand is. And because the demand wasn't that high in the morning, it didn't make sense to have the paid parking start that early. And looking at the value zone, um, you can see that the 2019 peaks are, are pretty much across the board exceeding the 2018 peaks um, and that, uh, it rarely exceeds 70% and it pretty much it hovers around 65% in the value zone. When you look at that data from the hourly perspective, um, 18 and 19, Monday through Friday, are almost identical. And then you'll see on Saturdays, we've seen an improvement of uh, higher utilization of the value zones in on Saturdays. In looking at all of the transactions for the whole system. This slide shows uh, that parking meter transactions, which are shown in that kind of brownish gold color, have increased uh, every year. And the garage transactions have dipped slightly, although when you 
put them all together, the total transactions have increased every, every year, although not dramatically in the last two years, it's been a slow uptick. The, this slide is looking at just uh, garage transactions where people pull a ticket. So this doesn't include um, people who have permits. And please accept my apology. There is a column on the far left that shouldn't be there, there that was a cut and paste error. So ignore that one that says 2.5 million on down. I apologize for that. So setting, stepping aside from that. So what you can see here is that the 7th Street and 1st Street garages have shown an increase in utilization, which I attribute to the first hour free and the 50 cent an hour rate there. And then you see a drop in daily users at the other three garages, which may indicate that people who are parking in those three garages ha have found it more attractive to go park in the two garages where it's less expensive. It, it could be some other factor, but that's one possibility is why we're seeing that change. In looking at garage permit sales, um, you can see here that the Fifth Street garage is the workhorse of our downtown as far as employee parking. That is the one that's shown in the dark red slash brown. So there's over 600 permits sold in that garage. Uh, if you look at the Third Street garage, which is our smallest garage, and you see no change, it's because there's only 35 permits available there. There's always a waiting list. We, we're always sold out, so that has no fluctuation at all. And the other three garages right now are all in the same ballpark uh, of permit sales around the 350 range. And you see that peak in 2000, that, that top line represents the cumulative total permit sales and it peaked in 2016-17. I'm not sure why that there was that uptick there, but the general trend of the line is that it's been slowly going up with permit sales. We sell, in addition to this, we sell uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 350, 360 permits in lots also. So total, it's over 2,000 permits that are sold a month. In looking at revenue, before I talk about this slide, I wanted to talk a little about the difference between the parking district and its program and, park, and the parking enforcement program. The parking enforcement program is not reflected on this slide. The parking program is reimbursed by the general fund for the cost to deliver uh, parking enforcement services and all of the revenue that's generated from citation issuance is deposited to the general fund. So for the parking fund, it's it's a pass through for us in terms of our cost. It, it's a wash, we provide the services, we're reimbursed by the general fund and it's just a net zero. So this slide is looking at the revenue that's generated by parking user fees and the costs that are associated with maintaining the parking facilities, the assets, the lots, the garages. Um, so I just want to make it clear this is, doesn't include the enforcement side. So for the first three fiscal years that you see up here, those are actual numbers, so these are years past, and you can see that the, the budget is structurally sound, the revenues exceed the expenditures, and for the future years, I assumed that revenues would be flat, that there wouldn't be any change in, in rates, and I assumed a 5% annual increase in the cost of uh, operations and maintenance. And so at that track, when you get to the out year, um, we could potentially be looking at a structural, getting close to a structural deficit were there to be no changes, and that's a long time out, and likely there will be changes, but the, the black line that you see indicates the deferred maintenance that we've identified. So we have over, um, re well, roughly $20 million of capital improvement projects that have been identified to extend the useful life of the facilities. And we have about $8 million in our, in reserves in our budget. So the fact that our revenues exceed our operations and maintenance is what allows us to supplement that reserve fund so that we will have the funds available to be able to make these repairs that are necessary to operate the parking program. 
And to put in perspective those, those uh, deferred maintenance costs, um, this is showing you that the insured values of the garages is about $90 million, which if you divide that by all the spaces we have is about $30,000 a space. If you were to reconstruct, which is a little low for what the industry um, indicates it would cost, especially in our area, to replace the facilities. So it, it, it's worth the investment of doing the maintenance that's required to extend the useful life of the garages. It's way less expensive than it would be to, to replace them. Oh, and another note I wanted to make. I've heard from the council that you appreciate street names for the facilities and are not so fond of the numbers. <laughs> so we're, we're making every effort to, to use the, the locational names in these um, presentations that we're giving to you and staff is, is working now on identifying signs and systems and documents that would need to be changed to, to make this a broader change. So we're working in that direction. We're looking to see how much is involved in doing that. So I also looked at comparable cities to see what they were doing with regard to um, parking. And I have this on two slides, so I might flip back and forth because I couldn't fit it all on one. But there are several cities who are doing a very similar zone rating program that we're doing, Walnut Creek, San Mateo, San Luis Obispo. San Leandro is another one that I found um, since I started working on this. Uh, and then there are also cities that um, have parking that goes to later hours, like uh, Walnut Creek, um, Monterey goes till eight o'clock at night, West Sacramento goes till 10 o'clock at night every day of the week. So there's a wide variety of what cities are doing, um, and not just in California, but across the country, this concept that Dr. Shoup put out there, you know, 15 years ago, really seems to be becoming more of the norm, um, and as has become, it, it's more frequent that, that we see that being implemented. Um, with regard to enforcement data, approximately 88% of all of the citations that are issued are appealed, and about 7% of them are uh, issued warnings. When you look at be the, between the six and eight o'clock hours, uh, about 21% have been, the, the, have been issued warnings in that time frame. And did I, say, I think I just said that wrong, 18% warnings, 21% of the total citations that are issued are issued between six and eight o'clock at night. And 20% of the time of enforcement is, I gotta say this the right way, we have 10 hours of paid enforcement time, two hours of that would be 20% of the paid enforcement time in the premium zone. Um, so the rate of citations issued is in line with the number of hours in the day that ticket, tickets could be issued. Less than 2% of all of the transactions that take place in Santa Rosa receive a parking citation. And um, you'll note that more, that there's been an increase in citations issued um, in particular in fiscal year 1819, which is a year where we added a part-time um, parking enforcement officer. We now have three full-time and two part-time uh, parking enforcement officers, and they uh, have quite a bit of territory to cover. They work Monday through Saturday. They have six residential, well now seven residential permit zones to, um, to patrol with the addition of the West End. And then there was two additional blocks added to the downtown um, residential permit area. And we've received a petition that's under review now for another residential permit zone in the Olive Park area. So they were having a hard time being able to patrol all of that area, which was why we had requested um, the addition of a, of a part-time PEO. And that accounts for at least part of why you see an increase in citations in that year. Oh, and one other thing I wanted to say is that um, we, we've, I've received feedback that people uh, still don't understand that we have paid parking until eight o'clock. So we are, um, we issued many, many warnings at the beginning of the program, but we eased off on that. But given the feedback that we've received, we are now issuing warnings 
uh, between six and eight o'clock to vehicles who have not received a ticket or a warning before between six and eight o'clock at night. So people who don't know will have a freebie and will get a, a warning with and a piece of little informational piece that lets them know that parking is it, in that area goes to, to eight o'clock. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Raisa De La Rosa, the Economic Development Manager. She's gonna talk about sales tax data. Yeah, so uh, we thought it would be helpful to give you a little bit of, uh, of again, sales tax data to go along with your parking data, um, just to get an understanding of where we are, what's going on right now in the city. So for anyone who saw or read about Dr. Thornburg's recent economic forecast, I just wanna start by saying, that overall Sonoma County's and Santa Rosa's economy is is stable. So we're doing pretty good. We're fortunate uh, to have a diverse economy here uh, and our indicators are on the positive side. Um, Dr. Thornburg just for what it's worth did um, call out two key issues um, that are critical needs for Sonoma County and that is um, housing at all income uh, levels uh, and our efforts are in the downtown, which I think will be helpful, as well as um, labor shortages. We have a 2.7% unemployment rate right now in Santa Rosa which is affecting a business growth and stability. Um, so before we get into the specifics of downtown, I just wanted to start on the broader side um, with a broader perspective. Um, and so looking at this chart, um, this again is specific to the sales tax performance citywide. Um, I just wanna point out uh, that we do have modest growth, but there are two areas where the numbers are down. That's transportation and general retail. Transportation, uh, we have just had historically high levels of um, new car sales. Those are declining, so that's where you see um, the bulk of the decline in transportation. And then general retail, um, we are down year over year for retail, but our trend line going back two and a half years um, has been on the what I call the positive side of flat. Um, uh, those in the economic development subcommittee know that for retail, I always say flat is the new up. It's an unfortunate reality of where we are with retail. Um, but we are, uh, we were slightly lower in the first quarter of this year than we were for the first quarter last year, but we're uh, picking up again uh, between the first and second quarters of, of this year. That's okay. Which one to push? Um, so turning now specifically to Courthouse Square. Um, helped in large part uh, to the very good holiday season we had um, in the fourth quarter of uh, 2018, and that was mostly driven by retail. The trend line for this graph is, is uh, positive um, for the, pa uh, the two and a half year period shown. But that said, what is most obvious uh, on this graph is that between qu the first quarter and uh, second quarter of this year, uh, clearly revenues are down and um, we're not seeing that typical uh, second quarter bounce back that we uh, generally see you know, after the first quarter holiday post shopping lull. So um, I wanted to show this slide because it, it just reiterates that. I just um, selected a few of the shopping destination areas and you can see um, with the exception of the um, interestingly um, uh, flat or you know, it's, a, it's a positive line of Verwood Square but it doesn't fluctuate. All other uh, shopping areas here, and then also uh, I looked at the rest of the city, um, they do bounce back up on the uh, second quarter. Um, so again, in Courthouse Square, we're seeing that that trend is not continuing specific to um, the downtown area. Um, I was able to dig a little bit deeper, and I apologize, I don't have graphs for, for this data. But I looked specifically in Courthouse Square and compared it citywide um, for uh, uh, food sales, or, you know, uh, food service and retail. So while the uh, trend line for food service revenues citywide is, pos is positive, the same data uh, for Courthouse Square shows a slightly negative trend line. So it's uh, barely negative, again, it's like that negative side of flat, but it is negative. Um, in the past two years, the highest revenues for, uh, for restaurants was in the second and third quarters of 2017, so just before the fires, but uh, we have not seen that kind of uh, return in subsequent quarters. Uh, so for looking also uh, for uh, food sales or restaurants, um, just for 2019, the first and second quarters, 
And again, um, sales tax data lags by six months, so we only have up to the second quarter of this year. Um, the trend line, uh, there, it does show a modest increase, but we are still below uh, where we would, uh, where we were uh, a year ago within that same time period. Um, in comparison, looking at retail sales citywide, that trend line is also positive with a nice upturn from uh, Q1 and Q2 for this year. Um, but for uh, courthouse scores uh, specifically, uh, over the last two years, again, the trend line is clearly positive. However, there is a dramatic decline from the um, very high uh, point we had uh, for the fourth quarter, fourth quarter of 2018 um, to the first quarter of 2019, where uh, higher quarter over quarter for the first quarter, however, we're continuing a decline. So that um, 2019 trend line is negative um, and it is um, notable. Uh, to give some national perspective um, and restaurant and retail se uh, industry sectors, I did do a little bit of research and and we'll say this, the restaurant, uh, nationwide, the restaurant perform uh, performance index uh, declined to its lowest uh, levels uh, in a year in August. Um, however, the expectation index uh, is positive, which is interesting. And then for retail, uh, the, the one thing, there were a number of factors that led into um, the negative decline for restaurants nationwide um, and is something that sort of mirrors what I've been hearing in discussing uh, the issues uh, in Santa Rosa and that is staffing, staff uh, retention, um, or uh, staff recruitment and retention um, was identified both locally and nationwide as a critical issue. Uh, for retail, I will say retail just continues to see uh, disruption. Um, there's a change uh, change in what uh, consumer demands are, and then of course we're seeing, uh, as always, an increase in online purchasing. Um, so those are two uh, uh, just sort of nationwide um, perspectives. Um, I will say too, uh, we have heard and have been discussing and are sort of leaning into the issue of, uh, of uh, downtown, uh, not just the perceptions, but the reality of, of the negative trend lines, um, uh, as well as, you know, uh, business um, uh, uh, frustrations. Um, and so we've been uh, meeting with uh, business owners as well as uh, the Downtown Action Organization, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and the uh, Santa Rosa Metro Chamber. So we're looking to, in the next couple of weeks, or hopefully the next uh, week, really come up with a list of um, programmatic uh, uh, opportunities that between the three organizations we can really uh, go after. We're looking at something uh, more comprehensive than uh, just addressing uh, uh, parking concerns, but looking at marketing, what can we do in terms of um, uh, uh, staffing uh, uh, opportunities, uh, workforce retention, um, uh, beautification, anything that can help uh, address the uh, uh, perceptions of uh, working and visiting and doing business in the downtown. Uh, so we're leaning into that with, again, the, uh, particularly the DAO and the Metro Chamber. So to sum up, um, we're seeing that peak occupancies in the premium zone regularly exceeds 85% and exceeds 80% from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And we've had some success in changing parking behavior to more underutilized locations in the value zone and the 1st and 7th Street garages. So we're happy to answer any questions you have and would appreciate any direction that you would like to provide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation, and I really appreciate you uh, renaming the parking or giving the locations because, you know, I've been with the city almost 35, 40 years, and I still couldn't figure out the numbers, but Second Street, third, thank you so much for that. So with that, bring back to council. Questions? Mr. Olivares? Thank you. Uh, as relates to your um, research with other cities who have moved beyond the six o'clock hour, any feedback from the cities that we reach out to them to find out how that's working for them, isn't working for them? I can I can put that on my to-do list. <laughs> no, I, no, because you, you showed the number. I just, I just didn't know if there was any other information that came with that other than that they did move towards that. Um, I've only, me going to the California Public Parking Association meetings and 
seeing presentations where people are demonstrating that they've had success with it. Um, Walnut Creek in particular has been very successful with it, but I don't have I don't have any we don't, we don't know numbers long, that we don't, I could. We don't could, know how long they've been in those processes or anything like that. Uh, Walnut Creek's been probably two years, okay. and I would say San Luis Obispo might have been uh, longer than that, but I don't have those statistics at hand. Okay. And do we have a way of, of honestly predicting, forecasting what impact? Uh, the uh, our goal in increasing housing downtown will have on any of these numbers across the board? Uh, we haven't, uh, we're actually in the midst of a parking study um, and we're looking at that uh, in relation to the downtown stationary specific plan, but we don't have that at this time. Okay, and then one, one last question as it relates to uh, the progressive parking that we've had now for what, a couple of years or a global year uh, and before. Uh, what were the impacts to us as far as revenue? Was it was a move revenue neutral? I guess is my question. No, it was not revenue neutral. It was it was a revenue gain. It wasn't intended to be a revenue gain, but it it has proven to be. Where is that? So, um, it was January of 2018 that the um, progressive parking was implemented, and so you can see. It looks like it was around 400,000 of a, of a bump. Okay, thank you. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We did a pilot program last year where we had the free parking in the garages between, uh, I think it was Thanksgiving and the end of the year. Uh, could you talk a little bit, I'm not sure which one to address the, the question to, what was the impact to parking at the time as well as what was the economic impact that we saw quarter over quarter? Well, I, I can speak to the parking impact. So in terms of revenue, we estimate it was around $25,000 in lost revenue. And in terms of addition, we didn't see an, an increase in transaction data, or at least not a substantial increase in, in um, transaction data for the time. It, it appeared to be in line with what we had seen the year prior in terms of activity. And remind me, I believe what we still did was we kept the arms down so that people still had to pull the ticket so that we could capture that data, even though they weren't paying for it, they? Correct. Okay. Uh, you know, so uh, again, the revenues aren't tied to uh, parking. We didn't uh, link that, but uh, we did have a, a probably the highest, well, it was the highest quarter in um, the past uh, two and a half years uh, was in 2018 Q4. So the, uh, uh, and it was mostly driven by retail. Okay. And have you tried to dig in at all to see why that quarter was particularly better than others? Well, quarter over quarter, the quarter prior, we did see um, the typical gain in the fourth quarter, but it was uh, post-fire. Uh, and so I don't, I haven't dug uh, in deeper to see uh, specifically what happened or what changed um, to that one. Okay. And then, Kim, as it pertains to the uh, deferred maintenance, uh, that you talked about that, that seems to escalate. I know we are also in the process right now of uh, trying to attract housing that utilizes some of those parking garages, uh, that there's the cooperative agreement that's there. Can you talk a little bit about how that might impact that deferred maintenance number? Yes, if some of, if, if any one of these parking locations was determined to be an opportunity site and a developer came forward with a project that was there that meant we no longer, you know, would be looking at doing that deferred maintenance because we would no longer have a facility. That would, that would change the outlook of that deferred maintenance line. And are there any that are currently in the works or being contemplated that were on the list? I'll, I'll leave that one. I'm sorry, what was the? So do we have any interest in uh, housing on some of our garage sites as a partnership in the deferred maintenance uh, analysis. Uh, so we have um, had discussion. We have an ENA on one uh, parking lot, and then we have um, uh, we're looking at a garage um, housing on a garage site as well. Um, and we have been in discussion with Kim about um, the potential. Well, so a requirement at this point on the on the ENA that we have in existence um, is that uh, parking is replaced, and so we would have a. Um, I hope this is answering your question. We would have new parking uh, or uh, better parking 
um, on the new sites, and that would be the expectation if we replace parking both in lots and garages. Yeah, so I'm, I'm also making an assumption that most of the deferred maintenance is from the garages, not from the flat lots. So I, maybe that's an incorrect assumption. I would say a little over half is garages, but the lots are in very poor condition. Um, so there is quite a bit of our deferred maintenance that is associated with the lots and also with ADA, uh, the ADA transition plan. Got is it. it in particular, just so you know, we're looking specifically at the Third Street garage too, uh, which I think is one of your most expensive needs uh, for repair? Well, it's the oldest garage, yeah, so it's gonna take the most to extend its useful life, and it's also the smallest garage, so. Yeah, so if the city could get that project potentially across the finish line, it helps us both on the housing front as well as on the deferred maintenance front. Uh, would we just, and I don't wanna go too far down the rabbit hole, but in that sort of an agreement, would we still own the operation and maintenance costs, or would part of the ENA be ongoing? Uh, it, it's subject to the ENA and the discussion to get us to a DDA. Got it. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Mr. Chavitz. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanna expand on what I think the Vice Mayor was driving at, and I believe it's on page 14, that slide with the O&M. Would you mind going to it? I don't, I apologize, I don't have my iPad in front of me. My question uh, here, Kim, was in 19 and 20, if my memory serves, that's when we decided to defer the big slurry seal. And I was curious if that is driving that O&M cost right there. Excuse me, deferred maintenance, I'm sorry. I'm mixing my terms. Because it's, it's intriguing to me that we have that all of a sudden going along and then all of a sudden in 1920, here's this new collection of data. Did the city just start taking deferred maintenance into account for the first time ever? Was there a singular event? Oh, I understand, I'm sorry, I didn't understand, but now I understand. So, no, uh, what I was looking, I, when I looked backwards, mm -hmm. those are actuals. So we, it, it's like when you've looked, I didn't put down what our project, our actual project expenditures were on uh, maintenance projects in those three prior years, but the deferred maintenance starts there because that's the, that's where we are now. That, I don't know if that's. It, it sort of does, but was that in particular triggered by the slurry sill? Because no, because no. I remember that was I think a million two or something it was a large number, and we said we want to wait and see what materializes on the housing front because we don't want to spend 1.2 million to slurry seal this parking lot if it's just going to get demoed and redone next year or in two years. So I was right. curious if but that this was is in addition, in that. so that doesn't okay. impact this. Okay. My second question is on page 19, and this is probably more geared towards you, Raisa, but it's on the uh, sales tax. That chart on the left, is that citywide or is that, what's, what's that, that geographic is, area? Uh, it's citywide. Uh, so the gray bars are uh, the performance by the, you know, by quarter, and then um, the squiggly lines are the specific industry sectors. Okay. One thing that, that's interesting to me is when you look at 2014 Q2, which would have been you know just starting the climb out of the recession, uh, revenues are I'm guessing 7.8 million there, um, and then if you look at 2019 Q2, uh, much better economic times, it's just over 8 million. When you generated this uh, snapshot of the sales tax, did you take out the emergency sales tax measure and measure O? Well, I think we uh, have two sales taxes since then that we passed. No, I'm looking at Assistant City Manager McBride and I, I don't believe those are taken out. So I, if they aren't, this is my concern. What that suggests to me is that we've seen virtually no change yet possibly even a decline in sales tax citywide because as you're increasing the tax for capturing more sales tax, but the number's staying flat, which would then suggest sales probably decline citywide. Is that, do you, um, see, do you see what I'm can I ask, conjuring uh, up here? Our, yeah, that's beyond me. I'm not sure how to answer that. What, what I'm seeing potentially, and I, I hope you prove me wrong, is that we do not have a very healthy economic climate. 
So you're talking about the measure O, uh, the, the new measure O that was passed last November. So if you remember, you, we, we wouldn't start to see the uh, revenue from that until uh, April at the earliest. So when so you remember on an annual basis, that's about $10 million. And we thought we'd see about 2 million of that in the mm -hmm. first fiscal year, which would end at June 30th. So you're, you're probably just seeing part of that reflected here. So you're right, there might be some masking from that, that may be masking some downturn. But um, again, I'm not sure that we're picking up all the effects in that yet. You'll, you'll see those more in the, um, in the new fiscal year which will, which will begin July 1st. Okay. So when you get third quarter data, that's when you should really start to see the impacts of the measure O that was passed. Okay, and did we pass something in 2014? I thought we passed the tax measure in 2014 too, or was that just a re-up of measure O? I can't remember. That was a That was a reauthorization of a quarter cent sales tax measure so that there wouldn't be any differentiation. That was a continuation. Okay, um, I, I, I think Chuck, you're probably right that if that's, if we aren't seeing the full capture of Measure O, if there is masking, it's slight, but I just hope that we can really watch that going forward. Because, I mean, even you take that out, again, this is 2014, now we're in 2019, vastly different economic circumstance, revenues are, see, are, are flat. Ms. Lang? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Ms. Nadeau, I regularly hear from constituents and small businesses that they're frustrated that Santa Rosa is the only city that has the, uh, in the county that has um, paid parking. Do you know if other cities within the county are looking into instituting paid parking? The city of Petaluma has this discussion come up on occasion. The city of Windsor has recently been I don't know, pondering the idea, I don't <laughs> And Healdsburg uh, did a study, a couple studies on um, paid parking and it was recommended. I'm in touch, this isn't Sonoma County, but I've been um, reached out to by Ukiah for advice because they're apparently getting ready to put in um, parking meters in Ukiah. Um, so it, it is a topic of discussion in other cities, but it, it's a, big lift to go from free parking to paid parking. I'm sure it is. Um, this question is more for Ms. De La Rosa. Um, I'm curious, it, you know, one thing I'm wondering is, is it possible for you, we've got the quarter over quarter, year over year data, is it possible to pull out the December 18 data um, when we did have some more free, free parking last year and compare that to, I know December of 2017 is a really, un, that was a really unusual quarter, but maybe December 2016. Uh, you know, I can talk to our consultants who uh, manage this data, Muni Services or a Avenue and see what they can do. Uh, generally, it's uh, confined to quarters. I, I don't think they can do that. And so it's my understanding, I was not on the council when we adopted um, progressive parking, but it's my understanding that this is to support the downtown businesses rather than to disrupt them. Can you speak to that at all? Who, me or Kim? I, 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 the reason behind doing this is to make it easier for people to find a place to park. And paid parking is a, is a proven method to encourage people who are price sensitive to park farther away. The whole reason that a parking meter was ever invented was because merchants were complaining that their, their uh, patrons could not find a place to park because their employees were getting there early and parking all day. So, I mean, that was the whole origin of how paid parking came to be. So the, the purpose of it is to make it easier for people to come down, for people to say, oh, I, I wanna go down to dinner in downtown Santa Rosa and have a high sense of confidence that when they come down and they wanna park close to their favorite restaurant on 4th Street that they'd be able to find a place to park instead of driving around in circles trying to find a place to park. That, that's the theory behind it. Thank you, and this question is probably more for you, Ms. Davalavrosa, is that, you know, I'm looking at slide six, and I, and I do see that sometimes we exceed 100% parking, which kind of boggles the mind. But um, at any rate, do we have any um, information that, you know, I hear a lot of anecdotal information about the 6 to 8 p.m. parking harming our downtown businesses. 
But do we have anything beyond um, anecdotal information to suggest that this has an impact either positive or negative on our downtown businesses? So again, just like, um, you know, sales data is like our, our best uh, form of understanding the performance of uh, businesses. Um, and unfortunately, it not only do they do it by quarter, but they don't sort of indicate um, uh, hourly. Um, so most of what we rely on is anecdotal at this point. Um, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have more specific data uh, to provide. And the last thing is, um, you said that, Ms. Nadeau, that this was not intended to generate additional revenue, and it has, and I'm wondering if there is a statute or a plan how we spend that additional revenue to best benefit the, the parking district, or if that goes into the general fund. It goes to the parking fund, and it's, it's now designated to help us cover those $20 million worth of deferred maintenance that we have looking ahead of us. So we're a long ways from filling our coffers to being able to um, fund all of those projects in the next few years. So that, that's what it would be designated for. Thank you to you both. Ms. Gomes, do you have any questions? Um, I, I actually have, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor, and uh, I wanna thank um, Ms. Nadow for what is really an excellent and clear presentation with lots of good data. Uh, I'm looking at slide 21. I think this is for um, Ms. De La Rosa. And um, I'm looking at the Courthouse Square dip, but also noting that the Santa Rosa Plaza is well below what it was in 2017. And just wondering if this is a, if you could repeat for me what the national trend is in this area. Is the national trend that sales are down? Right, in retail, yes. Um, the uh, national trend is that retail sales are flat. Um, and then again, in looking at some of the um, industry reports for restaurants, um, th this year, uh, their indicators were, were slightly down. Um, I do know that uh, as in regards to the Santa Rosa Plaza, uh, Sears, for example, closed uh, at the end of 2018, I believe it was. Um, so that affected it, but generally, um, on the whole, uh, retail sales are, are, are flat nationwide. Thank you, I appreciate it. And again, um, I, I very much wanna thank you for a good data and for good comparative. Great, um, I have one question. I appreciate that information about the uh, citations and Kimmy had said less than 2% of transactions are cited. How does that compare against industry standards? Oh dear, <laughs> I don't know. That would, that would be something I, I'd need to look you, at. I, yeah. I'd be interested to hear yeah. how we compare it to other municipalities, so. Okay, any other immediate questions? Okay, we have several cards on this. Uh, first up, Eric Frazier, followed by Tom Robertson. Thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, uh, council members, and other general people. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to my comments. Uh, I submitted some uh, comments in written form by PDF, by email, so I hope they're attached to the study session records. Basically, I talked about three different areas of my concerns. One is that overall, I don't think that the parking department represents information in an accurate way, that the reports always seem to be lacking and obfuscated. I think the lack of enforcement data specifically skews uh, the perception of what parking really all, is all about, and the driver of revenue, a major driver of revenue to the city, and also to your consultants and related contractors. Um, I also noted that the parking department has moved away from being accountable to citizens, uh, as is apparently the city council from time to time. That in fact, the city council has given the parking department wide latitude to interpret and create new rules in order to find ways to increase revenue from the citizenry. The parking, the progressive parking specifically, 
Uh, I have several points. Um, the new parking, the progressive parking policy, very difficult to say, I know was discussed before we had states of emergency, but you chose not to suspend the introduction of progressive parking when in fact people were in a state of federal emergency. That meant people that were coming from other parts of the county that had no paid parking policies had to understand the labor of our, our unique Santa Rosa parking policy. If that's not derogative or derogatory, I don't know what is, and potentially illegal. I think the question should be asked of the state attorney whether in fact subjecting additional citizens to uh, parking enforcement is a form of price gouging. I believe one will find that that may be the case. It was also introduced during one of the darkest nights of the year. You chose what, the middle of January? To introduce, what was that, six point font on the parking meters? Uh, I had to assist many of our elders to understand what now they had to make sense of during a state of emergency so they're not subjected to, what is that, a $40 ticket? I don't know, again, the reports don't really pull forward those enforcement costs. You guys are flying blind when it comes to knowing what citizens and customers endure when it comes to enforcement. The statistics that we sat through today, sure, $400 pro profit to parking, that's not including the money that comes back. Thank you. Tom Robertson, followed by Bernie Schwartz. Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the council, uh, I've been in working and developing property in this downtown since 1990. I haven't done it much lately, but I'm trying to do a housing project. And one thing that my partner and I are very concerned about is we now have eight restaurants for sale. We have just had a restaurant go down at a site that used to be a good solid site. How do I explain to institutional investors uh, empty storefronts and prominent sites in the downtown? Now, I can't tell you that this is the responsibility of the parking policy, but it's the one thing that you folks can really have an impact on, and maybe it's part of it. Uh, the number of tickets between 2017 and 2018 went up 20%, 20%. Uh, you get on average by the statistics that were just cited, there are 115 parking tickets given every day, some proportion of them in the evenings. Uh, the warning system is a hand wave at it. When someone gets a parking ticket here, they tend not to come back. And it, it's true much of the information that you're hearing is anecdotal, but it reaches a certain point. There are dozens and dozens of complaints about this from the merchants, from their customers, from the restaurateurs, from their patrons. At some point, it ceases to be anecdotal. If, it were, if, we're, if we total them up, and let's say there are 87 uh, complaints, and that's a 10% increase over last year, I suppose then it would be statistical. I mean, you can do that sort of thing. Uh, I am very, very dubious. Uh, this is a very small downtown. It, this side of the downtown, east of the freeway, maybe 10 blocks, it has no, it's not a, even remotely comparable to Walnut Creek or any of the other cities which were mentioned. Uh, I, was in the, I was in Albany recently, but it's a much larger downtown, block after block on Solano Avenue and side streets. They have two hour, I think it's actually an hour and a half parking lot, no meters, the place was thriving. Petaluma is doing very well. Go down there on a Friday night or on a, on a Wednesday night or, or during the day. It's doing much better than we are. And, and I don't hear any comparable uh, statistics with how the economies of the other cities in this county are doing. Uh, I would be astounded if any of them passed metered parking uh, based upon just simply the, the, what the, the various merchants and restaurateurs say. This has been a bad thing for the downtown, and I hear about it all the time. I've been hearing complaints about the parking district since 1990, and I, it's time for some thoroughgoing reform. The current amount that the, the district has in its uh, coffers is $14 million. Some of that may be for operations, but $14 million. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bernie Schwartz, followed by Michael Hyman. 
Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Bernie Schwartz. I have California luggage. I've been on 4th Street for 39 years. The parking district, I believe, is a lot older than that. It was created by the city and by the businesses for the benefit of the businesses. Um, over that time, I've seen a lot of iterations of parking policies, and I've experienced the successes and some of the failures. We all remember the blue pay and display boxes that were on the sidewalks for about five years, and they were replaced by our current smart meters. There was a real negative perception by the community about those boxes. The smart meters were accepted. This was an easy thing to experience as a business. Right now, I think we're kind of in a perfect storm. There is a general malaise economically, and I don't think it's gonna get better soon. I've seen my numbers and numbers of my neighbors drop double digits um, since the beginning of the year. In addition, the parking perception as being unfriendly has grown for the last two years. Every time someone gets a ticket, they tell 10 people. Pretty soon, they have other choices to make. The system is a little bit complicated, and I'm a fan of Dr. Shoup, but I think where it works in towns is where there's residential density in the core, where you have apartment dwellers that are gonna sit on a parking place all night long. And so in Berkeley and San Francisco, extended metering seems to help the businesses. Here, I think it's added to a perception that we are unfriendly. And unfortunately, we also have a perception of being unsafe. And so as part of the business community and the downtown action organization, I'm appealing to you to take action to correct this right now while we're in a really fragile state. Progressive parking doesn't have to go away. The whole idea of it is that it can be flexible. One specific request I'm asking is that you have on the agenda tonight the Small Business Saturday free garage parking. I'm hoping that maybe you'll expand on that action tonight to add holiday garage parking through January 1st. We had that last year, it helped last year. We desperately need help this year. I'm happy to know from economic development that they're gonna be working on plans for the holidays, before the holidays, hopefully to beautify and promote the downtown. But really what we need is a strong statement of support from the council. And so I'm hoping you'll reconsider and quickly act on, as soon as you can get it on an agenda, a roll back to 6 p.m. and let the community know that we are making it easier to come downtown, that we are family friendly, that we are safe, and that you guys have our backs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael Hyman, followed by Cadence Allison. Good afternoon, Mayor Schwedhelm, Vice Mayor Rogers, Council members. I am Michael Hyman, a native of Santa Rosen, a longtime business owner in the downtown as well as a property owner, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today on a subject matter that I've talked about ever since I learned how to talk, parking. Specifically, the rollback of the meters in the premium zone from 8 p.m. to 6 p.m. We are a downtown in transition, reuniting the square, the new hotel, and the downtown station area specific plan are all steps in the right direction. And we are so grateful for the council's support of these plans as they will drastically impact our downtown landscape for the better. Here in Santa Rosa, we are unlike the cities in the East Bay, Sacramento, in the Bay Area. We don't have the population living in the downtown nor the other things that we need in order to make the downtown successful as of yet. It's like someone told me, uh, uh, it was like trying to fly a plane while still building it. It's just not gonna fly. The goal here is to have people come and enjoy what our downtown has to offer, and we have a lot to offer. But right now, we also have many empty storefronts and more businesses closing daily. The businesses and restaurants in the downtown do not just compete with one another in the downtown. They compete with Montgomery Village, Cottingtown, the Strip Center, standalone businesses, and other cities in Sonoma County as well, like Hillsburg, Petaluma and Sonoma. Not one of these other places charge for parking after six. The city of Santa Rosa's downtown is the only place that charges for parking after six, putting us at an unfair disadvantage in competing with others. In fact, not one business nor one member of the community requested parking enforcement after 6 p.m. We must remember the downtown is not here for the parking district. The parking district is here for the downtown. With the holidays soon upon us, 
We respectfully request and strongly urge the council to place on the council's agenda this parking meter time change from 8 p.m. to 6 p.m. for a vote immediately. We are also mindful that the parking district has a budget as well to consider, and so we suggest moving the meter start time back from 10 a.m. to 9 a.m. to help balance the budget. The downtown is the heart of Santa Rosa. Please continue the support you have shown in the past, and let's keep this heart going. Thank you. Thank you. Cadence Allenson, followed by Natalie Cerzo. Sir Good afternoon. Thank you guys for taking the time today to talk about this. It's a very important issue to the downtown business owners. Um, I'll keep it brief. You all know there's an incredible amount of concern and frustration right now in downtown around parking and several other issues, including safety. And as Raisa said, we're really looking forward to partnering with the city to tackle some of these issues. Um, because we're looking at sales tax data from six months ago, the DAO is now reaching out to business owners to collect data on uh, their current status compared to this time last year. And right now the response we're getting is that businesses are down about 14%. Uh, when we asked those who responded um, what the pressing issues are to them, over 50% list parking as an issue. So I've heard from a lot of the business owners this, that this holiday season is gonna be the make or break for them and that if they don't succeed, they will likely be closing their stores. We've seen the negative impact already on restaurants, and we hope that that doesn't continue moving forward um, into 2020. So um, basically, we're, re we're asking you today to support us, support uh, getting free holiday parking in garages over the uh, weekends, and to help with the rollback as soon as possible. I think these two changes would really give our community something substantial to begin looking at and helping to change their attitude and perception of what it's like to come downtown. Um, so we hope we can count on your support. Thank you. Thank you. Natalie Solorzo, and followed by Gerald Nebeski. Hi, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and council members. Um, my name is Natalie Chilurzo. I'm the co-owner of Russian River Brewing Company at 725 4th Street. Uh, we've been in business since uh, 2004 and Sawyer's News was our next door neighbor. A lot's changed since those days. So um, I have been tracking sales recently um, since we opened in 2004. Um, I have some data in front, I'm sorry, I don't have a very articulate presentation for you today. I've been dealing with PG&E all day, who's gonna shut our power off tomorrow. Uh, anyway, another story for another time. Um, but I do have data going back to 2013. So since 2004, our business has been on a very steady incline um, to 2016. As we all know, in 2017, things got a little squirrely um, with the fires, and then ever since then, things have been a little bit um, challenging uh, for us. So um, so basically just some things I want to point out is that um, for our Santa Rosa pub sales data alone, um, September was down 7% over last year. October was down 32% over last year. A lot of that is related to the fires, even though we were only shut down for one day downtown. Um, but our year-to-date sales downtown are down 33%, um, which is very dramatic for my company. Granted, we can say that our Windsor location has cannibalized some of that business, but not all of that business. So there's definitely something else going on. We're seeing a downward trend. In fact, um, this past month, October of 2019, our sales were low than they were in October of 2013. So this downward trend for us is definitely not sustainable. I can't honestly stand here and tell you that this is related to parking, but I can tell you that parking is a factor among many, many factors that are contributing to um, you know, wonderful restaurants like Gerard's and many others going out of business um, just this year alone. And so I think that um, while the parking data shows an increase in customers parking or at least in parking revenue. I, I hope that you're hearing the business community say to you that, that our numbers do not correlate with the parking data, that our numbers are down, that we are seeing less and less people as the days and the months and the years go by. And so we're just asking you to help us out with something in the very short term by rolling back the parking hours from eight o'clock to six o'clock as soon as possible just to help us get through 
through at least the holidays while we address some of the bigger problems that we have in Santa Rosa um, that are more in the medium and long-term issues such as housing and et cetera. So anyway, um, that's kind of our um, appeal to you today. Uh, my friend Bernie called me the canary in the coal mine once, and um, I am the canary in the coal mine, and I am telling you that downtown is having some struggles. Thank you. Thank you. Gerard Nebeski, followed by Ann Seeley. Hello, I, uh, again, I'm not very prepared either, but I just wanted to raise a couple points. Um, I understand the parking revenues and the need for the parking, et cetera, but right now, the only data that I uh, see everywhere right now are for lease signs all over downtown Santa Rosa. I don't see those same uh, for lease signs in other cities in Sonoma County. In fact, I think their downtowns are thriving and it's hard to get real estate there, but there's something telling about downtown when you can't have a for lease sign in your space for months and nobody wants to come in through the front door checking what's available, what the price is. I, uh, our sales data is down 40% since last year, and um, we started off uh, with uh, real vigorous uh, growth, and things were great, and it's progressively gone down and down. And most of our customers that come in cite parking. Um, they do cite homeless issues and safety. Um, I, uh, for me, it takes me from downtown Santa Rosa seven minutes to get to downtown Sebastopol where I don't have any parking issues, weirdos, and a huge choice of restaurants to go to. So I think that's um, things we need to look at because we're really in competition with a lot of other cities in Sonoma County and we can't compete in this environment. It does not make any sense to me. So that's all. It's been real brief. I just, everything else has been already said already. Thank you. Thank you. Ann Seeley followed by Peter Rumble. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Ann Seeley speaking for Concerned Citizens for Santa Rosa. I'm here to speak a bit of heresy, and that is heresy against followers of Donald Shoup. I, I am a lover of downtown. I go downtown whenever I have an opportunity, and my husband and I attempt to eat downtown whenever we have a chance, but the restaurants are becoming less and less in, in lower in number. We'll never get La Vera restaurant back again, which is sad, but I just want to offer you some thoughts to do with what you will. The change to 8 p.m. is a destructive one in my mind of enforcement till 8 p.m. I'm lucky in that my husband drops me off at a restaurant and says, I'll go find parking and then I'll join you. Most people don't have that. The huge investment in Courthouse Square reunification, I'm afraid is being squandered by in for parking enforcement policies. I imagined creating a much more thriving restaurant and small retail environment, and that's not really possible with metered parking the way it is now with the competition that does not have metered parking. I was just a supporter of Courthouse Square reunification for 25 years and actually kind of squandered some, some political capital in supporting it. But I'm afraid it's just going to stay concrete and grass unless we, you make the downtown more available to people. I almost didn't come here tonight to speak, except that my coworker in where I work said, Ann, go downtown and tell them I don't go downtown because I don't think it's right to have to pay for parking and get a ticket if I'm a few minutes late. So please deal with this. I understand the parking department is doing what they can to deal with difficult problems, but we have made our downtown a less attractive place to go to, and that's unfortunate. Thank you. Thank you. Peter Rumble, followed by Sunu Shandi. 
Council, Peter Rumble from the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber. Uh, just to carry on uh, Ms. Seeley's comments, you're hearing from a number of uh, downtown businesses. I want to talk a little bit more broadly about citywide perspective. Uh, and Bernie and Tom are absolutely correct. I think we need to be careful what for what problem we're solving. Uh, and progressive parking, as we noted, is intended to make parking more easily available, more easy to find, absolutely. That's actually not what business owners have been complaining about for two years. Uh, it is a perception issue at this point. Uh, and citywide, there is an absolute perception that it is difficult to come downtown. Difficult for many reasons. It's not just parking, uh, but parking is one of those uh, reasons. Uh, and it's one that you can act on. Uh, through policy decisions, uh, I understand uh, where they were coming from, but from policy decisions, your council has also made it even more difficult for some uh, businesses, particularly restaurants, uh, through additional costs. Uh, and now uh, you have an opportunity to actually make it a little bit easier for businesses to operate downtown. Um, and, you know, I just have to say the uh, comparisons to Walnut Creek and San Luis Obispo, you know, if we, no offense, Doug, E.R. Sawyer, Jeweler, if we had a Tiffany's on the corner and an even Marcus and a uh, Nordstrom and, you know, uh, uh, booming uh, retail and restaurant sector, maybe progressive parking would be absolutely applicable. Go ahead and charge until 10. We do not have that. We have a, a real meaningful perception issue, not just coming downtown, but even working downtown now. Uh, Raisa noted that the city staff is beginning to work with the DAO and the chamber. I would really ask your council's uh, endorsement of that course of action. I think that we can tackle this collaboratively uh, through issues that the city can take on, issues that the chamber can take on, issues that our community can take on uh, to help make things more appealing and perhaps even return to your council with a plan uh, in 60 to 90 days, something before the next uh, council priority setting agenda because we can't wait for that. Um, I would ask that your council consider rolling back parking from 8 to 6 p.m., enforcement of that. Ask your council to provide direction to implement a holiday parking program to mirror last year's, not just a, uh, you know, Black Friday or, or whatever we want to call it. I'd ask your council to also provide direction uh, to begin to consider looking at how to sync up uh, garage time, uh, free garage time in a way that incentivizes that as well. Um, thank you. I really appreciate uh, your staff in particular making themselves available to the chamber, uh, but we need this help now uh, and we can't wait for another two years. Thank you, Peter. So Chani followed by Steve Bertabaugh. Thank you. Um, first, I wanna thank the council and the staff putting together a report to, to look at this. Um, and I'm gonna give you a story. This is uh, yesterday I have a, uh, two gentlemen visiting from one from LA, one from Indianapolis. Um, they wouldn't be downtown if it wasn't for my office and they were, when they came last night and we went out to our Cleveland Avenue location and we started with the, with the appetizer and then we drove to downtown for Beer Baron to finish for dinner. This gentleman from LA goes, and, and we were parking and at seven o'clock we're putting, um, I, I told my brother, let's put money in the meter. And he goes, oh, there's parking in Santa Rosa that is being implemented at 7 p.m. That's kind of crazy. So that's somebody who comes from L.A. Uh, and lives in a thriving community, and there is no uh, six, after 6 p.m. charges for parking. And more importantly, the garage signage at this morning, I told him, I said, if you're parking, park in a garage. And he didn't find a garage, and he ended up getting a ticket. So here's somebody who came from out of the community. It's not a big deal. $35 is not. It's that perception issue that Peter was pointing out to, and the other gentlemen have pointed out to, that we are not that thriving downtown yet. And we're not Walnut Creek. I've been to Walnut Creek many, many times. And we don't have those businesses that can drive that traffic to our downtown that can allow us to be progressive parking. So I really ask the staff and the council to roll back 6 to 8 uh, p.m. Uh, as soon as possible. And then there's still a lot more that needs to be done that we could use our garage parking much more and encourage the employees to be using the garages. Um, and, and I've seen still in the last, many, many times in the last year, 
at 6, 6 p.m. that Third Street Garage should not be empty, but it is because we have not done a good job of really encouraging those locals and the people who are price sensitive to utilize those garages. And I ask that we uh, that you allow the request the staff to work closely with DAO in the next 60 to 90 days to really come up with the program that allows to to be our parking to serve the current needs while we're still in a transition to build an urban downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Steve Burwa. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members. Steve Bertelbau with the Transportation Land Use Coalition. Um, I spent a little time looking at uh, a recent video of uh, Dr. Shoup's presentation, and he pointed out that in order to sell parking meters in the 1930s, they engaged in a little experiment. They put parking meters on one side of the street and not on the other side of the street. It was very convincing. The merchants that were on the parking lot side of the street found their people were able to come in because there were open parking places. People on the other side of the street found that those parking places were all occupied by employees all day long and there was less traffic. I suggest that before you consider a rollback, that you re replicate that experiment here. Put paper bags on one side of the street and say parking's free and let the other side continue with the meters and let's see what we, what we actually see. My recollection is that the problem before we engaged in, this, in the present system was that the employees were occupying a lot of places and that people couldn't find a place to park. Um, let's see if that situation still exists today. The other thing that Dr. Shoup suggests that we haven't adopted is that the proceeds of parking meters are returned to source. They go back to the merchants for street improvements, street furniture, uh, trees, cleaning the streets, that sort of thing, so that the merchants can see that the, the cost of parking benefits the district. I suggest that we can give that strong consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Those are all the cards I have on this item. Um, if I could just get clarification for everyone in the chamber here, so w whether it's camera city manager. So this is a study session, so we're giving feedback to staff. If it, we took up one of the suggestions that was made by several speakers, we rolled it back to eight to six. If every council member gives that feedback, does staff have the ability to do that, or do we have to re-agendize this item and actually bring it to a vote and have a report item for council? Yeah, this is a study session, so an action and direction would, would require us to re-agendize the item to bring back to council. So again, so, if, if we have, so because we can't take a vote tonight, we right. could give general direction. Right. And but but if the unanimous general direction from all seven council members is roll it back, they're consulting. Yep. Oh. Correction. The the chief financial officer who oversees the parking program has the authority to change the hours of operation. That's not something that requires council approval. So if you were to provide that direction, we wouldn't need to come back to council to do that. How, having said that, however, it's not like we can just flip a switch and change all the signs and reprogram all the meter. I mean, there is some timing involved in us being able to make a change like that but it wouldn't require us coming back to council to change the hours. Great, thank you, that's very helpful. And also I would like to bring it back to council, specifically the downtown uh, subcommittee, because I know this has been a topic of discussion amongst the three members of the subcommittee. Is there any r additional information you'd like the entire council to have about your discussions from the subcommittee? Well, Mr. Oliveres? Yeah, from uh, my perspective as a chair, this has been probably a topic of conversation every meeting that we've ever had in the downtown subcommittee. Uh, but again, uh, one that has, hasn't been able to be resolved, uh, and that's why it's come back to us for a study session to present it here to get some clarity and direction from the council to those that have the authority to make changes. Any other member? Ms. Fleming? 
Yeah, so this is, continues to be an issue for our downtown merchants and is of great concern. Um, one of the things that, you know, I've been considering around this is that if we were to do a rollback on the six to eight, that it would be time specific with a specific beginning and end date and that we collect data around it so that we can continue to support our downtown businesses with information, which is, you know, again, what we're trying to do here with the parking district. So I think what I'm hearing is if there's an instruction, we can, tr we can move to implementation. There are realities that are in the field right now, so we would have to look at those realities. Uh, but you could give us the intention, then we'd have to analyze what it would take to make that intention take place. So there's authority here, but then there's the field realities that we would have to look and figure out how we would meet the requirements that you put out. That's right. understood, thank you. Yeah. So my intention would be clarifying what role we have and what type of feedback we'll give, and then I'll just, we'll go through each of the council members to give that feedback. And, and, I, and what I just want to make sure is clear is I might not be able to provide an answer based on the conversations floating around me. May not be able to provide an answer tonight to how we meet that goal, but if you lay out a goal, staff will make every effort to meet whatever goal you lay out. Great, thank you. Um, Ms. Combs, why don't we start with you? Do you have feedback you would like to provide to staff regarding this topic? Well, again, I want to thank staff for providing the uh, information, and I also want to thank the community that's come out and made comments. Um, I, I heard a request for Small Business Saturdays, um, which I think makes some sense. Um, holiday uh, through January 1st, it would seem to me that those would could be combined, I, I'm guessing, uh, that we could try that through January 1st, so I would be supportive of that. Um, I heard the suggestion that some of the uh, dollars uh, go to the DAO for beautification. Uh, if we continue to have the parking, perhaps the uh, we could we could consider the six to eight dollars uh, six to eight six to eight hour dollars going uh, back to the DAO. Um, I am hesitant to roll back six to eight, but based on the uh, comments that we're we're receiving, I would certainly um, go along with the uh, majority of the rest of the council. Uh, on that issue. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tibbs. Thank you, Mayor. So I'll, I'll start my comments and feedback by saying, uh, Kim and Raisa both, I want to thank you for the um, data that you provided to me. I feel like uh, I definitely had the information to make this decision and it was pretty exhaustive. So thanks, I really mean it. And Kim, my comments are not going to be supportive of the progressive uh, parking program, but I do want to give you credit for taking this concept from council, implementing it, and, and in my opinion, doing a pretty good job of it. I just don't necessarily think this is the best thing for right now. Um, so what I'm going to uh, suggest is, um, and, and I'm basing this off of the data too, right? I think there was two compelling slides that to me kind of said, we tried, it didn't work, now we need to listen to our business owners because it seems to be having an adverse impact on them excuse me, adverse impact on them. And that was on one of the pages, I think it was potentially page 11, but when we, we actually saw the meters increase in their usage, and if I recall back, the, the whole point of the progressive parking was to m get a greater increase in the garages to free up the metered spots on 4th Street. So that doesn't seem to have worked as well as we thought it would. Also on page 14, um, oh, I'm sorry, that, I'm looking at some of my old notes here. Anyways, I'll get right to it, but I, I'm very supportive of rolling back the 6 to 8 p.m. I think that we need to do that. Um, now, my question to you, though, is, is we, we still have an obligation to pay our bills in the parking department and not run at a deficit, and I assume every business owner in the audience understands that concept better than I do. Um, does that mean we will also be changing from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. back? Because if I'm not mistaken, that's how it used to be. The mornings we had the time, then we rolled back, uh, or we added 6 to 8, and then we rolled back 8 to 10. Are we talking about that, or are we just talking about rolling back 6 to 8? 
the um, request that was received from the um, DAO was 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. And our estimates is that that would result in a revenue decrease of around $400,000. A year. And if, if you don't mind my clarifying, with progressive parking, it's, it's a good thing if we're seeing meter transactions going up, if they're going up in the value zone. So we're really trying to push people, encourage people to use parking outside of the premium zone. And there's two thirds of the meters are in the value zone that are uh, underutilized. Okay. So it's not just the garages, it's also the value zone. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Um, so I, then I do s support rolling back six to eight, going from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, I also, uh, th this free Saturday concept, now to be clear, are we talking about free Saturdays during this study session or is that at a later item? So, so there's an item on the agenda for Small Business Saturday, so that that is already scheduled for consideration on the consent agenda. Okay, well one, I think I can tie it in here, Sue, if I can't, feel free to flag me, but I do think that looking at ways in which we can provide more free parking during the weekends is helpful, and I would be supportive of uh, something like that. Uh, what else do we have here? Oh, and one thing I do wanna say is, and this is kudos to you, Kim, is your ability to, through these exclusive negotiating agreements with developers and things like that, as they come forward, these opportunities, uh, looking at master lease agreements with these types of folks to try to help offset some of these the revenue losses that we'll experience if we did, the council decides to move forward uh, with this tonight. So thank you, I, I do appreciate all your work into this, but I am gonna be supporting the nine to six. Explain. Uh, one quick question before I give my direction. Can you clarify, uh, I'm sorry if I missed it in here, um, what, if we were to lose $400,000 a year by rolling back the six to eight parking, uh, what, what kind of deficit would that put us at? In this current year, I wouldn't project that that will put us at a deficit. It'll put us at a place where we aren't able to add to our reserves, which means we won't be able to have funding to do capital improvement projects down the road. So that leads me into um, my direction, which is if there is a surplus, um, I think that it should go into operations and not into beautification or another benefit district because this is the parking district and we have a responsibility toward our capital improvements on parking. Excuse I, me? I just have to clarify one thing. Um, so uh, the city of Santa Rosa pays 26% of the assessment that funds the DAO, parking pays about 80% of that 26%. So they, um, the majority of the city's assessment to the DAO is already paid by parking. Um, so they are, are already assessed. Sure, and that's fine. I just wanna make sure that we continue to use our Yes, Mr. McGlynn. No, that's understood. I think, I think to Ms. Del Rosa's point, we're already contributing to a factor that was raised earlier um, in public comment. So we, we were just trying to make that clear that that actually is in process um, through the assessment district. And I do appreciate the clarification. Thank you very much. So here's what I am in support of and what I'm not in support of. I am in support of uh, holiday parking. Uh, meaning some rollbacks uh, similar to what we did last year on Saturdays in underutilized garages. I am also supportive of a uh, temporary reprieve on the six to eight parking. I know that staff has constraints and I very much respect that it's a lot of work to change this, but if it could be done in Q1 and, and limited to Q1, I think that that would serve two purposes. One is it would give us a solid data point and reference for comparing with last year and potentially next year and see if it does make a meaningful difference. Additionally, it would help our businesses um, meet their goals of you know uh, overcoming the, the lull that we experience in Q1. What I am not in favor of is taking away progressive parking. I believe that progressive parking is a solid practice and that we haven't had enough time or experience in the city and that we are a growing city and that some of this is growing pains and that we need to have a little bit of patience and that we need to temper carrots and sticks and make sure that we have enough benefit to keep our downtown growing and thriving as well as help people to get out of their cars, which is a major priority for me. 
Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> and thank you, Kim and Raisa, for your presentation. Um, I think I'm, uh, I appreciate your position. I think that you would agree, and I think that probably everyone in the chamber that knows about downtown parking would agree that it is not just parking that is, that is there's no one uh, solution right now to dealing with the loss in revenue of, of our downtown, but it is something we can have an immediate control over. I remember in, in 2009, this, these, this chamber, if I remember, it might have been Pat, um, uh, it, it, I remember there was a great deal of conversation about progressive parking. As a merchant at the time, I was a little concerned um, that Ms. Dr. Shoup was saying that uh, parking needed to be, uh, it was too cheap on 4th Street, it needed to be increased, and the higher you make the parking within reason, you'll have turnover, and then there will be plenty of people that have lots of places to park. Um, and he's probably right, and I, but unfortunately, I don't believe we have the luxury right now uh, to continue that implementation of progressive parking. Um, I am in favor of moving it back to six o'clock. I'm moving it from nine to six. Um, on the holiday parking program, it's, it is gonna take a, a, a fair amount of, of um, marketing and notification of our community that we are changing yet again um, our parking program. So I'm hoping that that is, is going to be considered highly because we don't want it to further confuse uh, our, our, our customers. Um, so if, if there is, uh, my feeling is that it should be consistent throughout the downtown. I mean, if we're, gonna, if, if, if we're going to charge for a particular time at a particular rate on 4th Street, that we should do, be doing the same thing on 5th Street and 3rd Street and, and so that people don't get fooled. Um, but I would, you know, I, if that's not the direction that everyone wants to go, then I, I can understand that as well. Um, part 4th Street probably should be a little more expensive and people can get used to that and I think it's the perception. Uh, that is really our problem. And uh, I look forward to the future when we can actually implement um, the progressive parking program. Um, I agree with, with Ann that, um, Ann Seeley, when she, she said it's heresy for her to stand up there and talk and speak to, the, to reversing that decision that was made or discussed 10 years ago. Um, and, but it was the, um, the topic of the day and, every, and many, many people were in favor of it and there was a lot of conversation about how we really should not be acquiescing to the car, but we should really be making it, you know, let, let's treat them reasonably um, and kind of get people to uh, think twice about using a car and think twice about, um, uh, you know, paying attention to where they're parking and how much they're paying. So. It's a long way of saying I agree with my fellow council members. I think we really do need to roll it back. The, our merchants need help right now. Um, it's something we can control. We need to do it as quickly as we possibly can. Um, and then we'll see, uh, hopefully we will see a change uh, in, their, in their numbers in the future. And uh, but I, I am in, in favor of moving forward as quickly as possible. Thank you. Mr. Alvarez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I was here with John when we had his first discussion related to uh, progressive parking back in, what was it, 2009 or so, I think is what it was. Um, and, and again, thank you for the update and the history on how we got to where we are today. And I think one of the things that we need to keep in mind is when we talk about, uh, is it Dr. Shoup? Dr. Shoup is that we're, he was presenting a philosophy of parking. It's, I, I don't believe that it's uh, quite there as being an exact science on how to manage this. Uh, and, and I don't believe that we can accurately compare ourselves to other communities because we all have different factors that impact what's going on related to our business community, our history and our parking issues. Uh, but, uh, but I do believe that if uh, our community and our businesses are concerned, so should we. Uh, and, and I get what the, what the data says, but I think those perceptions are also very strong and sometimes even stronger, because I, I, I agree, when somebody gets a ticket, we tell a lot of people about it. I, I don't usually brag about the nice shopping experience I have downtown. Uh, so I think that's important to understand. Um, and, and this is a benefit to our community. And just like uh, reuniting Courthouse Square was an investment and our intent was to bring more to downtown, I think making this change is also an investment because if, if our merchants are able to uh, realize some improvements in their business by uh, suspending progressive parking indefinitely, uh, we have a chance to measure, maybe that is it. I mean, it, I know it's part of it, 
I don't know if it's all of it. Uh, there are different factors that cause a business to go under, and I, and I get that. This could be one. And if we have an opportunity to eliminate a barrier, we should take that opportunity. Uh, we are not in the business of paid parking downtown as a revenue generator, from what I understand. It's there for a certain purpose. Uh, so we, we need to look at that. Uh, and looking at the, obje the objectives that we have uh, and why we have it, and we talked about making space for easier, making spaces easier, easier to find. I think we still have work to do in educating people about our garages and what, what they can do for us as far as being a more of a benefit than the street parking. But that's on all of us to do. That's, that includes the business community. Can't just be the city. To what extent are businesses promoting opportunities for people to park in the downtown by, by helping to develop some kind of brochure to give people and educate them? Uh, that has to, again, if we're in it together, we're, we're in it together as well as part of the education. It can't just be the city doing that. As it relates to reducing congestion, again, that goes to getting, changing people's habits about parking to get into those garages where there's bigger value and freeing up some spaces uh, out on the street. Uh, the increased economic vitality, I think that could happen perhaps, but again, we have to see whether it was the parking issues that were uh, causing these dips or not. And then finally, we talked about providing more options to residents and visitors. It sounds like the options that they had before is what they prefer. So I, I don't have a problem moving in that direction. Uh, and again, my, my decision point here too is in the fact that this is not a revenue generator, generator and it should not. It needs to be paying for itself over time. Uh, so my, my interest, and I know we'll talk about other free stuff later on, uh, I've, again, it's, we're, in, we're in it together, and I've said this before at our downtown subcommittee meetings that we are partners in the downtown. We are part of the downtown, and I think it would be to our benefit to, uh, to roll this back uh, and see to what extent uh, progressive parking has been an impact on the reduction in uh, sales in the downtown. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I made a joke a while back, death taxes and changes to Santa Rosa's parking, because it does feel like this is a constant conversation that we're having. I, I think I've had it 14 times in the three years that I've been on council now. Uh, so it is something that I think the community uh, is beginning to get a little bit uh, frustrated and confused by. So I am looking for long term for us to find some form of normalcy that people can just fall into a rhythm on and, and uh, rely on. Uh, you know, I understand the policy construct extremely well. I've spent a lot of time talking to the public about it, uh, talking to folks downtown about it. Uh, I'm highly skeptical that, that parking is the reason that we're seeing so many businesses failing. But I also know for a fact that the business community downtown has gone out and taxed themselves to try to make our downtown a vibrant place. And I think that it is in our best interest as a city to meet you halfway. If that's the request that's coming is to let you show us whether or not it's having an impact by rolling back from eight o'clock to six o'clock, then I'm gonna be absolutely supportive of doing that. Uh, go out there, help us to sell to our downtown that it's a place where people wanna go and we'll hopefully do what we can to support you as well on that. And what I'm hearing from the council is enough votes for us to do that rollback. I also really did appreciate last year and understanding after the impact of the fire and the cumul cumulative impact that we're seeing from the de-energization that folks are struggling. And so the uh, Saturday, which we will be discussing, I think is a good step. I actually am in favor of doing the free Saturdays in the garages uh, the same amount of time that we did last year, going straight through all of the Saturdays up until the city resumes in January, which I think is January 3rd, January 4th. It's not necessarily on the 1st, but whenever City Hall opens back up. So I will be supportive of, of the rollback from 8 p.m. to 6 p.m., and then I'm also supportive of free in the garages on Saturdays. Thank you for the information. So this has been an interesting conversation. I know there's many folks in the audience who I've had this discussion, <clears throat> and I, I, I'd like to make data-driven decisions, and a lot of the data shows, you know, excellent presentation from the two of you. I really appreciate that. Um, and I also have my own personal experience with parking downtown, which I don't, I understand the system. So I appreciate Sonu sharing, you know, an out-of-town visitor and um, his experience. Mine's just been totally different. But with that, I also believe that um, the downtown businesses and the city of Santa Rosa and the city council, we're on the same page, we're on the same team. So this is more of a relationship type thing. Whereas I want everyone to be thinking that we are on the same page, we're trying, we're in this thing together. And right now, whether it's blame uh, due to parking or some of the other conditions, I want us to be in a position in the city of Santa Rosa to be known for, we will do what needs to be done so that we're in this thing together. 
and no more, no finger pointing. So with that, I'm very supportive of rolling it back to where we were from um, nine to six. Um, the one thing though I do wanna have, and I'm committed to it, so whether it occurs with me, cause I know I have a meeting with the DAO early next week or with the downtown subcommittee, I do think we need to come up with some common understanding. How do we know if what we've done works? We've talked about anecdotal. Anecdotal, you know, six months from now, that's gonna be hard for me to swallow. So right now, before we're in crisis, what are those metrics at the end, you know, Q1 or Q2, and you know, maybe you and I had asked Chuck, when would we get the data where we can see, does this work? So we do have that long-term strategy, and we don't do this each and every year. The time to have the discussions about did it work or didn't it work, it's not when we're in crisis, and I'm not suggesting we're in crisis with the amount of businesses coming and going from Santa Rosa, but let's just agree on some metrics so we can focus that discussion sometime next year, not just before the holidays to say, yes, it's working, or the strategy has actually um, paid dividends. So uh, I, I really wanna encourage those discussions um, to continue on. Um, I'm also supportive of the holiday, uh, what we did last year, because again, I also think that it's important not to be changing this every year. So the, the, the steps that we took last year, I think we should be consistent in doing do them again this year, because I heard positive feedback regarding those steps. So with this, I'll go back to staff. Did you get enough consensus or so, feedback? I think so, but I, I did want to clarify one thing. So I, I heard support for hours of 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., which I'm interpreting that that would be at all parking meters, both value and premium. And we would continue to have our premium and value zones of a dollar and a dollar fifty an hour. Changing that does require a council. That's a resolution that put that that rate structure in place, but changing the hours does not require us to come back. That's something we have the discretion to do. So I just want to make sure I understood correctly what I'm, my, my mission now is to move as quickly as we can to changing those hours, which is a logistical thing that we need to deal with, but we can do that. The feedback, not the votes, the feedback I heard also didn't mention of changing any of the value or premium spots, it was just roll back of the hours. And I'm seeing nodding heads. Ms. Combs, is your head nodding? My head is nodding. So I think that was a yes. Was that it then, uh, Kim? Uh, yeah, the, the only other thing I wanna say is just to reiterate the data point, um, uh, sales tax data lags six months. Um, generally, we cannot go uh, into a deeper dive by month or even more specifically. Um, so we'll look at what we can do. And then short of that, um, we of course have the parking data and we'll um, work and perhaps work through the downtown subcommittee um, with the Downtown Action Organization and Metro Chamber on what data we can get um, short of that, which we have uh, and under our control. And to Rice's point and to your point, uh, Mayor, um, I think we need to understand what it is we wanna do because these data sets are la lag significantly the results. And so one of the questions we're gonna have for the council is, I believe we need to commit to free Saturdays for a longer period of time say what the metric is for success, how we're gonna measure that success. So we're not in this conversation every holiday season because the collection of the data does not match the results. And unfortunately for all of us in the community, October is being um, challenged to do real in-depth analysis and get time to get those conversations moving forward. So that's one of the things I do wanna come back and really get an understanding of where the council's commitment is to that so then we're not struggling and correspondingly what success looks like to keep that offer on the table. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, do we need a brief break to set up for the regular council meeting? I think we should take a five minute break, so. Okay, let's take a five minute break, recess, thank you.
Welcome to today's uh, regular session of the Santa Rosa City Council. Uh, Madam City Clerk, announcement of roll call, please. Let the record show that all council members are present with council member Combs teleconferencing from Ecuador. Council member Combs, can you confirm you are on the line? I'm confirming I'm on the line, but it appears the system automatically cuts me off about every two hours. So I will be having to redial at the two hour mark. Thank you. Thank you for that information. Uh, closed session. Yes, the council met in closed session and discussed items uh, 2.1 and 2.2, and on each of those items gave direction to staff. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, we have no proclamations today. Staff briefings, Mr. City Manager, is there a, a staff briefing for us tonight? No, there is not. Keeping with our city manager, do you have anything you'd like to report tonight? Yes, I do. Um, a red flag warning is in effect from 4 a.m. tomorrow to 7 a.m. Thursday for the North Bay Mountains in elevations over 1,000 feet. With a lack of rain, conditions in our area are dry with low humidity. However, winds are expected in the upper elevations only. Due to the forecasted conditions, PG&E has announced plans for a public safety power shutoff event that will have impacts to the eastern parts of our community. Since this weather event is concentrated to the higher elevations only, the footprint of this potential PSPS is smaller than compared to the most recent shutoff events. If implemented, the power shutoff will start as early tomorrow morning as at 7 a.m. and will impact the east side of Santa Rosa. PG&E anticipates they will be able to announce the all clear at around 8 a.m. Thursday, which is when the inspection and re-energization process could begin. PG&E indicates that this could take up to 24 hours and residents in the impacted area should prepare to be without power for multiple days. The current number of customers that, are, that will be impacted in Sonoma County is approximately 40,000, including uh, just over 12,000 customers within the city limits. We estimate this equates to approximately 36,000 Santa Rosa residents impacted by this potential event. Public messaging and staff preparations for the potential shutoff began this past Sunday when we learned about PG&E's potential plans. Today, the city, excuse me, today the city activated our EOC at about uh, 1.30 this afternoon and will remain activated until this evening. The EOC will close overnight and reopen 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Wednesday. The EOC will also reopen Thursday with exact timing and staffing still to be determined depending on the PG&E's plans for restoration. PG&E will open a community resource center for impacted residents in Sonoma County at the Santa Rosa Vezer Veterans Memorial Bil Building located at 1351 Maple Avenue, Santa Rosa. The community resource center will open Wednesday, November 20th from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. and will remain open daily until power is restored. Restrooms, electronic device charging, water, blankets, heating, and cooling will be available. City staff are currently determining options for potentially opening a warming shelter overnight Wednesday during the power shutoff event. More details on that will be available soon. To prepare for the weather event, additional firefighters will be on duty starting at 8 p.m. tonight. For the latest information on this event, residents can follow the City of Santa Rosa and the City of Santa Rosa Fire Department on Facebook and Twitter. Visit the city's emergency web webpage at srcity.org slash emergency or call 211. Thank you. Thank you for the information. Council, do you have any questions about that information the city manager just shared? No, thank you. Do we have a city attorney report? I have nothing to report this afternoon. Thank you. Great, thank you. Council, any uh, abstentions on today's agenda for anyone? Mr. Tibbetts? Thank you, Mayor. Unfortunately, I'll have to abstain from 12.5 in the consent calendar, so if that can be taken separate, I'd appreciate it. 14.1, 15.1, and 15.3. <laughs> Mr. 
So you said 12.5, 14.1, 15.1, and 15.3? Correct. Great. Thank you. Any others? Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. I'll be I'm abstained from 11.1, .1, the minutes of the November 5th meeting, as I was not in attendance. Thank you. And Mr. Alvarez? I will also be abstaining from the approval of the minutes. Any others? And I will be abstaining from the approval of the minutes also. Do you have the votes you need for that item? I think we have four of us left so, doing the math. Go ahead, Ms. Fleming, did you I'll have? I'll be abstaining from item 15.3. 15.3. .3. I think we have quorums for all items. Do you have any abstentions, Mr. Vice Mayor? No, I'm boring. All right. Okay, mayors, council members, reports. Um, Ms. Combs, could we start with you, please? Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. Um, I'll, I'll read a statement if that's all right. Um, today it is with a heavy heart that I offer my resignation as a member of the Santa Rosa City Council. My last day will be November 25th, 2019. I do want to say it's been a great honor to serve the people of Santa Rosa for the past seven years as a council member, and I am grateful for the opportunity to have served our beautiful city and to have made contribution to our civic life. I deeply appreciate the many colleagues and friends I have made within city government, as well as all the special people who give their time and service to our community. I intend to remain involved with Santa Rosa City Government as a private citizen and as a resident of Santa Rosa. If there is anything I can do to make the transition easier, please let me know. It is not my intent to inconvenience anyone by my resignation. I do sincerely hope that the wishes of the people of Santa Rosa for a balanced council will be taken into account in considering my replacement. We have made much progress since I joined the council and I am proud of our accomplishments together. We've improved open government processes, we've annexed Roseland, uh, we've improved city-sponsored homeless services with a variety of ways including the CHAP program. We've done more for inclusionary housing. Um, we've changed a number of uh, directions um, with the help of our new city manager and city attorney. We've implemented district elections. We've improved processes with our downtown as we saw just a moment ago with our DAO. Um, we've implemented our climate action plan. Uh, we've improved uh, services including turning streetlights back on. Um, we've implemented body-worn cameras. We've also worked hard on the fire recovery from 2012 and much more. We have begun to address jointly with the county the challenges of homelessness and housing services faced by our working poor. And if I am to have any legacy, I hope it is that the council will continue to address these critical issues together in a balanced and compassionate manner. I want to thank you very much for your understanding. I'm finding it hard to pass the torch, but we are all human beings and sometimes personal concerns prevail. I have very much loved serving the citizens of Santa Rosa, and I look forward to continuing my involvement as a private citizen. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you, Council Members Combs. I really appreciate your comments, and it's been wonderful uh, sharing a seat next to you during this, uh, my first year as mayor. Um, so we'll go around Council if you want to make any comments, because unfortunately Council Member Combs isn't here, so we can personally thank her or make any comments. Um, but before we get to comments by individual Council Members, um, Madam City Attorney, could you just explain now with what we just heard that um, last day, uh, or the resignation effective November 25th, what is Council's next step? steps to fill the vacancy. With a resignation date of November 25th, the council then has 60 days uh, if it chooses to appoint an, a successor. Otherwise, um, the appointment of the successor would go to a special election. Um, it, it is our intent that we will bring uh, a, an item to council on December 3rd. The first step is for the council to consider 
a schedule for the appointment, for opening application period, for review of the applications, and ultimately appointment of a successor. We will bring that calendar to you uh, again on December 3rd. Great, thank you for that information. All right, well, let's just go around. If you have a, anything you'd like to report or any comments for Council Member Combs. Uh, Mr. Alvarez, can we start on your side? Yeah, I was, uh, uh, I, was, I was trying to think back of uh, some of your, your term here, Council Member Combs, and I greatly appreciate that. I was just thinking back when we started uh, our, our own discussions with our committee related to homelessness, and now here we are so many years later, uh, it continued to expand that. But I do want to extend my appreciation for your years of service, even before council, I believe you served for a number of years on the cab as well. So thank you very much, and I wish you uh, luck, and I wish your husband well, thank you. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Julie, for all of your service over these many years. It, it takes a great deal of sacrifice as we all know, and uh, you have served your constituency um, consistently and, and with great dedication, and I am um, pleased that you're turning your efforts inward to take care of yourself and your family, and I wish you all the best in the future, and uh, in, enjoying that part of the world uh, when, you're, when you are in Ecuador that I have never seen, and I'm sure it's a beautiful place to live, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Mr. Toots? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, hey, Julie, it's Jack. I just want to um, give my sincerest and heartfelt thanks to you uh, for all the time you've put on the council. I remember coming up as a young man in this community and the Board of Public Utilities and starting to get engaged in city government. And I always really had a deep appreciation for uh, how much care and compassion you brought to the job. You know, you use that word compassion and I certainly see it and felt it. And then after having the opportunity to serve with you, boy, did I feel it on a number of occasions. And I just think that um, the legacy you do leave behind is one that is um, particularly uh, focused, if you will, on, on the working poor. And I hope that uh, this council will continue to, to push that forward. I'm sure we will. Um, I will miss you on this council. I hope to see you around Santa Rosa uh, or in Cuenca. I might take you up on that offer to visit you sometime. Um, so really, thanks a lot, Julie. Ms. Fleming. Uh, it's with a really heavy heart that I say goodbye to you in this capacity, Julie. Um, if it hadn't been for that fate meeting a few years ago, I certainly wouldn't be sitting on the council and your mentorship has uh, meant a lot to me. I especially appreciate, appreciate your uh, really intense commitment to your constituents, and I, um, I know that, that your voice will be missed on our council. All right, take care. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I, I think, Julie, I think you've heard a lot of us talk about your heart, and I think that that's really what you're gonna be remembered for here on the council. But one of the things that I noticed hadn't really made it into the discussion yet, and I wanted to bring up was your relentless pursuit for community engagement. And I think whether it was on the cab uh, or whether on the city council, I, I think there has never been a council member who worked so hard to make sure that the voices of folks who didn't make it to council meetings were heard. And I remember hearing and having a discussion with you about what budget season looked like before or at the beginning of your term and what you were able to transform it into by reaching out to different groups, uh, to, to folks who felt marginalized. And I think that that's gonna be a lasting legacy for you. I think it's incumbent on the rest of us to fill that void both in missing your heart, but also missing that community engagement. And I know you'll let us know if you think we're falling short of that metric, but just a sincere thank you. Yeah, I too, Julie, wanna to thank you for um, all of your efforts because it's kind of odd here, I don't know where to look. Uh, so if, if we had a Skype, I'd be looking at you, Julie. But you know, I, I think I first met you when I was the chief of police and we had a relationship there. And then when I joined council, I think both of us surprised each other in the number of common areas that we had. Um, and our agreements were much more than our disagreements. And uh, because of your efforts and the perspective you have brought to council, I think you have truly made me a better uh, city council person to evaluate things from a different perspective that I didn't have before I was on council. So I truly thank you for all of your efforts for the city of Santa Rosa. You really have made a difference in our community. So with that, are there any other reports that any council member wants to make? Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let me just say thank you all 
before you go on. Thank you very much. I, I'm really grateful, and it has been uh, an exp a pleasure and an experience working with each of you. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Mr. Vice Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first and foremost, I will be appointing Jeff Nathanson to the Arts and Public Places uh, Committee uh, as my replacement, as my appointment uh, to it had moved up to Windsor, uh, so unfortunately left this community. Uh, I also wanted to report out on a couple of different community events that I was able to attend. Uh, first and foremost was this last Sunday. It was the reopening of the Snoopy Ice Arena and it kicked off uh, 50 more years, as they said, of uh, celebrating with our community and providing a place for youth to learn how to skate and play hockey and uh, during the, uh, the Olympics uh, curling, if that's your, your forte as well. Uh, so just a huge congratulations to the Schultz family. That was a huge lift and it had been closed for six months, so it was really great to see it back open. Uh, I had the mayors and council members legislative meeting last week where the discussion was around public safety power shutoffs and that conversation will continue with a discussion and a letter being drafted by the chair that I'll bring back to this council when it's ready uh, with specific impacts to our community and specific asks uh, from our community of the legislature and of the governor as they resume the legislative session this coming January. So that'll be an important one for us. Uh, I wanted to thank the chief of police. I had a chance to stop in as Ray did his listening tour and he had uh, West End last week. It was really well attended with folks to talk about issues from homelessness to traffic to literally what they were seeing on their own block uh, and what their neighbors were, were having difficulties with in our community. So, so thank you, chief. That was a really well uh, constructed and well attended event. And I understand, I think you still have two left if that's correct, uh, throughout the rest of the community. So if you get a chance, take a look at that. I know it's on Facebook. Uh, and then finally, I'll bring to the council's attention that there is the launch of Vision Zero, uh, which we've talked about a little bit, uh, trying to make sure that we have bicycle and pedestrian safety throughout our community and achieve uh, zero fatalities. That'll be launched on December 3rd as an exercise at Sonoma County Transportation Authority. I know everybody is watching that closely. Uh, and then uh, final thing is just a reminder that from Thursday the 28th, that's Thanksgiving, uh, through December 1st, uh, through that Sunday night, SMART will be running free uh, throughout our community. Uh, so feel free to jump on the train. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Any other, Mr. Tibbetts? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I wanted to bring up a couple of issues relating to downtown that I had some conversations with uh, Mr. Rumble last week about, and, and it's, it was interesting because speaking for myself over the last few weeks, I have not been paying a lot of attention to what's going on downtown, what some of the needs are there, and beyond parking. I mean, as we all know, we just addressed potentially one of the parking issues that downtown had. But apparently there's a lot of other things that I, I perceive as being kind of low-hanging fruit. For example, uh, it's apparent we have restrictive ordinances in place that make it very difficult to put up lighting outside your business or, or decorative art, uh, things like that. Uh, additionally, in, the ability to increase signage downtown, um, greater access to hosts to help deal with some of the, the issues that exist down there with people experiencing homelessness, brighter street lights, um, an additional police uh, police presence downtown. And I just thought it might be a good idea for this council to have a study session just generally on that, because looking at the investments that the, this council has made in Old Courthouse Square, just making sure that we kind of keep a, a sharp focus on that. So I, I bring that to the, to the council's attention potentially for a second, or I'm, I'm not a member of the downtown action, or excuse me, uh, downtown subcommittee. So if there's already work happening and I just am unaware of it, I just wanted to raise it in the public space. Yeah. I know we had a brief conversation about it. I know myself and potentially the city manager have a meeting with the DAO on Monday. Um, and I would also, I, I would be personally interested, I'd like to get the information as to what we'll be talking about there, but also talk about, the, talk about this with the chair of the downtown subcommittee because w what I heard you just say, it to me in my mind, kind of sounds like a subcommittee type item, but if it would be better to come to full council I don't, I, I want to have the discussion. I'm just not sure what venue is the most appropriate. 
then, but then what I would propose is, uh, Mr. Mayor, when you have your meeting on Monday, if you and I could touch base perhaps and then and then make a decision about it, because I do get the, the impression there's a sense of urgency, um, and I think there would be an appetite for the council to address it as one body versus going through the subcommittee multiple steps. But uh, I, I don't want to get ahead of that conversation. Great. Mr. Vice Mayor? Yeah, and I just want to echo that sentiment that uh, the folks who are on the subcommittee, I think, have that conversation regularly, and I think the rest of us are interested in having it as well at some point. Okay. Um, Ms. Fleming, do you have some comments? I, I would support Mr. Tibbetts' um, request, and I think that uh, what would be uh, fruitful would be for, after your discussions, it would be for the downtown subcommittee to host a a forum or something of the sort to get input from our, our downtown community and business owners and bring it back for a discussion of the full council. Yeah. So, so if I could ask Mr. Tibbetts, if you allow me to wait and have my meeting on Monday because I can get it on the agenda, talking with the city manager, depending upon what those items are and hearing what you said here, it might be more efficient for um, me just to uh, assign that <clears throat> and have the discussion with um, whomever our new vice mayor is to see where we're going to fit it on the agenda versus having to bring it back to council to talk about do we want to put it on the agenda, put it on the agenda, or I think it might be a more efficient way of doing that. Okay. Mr. Sawyer? Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I, I think it would also would be good uh, after your conversations um, to be able to clarify what is what might be an actually a budget item that might come up that might need to be discussed during our budget review as opposed to um, just general items of concern it would be it would really be good to be able to prioritize those those items and I think that that the I think the first place uh, that where that might happen could be the subcommittee um, but I, I, I await your recommendation great thank you uh, Ms. Lonnie, do you have some comments I did. I, I had an opportunity to go to a, a joint informational session uh, between our um, Transportation and Public Works Department and the Santa Rosa Junior College around the potential closure of the Elliott Street um, to make it a bicycle and pedestrian um, corridor. And I wanted to thank uh, Rob Sprinkle and Nancy Adams and one um, other individual whose name is escaping me at the moment, as well as Dr. Chong and his team for uh, for collaborating with us on this project. Thank you. Um, and I just want to report on two things. Uh, first, last week I was with one other uh, city staff member at a senior leadership gathering for those uh, across the nation working on ending homelessness. Um, it was, I think, a very um, great opportunity to talk to others across the country who are dealing with some of the same issues that we are dealing with here. Some of the different topics that we as a cohort rotated around was leadership capacity, momentum, funding, awkward conversations and conflict, navigating politics and community interests, evaluating performance and then the value of relationships. So I'll be looping out with a variety of different community stakeholders. I am sure the city staff person will be doing the same, but it was a very healthy uh, conversation to see that we are not unique in some of the challenges facing our community in regards to homelessness. And then this morning, I just want to thank uh, Providence St. Joseph's Health for uh, bringing together several different community stakeholders to talk about funding related to housing instability and homelessness. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I had to leave early to come to our closed session. I know some city staff was there, so I'll be anxious to hear uh, the ultimate report of that. We're trying to leverage some of the private dollars along with governmental dollars uh, and others in our community. So I really appreciate the fact that they uh, brought everyone together. All right, next on the agenda, we have the election of a vice mayor. So the process we will use, I will uh, solicit nominations for the vice mayor, and then uh, we'll vote and go from there. Um, Mr. Olivares. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I would uh, nominate Council Member uh, Fleming. Second. All right, so we have Council Member Fleming. Nominated by Mr. Olivares, seconded by our current vice mayor, Mr. Rogers. Are there any other nominations? Were you going to nominate someone else, or was there a comment? I, I thought you were going to ask me if I was going to accept the nomination, but, <laughs> but, but that's. Um, would you be willing to accept that nomination? Yeah. Anyone else you want to nominate? Not today. Cool. We're all right, uh, no other nominations. With that, then um, I will, as a presiding officer, declare that the, uh, Ms. Fleming will be elected vice mayor by unanimous consent. Thank you and congratulations. Congratulations.
Would you like to make any comments, an acceptance speech or anything now? <laughs> well, when you put it like that, I mean, how can I not? Um, I, I'm definitely honored. I take that as um, a badge of um, support from my, my council members. And um, I hope, I wish you good health and not too many vacations so that I don't have to do too much. But at any rate, um, I look forward to continuing my work for the working families of our community. I'm not sure when the last time that there was a mayor or vice mayor who had a child under 18 living at home, and I think that it's really important to have our voices of people who are working and raising families um, here at the table. And there's enough work that I will end it at that and we'll get back to it. Great, thank you. All righty, uh, item 11, approval of minutes. I know we have three folks abstaining. Those of us that can vote, are, are there any corrections to those minutes? Seeing none, we'll accept them as submitted. Mr. McGillian, consent items. Yes, uh, item 12.1, resolution, free garage parking on small business Saturday, November 30th, 2019. Item 12.2, resolution, professional services agreement with Muni Services LLC for revenue audit and consulting services. Item 12.3, resolution, approval of purchase of four replacement paratransit buses. Item 12.4, Ordinance introduction, Spinster Inn rezoning, clerical correction, 407 South A Street, assessor's parcel number 010-221-016, file number MNP14-018. Council, any uh, questions? Item 12.5, sorry. Ordinance adoption, second reading, ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa amending Title 20 of the Santa Rosa City Code, adding Chapter 20-39, objective design standards for streamlined and ministerial residential developments to create objective design standards for streamlined and ministerial residential developments, file number REZ19-019. Sorry about that. Thank That's you. okay. Council, any questions on the consent calendar? I do have one on item 12.3, the four replacement paratransit buses. We're not yet to public comment yet, Eric. Oh, Hold on a sec. Excuse me, Mayor, his card is for item 12.2, I believe. <clears throat> right, I have a question. Okay. Okay. So on item 12.3, I didn't see any options for electric vehicles for the paratransit buses. Um, is there a reason for that and or how do we start evaluating electric buses into the fleet? I know we had a discussion, not with paratransit, but with other buses. Great question. Um, thank you for uh, Gary Coslin, Transit Planner, Transit Division. Um, the time of the application for the grant in uh, 2017, um, there was not an option to purchase electric buses under the uh, under the contract options, um, and still currently, are, there are no paratransit vehicles that have met the federal requirements to use federal money to buy by paratransit vehicles. We'll continue to monitor those op those opportunities. As you know, we have a commitment at the state level to um, to meet the uh, the ICT and 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 have full uh, uh, all electric uh, fixed route buses by uh, 2040. But currently, there's no requirement for paratransit vehicles. Okay. So, uh, thank you for that clarification. I do appreciate continuing to look at any opportunity to electrify our fleet. I would really appreciate that. So, thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, we do have one card on this item, item 12.2, Eric Frazier, and on consent calendars, you have two minutes. Okay, thank you very much, I'll be quick. Uh, my questions had to do with the staff report. It was unclear whether that cost of this contract is per year or per the life of the contract. I wasn't sure if it was a $600,000 per year contract. Um, I know you can't answer that question, but I'll lay that out there. The other concern that I had was one about the uh, conflict of interest. I'm not sure if this is the same firm that's involved in the uh, parking enforcement aspect of it, but uh, I do see in their contract where that they charge a percentage of what they make, and I wonder how that 
in fact, doesn't qualify as a conflict of interest. What we do see in the parking enforcement area, if this is the same firm that's involved in collection of that revenue, is that we see a staff working in concert with their contractors to make sort of rules on the fly that impact how parking fees are collected, when they're collected, the amount that they're collected, who they're waived for, and so on and so forth. We actually saw evidence of that tonight during the progressive parking when it was very convenient, obviously, to, to change that up because staff has broad discretion over setting these fees. And we wonder how that conflict of interest may be exacerbated with the contractors, especially ones that operate in a frontline capacity with taxpaying um, residents. Um, thank you, that's my concerns. Thank you. And Ms. Combs, did you have any questions on the consent calendar? I wondered if um, we were also looking at whether or not the uh, manufacturer was cooperating with the California standards um, for emissions. That's regarding item 12.3, the paratransit bus? In the media about um, avoiding the use of companies that are fighting the California standards at the federal level. Okay, staff is about ready to respond. Yeah, maybe the question could be repeated. Some companies are nationally fighting the implementation of the California standards for emissions. And I'm wondering if we are noticing whether or not the companies we are using to hire, I mean, to uh, purchase vehicles are companies that are fighting the California standards for emissions or not. I'm, I'm unable to answer that question. Okay, do you hear that, Julie? That's something we may want to look at in the future. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Weissmeyer, you've got this item. Thank you. I'm going to take it in two parts. Um, I'll move items 12.1 through 12.4 and ask for a second. Second. We have a motion and a second. And, and all of these have got to be voice vote, correct? Or roll call vote. Okay, roll call vote, starting with Mayor Schwedhelm. Yes. Council Member Chris Rogers. Aye. Council Member Combs. Yes. Vice Mayor Fleming. Yes. Council Member Oliveras. Yes. Council Member Sawyer. Yes. Council Member Tibbetts. Yes. That passed unanimously. Thank you. Okay, and then I'll move item 12.5 and uh, look for a second, please. All right, item 12.5, we have a motion and a second. Roll call, please. Uh, Mayor Schwedhelm. He's gone, yes. Uh, Council Member Rogers. Council Member Combs. Yes. Vice Mayor Fleming. Yes. Council Member Oliveras. Yes. Council Member Sawyer. Aye. That passes with six votes and one abstention. Y you know, Jack's recusing himself from like four things tonight. This might be entertaining. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do we have any cards for public comment? So we will take the first 10 cards. We have three minutes per public comment. First up, Elizabeth Neon, followed by Carolyn Watson Teal. Well, thank you very much, and we'll definitely miss Julie. Um, first thing I'd like to mention are the uh, public phones in the transit mall. When the transit mall was redesigned, I don't know if it was six years ago, seven, 10, it wasn't that long ago, 
they put four public telephones in the transit mall. After a short time, two of them remained out of order for a long period of time, and then the company came and took those two away, and then they left the other two that fell into disrepair, and they took them away. Uh, at this time, I am only aware of one public telephone in the city of Santa Rosa, which is inside the lobby of the library. There's also one in front of the Petaluma Library, which is outside that you can use when the library is closed. And there's also one inside the lobby of the Sebastopol Library. It <laughs> um, brings me to the, the subject of our cell phones safe. Uh, and our cell phone tower is safe, and I like the gal that spoke last week about the, the cell phone tower in front of Montgomery High School. I think that's quite an injustice to the young people that go to that high school. So um, the wind events that we have are definitely part of climate change and climate crisis along with the fact that so many people own cars and drive them mercilessly, it seems to me, as a person who has not owned a car in about 10 years. Oh, that's not completely true, actually. I was gifted a truck and I kept it for a year and then I sold it. So I did drive it a few times and it was registered to me. So anyway, but yeah, I don't choose to own a vehicle like that anymore. And um, while I was in the hospital, I read this newspaper called Slingshot. It's like a Berkeley rag, I think. Um, and it had a, an article on climate change in which they stated that 100 million tons of CO2 are going into um, the atmosphere on a daily basis. I think climate crisis is really, really on our, at our throats. Um, of course, I do want to mention the war machine that is the largest employer on the planet and also the largest polluter on the planet. Um, I think driving less is critical to humanity's survival, and I personally do not trust cell phones, especially with children. 23 seconds, oh my gosh. Well, let's see, um, what else is on my mind? Uh, I'm glad I get to go home, I'm kind of tired. Um, yeah, yeah, spending 24 days in the hospital did just really wore me out terribly much, so thanks for listening. Thank you. Carolyn Teal, followed by Janice Bradshaw. Hi, my name is Carolyn Teal. Um, I just wanted to come here today to tell you about my experience last Sunday, where I was attacked by a pit bull rather viciously um, right next to Montgomery High School in the green space. And um, the dog came out of a homeless encampment. I actually was attacked by the pit bull and the small white dog that was also residing there. Um, I've come to find out that that homeless encampment has been there for at least two years, and the dog has been uh, known to animal control to have bitten people before. Um, I'm an artist, and the dog, the dog did a real number on my arm and my hand, and I had to have surgery and um, still might actually lose function in some of my fingers. Um, uh, and I just really wanted to come here today to kind of shed a light on the fact that this, in particular, this dog had been re-released back to these people over and over again after biting people. and. If it had have been a small child or an elderly person or something like that, they wouldn't be here. A child would be dead. I had to call the ambulance myself. Um, as I was waiting for the ambulance, there was a woman pushing her stroller along the sidewalk, and I just wanted to yell at her that she needed to get out, that it wasn't safe. And I'm thinking, if you can't be safe right next to a high school or you know, in a neighborhood, uh, it just, it kind of boggles my mind. And I know that there's no easy answer to what's going on with the encampments, but the, uh, the safety measures that aren't being considered for the general population, I think is, is really lacking. And if anything needs to be done, 
that type of thing needs to be done, that, that the animals and the welfare of the people around those camps need to be taken into consideration because I really don't feel like I was and I don't feel like um, the general population was. Um, it was pretty horrific and I will be reeling from it for a while. And that's my neighborhood and I can't walk around in it now. And the women are still actually in the homeless encampment. The little white dog is still there. I do know that the pit bull went to the, the quarantine but I haven't at this time found out if it was euthanized. That's what they said they were gonna do. But, you know, what's to stop them from getting another dog? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Janice Bradshaw followed by Alan Thomas. Hello, my name is Janice Bradshaw and I'm a concerned homeowner in Santa Rosa and the reason I'm here today is because I am concerned about the additional rollout of hundreds of small cell towers. There are thousands of peer reviewed studies that show harm to health, including cancer, mental problems, DNA damage, reproductive harm, and many others. And I'm especially worried about our children. I have two grandchildren and I'm very worried about their health. Um, children have thinner skulls and smaller bodies, so radiation is absorbed three to ten times deeper than in an adult. We need to be cautious and not roll out more cell towers until independent research proves safety. I would like to submit some recent 2019 studies into the public record that show Mental problems like ADD, ADHD, depression, anxiety, memory problems, insomnia, violent behavior, suicide, headaches, cognitive impairment, reproductive harm, re um, damages sperm, disruption of hormones, decreases hormones. Um, there's also a national toxic ecology program that found clear evidence of cancer. There's the bioinitiative reports that reference more than 3,800 peer-reviewed published studies that show it jeopardizes health. So I think we need to be cautious and I think we need to really study these effects before we just roll them out. And some of the studies that I have here um, there's one that was from September 2019. It's about the mobile phone-based station towers, settings adjacent to school buildings, the impact on the student's cognitive health. There's one here about long-term exposure to electromagnetic radiation that induces stress and anxiety. Um, cognitive neurochemical consequences. Um, radiation that affects amyloid precursor proteins and metabolism. There's one here that talks about the male reproductive harm or the sperm. And I have one here that um, shows also about the effect it has on hormone profiles. This study showed a significant decrease in cortisol, thyroid hormones, and testosterone levels. So thank you very much for your time and um, I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Alan Thomas followed by Alex Crone. Thank you, Mayor Schwedhelm, Vice Mayor Fleming. Uh, Alan Thomas, 306 Boy Street. Um, it's, it's really hard to follow up and, and talk about the issues that Santa Rosa's been facing with the folks that sleep outside. I know you like to always call them homeless and you're kind of carp launch thing is just to deal with housing issues. But you can tell this is not just a housing issue. We've been told time and time again that this population, whatever words you want to attach to them, um, don't want to seek shelter. So it's a little disingenuous when you speak of the issues that the public are having regarding being attacked, public def defecation, having things stolen, being intimidated, um, 
the city park over off of Quanah Springs Road. There's an article on the front page. I can't imagine you didn't see that. Well, there's an individual who would normally be like, yeah, 20 acre park, that's fantastic. We have bocce courts, we're gonna have all these things, but we, we don't want that. Because you, people down there, the people over here, the police department, the county, the governor, they can't protect people. And without that protection, everything's getting shut down. So you have to broaden your scope. I please ask you, broaden your scope. It's not just about housing. It's about activities that take away from our community on a daily basis, year after year after year, and it's getting worse and worse. If people either fight, like the group can here, Citizens for Action Now, or they flee. They go to Boise, or they go to Arizona, or they go to Florida, or they go to wherever they go, but they don't stay here. I don't want to leave. I like Santa Rosa. I, I was born here in California. So, you know, this is my state, but I feel like it's just literally falling apart. And to keep banging the same drum about housing at $500,000 a clip to put up a house, that just isn't feasible. But what's feasible is correcting the behaviors that the people that are living and the people that are creating those behaviors. So please focus on what the issues are. Don't lump it all together and say, well, we'll finally figure it out once everyone's housed. Because there's not gonna be people here in Santa Rosa that will be able to support all that. So again, like I said, my heart goes out to that woman and I'm sure it touches all of you. So whatever you can do to try to just think inside yourself if that was your daughter, your granddaughter, your wife, how that would affect you and how you look at some of these issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Alex Crone, followed by Jennifer Laporta. Hi, thank you for your time and attention. I'm here again in preparation for the December 10th study session on the further installation of 4G, 5G cell phone towers throughout our city. I just wanna share some more information with you guys. First of all, these towers are not for making voice calls and text messages, okay? They're thousands of watts. It takes a fraction of a watt to cover a city block for voice data. That's not what this is about. This is a real estate and power grab for future 5G technology. Currently, these towers are running 4G, 2.1 gigahertz to be precise. Very powerful, within 1500 feet radius, people are being exposed to extremely high levels of microwave radiation. But whenever they want, they can come and put a phased array 5G antenna on those poles, and that's what this is for. 5G requires millimeter waves, millimeter waves. They, Verizon just purchased for lots and lots of money 28 and 39 gigahertz, okay? In order for that frequency to work, they need to have cell phone towers everywhere within hundreds of feet of each other. That's what this is about, okay? This is about AI and creating a market for future technology like self-driving cars. This is an Orwellian society coming true. And the buck stops with you guys. They have the right as a telephone company and they're gonna come and cite some 1800s law that they have the right to provide telephone service, fine. Allow them to do that. But they don't have the right to come and put a thousand, 2,000, 3,000 watt antenna to provide video service and all these other things that the Telecommunications Act and whatever law they're referencing does not give them the right to do that. I'm gonna give you guys some important information here into the public record, one, is a document from the US government from 1998, a literature review on the biological effects of millimeter wave technology, the kind that Verizon's gonna put, come put on these poles. Because once they have a contract for the pole and their equipment, they can do whatever they want to that pole. They can put an antenna on whenever they want. They can increase the power as long as it's under the FCC guidelines of 61,000 volts per meter, which is established from the 1950s and is irrelevant. I have another document here. This is from the Navy from the 1970s, and there are lots of recent studies. This is an important document for people who are in the know. This is, has over 2,000 references. This is what the US Navy knew about the effects of microwave radiation back then. 
Mr. Olivares, Ms. Fleming, you referenced your kid and your grandkid. Do yourself a favor, read this, okay, please, for them, for us, for your constituents. And a few other scientific studies here, specifically on 5G and millimeter waves. I hope you guys get a chance to look at these and actually do some research. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Laporta, followed by Kim Schroeder. Hi, I'm very concerned about um, your plan to install over 100 small cell towers in Santa Rosa, of which 25 have already gone up with inadequate notice to the public. Um, the FCC is issued a rulemaking order on March 30th, 2018 to expedite the deployment of densified 4G, 5G, and other advanced wireless facilities, what the FCC calls small cell facilities. This order exempted all of these 5G facilities from two kinds of previously required review, historic preservation review under the National Historic Preservation Act and environmental review under the National Environmental Policy Act called NEPA. On August 9th, 2019, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit vacated the FCC's rulemaking order. I submit to public record a link to this case. The legal effect of vacating the FCC's rule necessarily means that the prior rule was reinstated and any actions taken on the basis of the vacated rule have to be reconsidered under the terms of the prior rule. So the prior rule required the FCC to apply NEPA to the construction of 5G facilities. Consequently, it is not lawful for any such facilities to be constructed without prior NEPA review. While other actions of Congress and the FCC have attempted to circumscribe the city's authority over the construction of densified 4G, 5G facilities, in light of the court's decision, the city is now within its rights in requiring the sponsors of densified 4G, 5G facilities to provide evidence that the FCC has conducted a NEPA review prior to approving any request for construction. Moreover, in as much as the court's decision vacated the FCC's rule, the decision applies nationwide and its effect is not limited to the District of Columbia. By simply writing a letter to the wireless carriers and their agents declaring all of their wireless facility applications are incomplete, the city will stop all shot clocks and give the city the time it needs to update its municipal code to provide safer, faster, and more reliable data connections by doing the following. Regulate conditions to preserve the quiet enjoyment of streets in the city. To achieve this, by writing a local protective ordinance that limits the maximum effective radiated power output from wireless facilities. I can't see how much time I got. 21 seconds. Okay. Um, for any fiber optic cables installed in the public rights of way require that the public have access to a junction box at the base of each, each facility allowing city residents to directly connect to this fiber optic goodness via wire. This is the best choice for routing big data. Thank you. Kim Schroeder followed by Mark Mortensen. Hi, I'm Kim, uh, good evening council. I'm Kim Schroeder and last week I spoke as a Montgomery parent concerned about the cell tower in front of uh, our school in Montgomery. That was a quick three minutes and I just wanted to add a few things before the upcoming study session. Um, so the following cities, Contra Costa, Danville, Davis, Mill Valley, Monterey, Napa, Nevada City, Oakland, Orinda, Palo Alto, Petaluma, San Francisco, San Jose, San Rafael, Santa Cruz, Sebastopol, Sonoma, Kentfield, Fairfax, Sacramento. The list goes on. There are many more in Northern California and throughout the state and U.S. working toward, and many have already established ordinances to protect our neighborhoods and schools from invasive cell, cell towers. Um, these cities are taking steps to protect their residents, and we need our city to do the same. Our community is very fearful right now. With fires we've had, and we are resilient, however, people are scared. The red flag alerts, power outages continue to trigger the PTSD, and it's difficult to relax these days. 
The thought of another dangerous threat of high level dense radiation entering homes and schools is also making people scared, not to mention the privacy issues, decline in property value that we'll have. We need to give our residents another reason to stay in our great community. In talking with friends, families, neighbors, I'm finding that people don't want these in their neighborhoods and schools. And they, they, don't, they want the choice. Small cells are not small. In fact, most people don't even know that this is coming. I live in Bennett Valley and poles are contracted to go along Summerfield south of Hohen. That entire corridor would be radiating in nearby neighborhoods, including Bennett Valley Montessori Preschool. I, of course, am concerned about all neighborhoods in Santa Rosa and the contracted poles are dispersed throughout. I recently learned that some neighborhoods hired attorneys before the first group of small cell, cell towers went in almost two years ago. They managed to keep towers out of those neighborhoods so far. Those who had no idea or couldn't afford attorney got the towers. All neighborhoods should be safe in our community regardless of financial status. If we really wanna be a smart city, we should have safe, efficient, and more reliable equipment than so many wireless towers that require electricity. Wired internet, fiber optic cable is faster, safer, safer, private, secure, way more efficient, and doesn't have the massive carbon footprint that these so-called small cell towers do. I know our city supports fighting the climate crisis and being a green city. We want to be a city that attracts and retains businesses, but it makes sense to do it in a way that is in our citizens' best interests. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Mortensen, followed by Lisa Landros. Good evening. Uh, good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. My name is Mark Mortensen, resident of Santa Rosa, and I'm also a member of the Santa Rosa Climate Emergency Resolution Team. Um, I'm here to speak in support of the City of Santa Rosa adopting a strong climate emergency resolution as soon as possible. Um, over 1,000 local governments in 25 countries, including five cities in, our, in Sonoma County have done so. Um, tonight, uh, Sebastopol is voting on their climate emergency resolution. And as you know, the Sonoma County Board of Supervisors has adopted a climate emergency resolution. A robust CER is one that recognizes the latest science, which strongly indicates that getting to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 is the only way to possibly reduce or prevent catastrophic extreme weather events like we've been seeing. The Santa Rosa CER group has put forth a, re a robust climate emergency resolution and a list of actions that would help Santa Rosa achieve net zero greenhouse gases by 2030. One of the actions, for instance, is on the agenda to be voted on later tonight. Um, I ask that the council and staff continue to review the Santa Rosa CER group's resolution and its list of actions. In front of you tonight is a room full of community members, many of whom which are eager and ready to assist their council and their city in taking actions and implementing the solutions that are available to us right now. The petitions that I've got here compiled online and on paper, currently around 3,000, ask for the resolution. They are an indication of the support for your action and the political will that you can expect going forward. Um, a quick quote from ex-President Obama, no challenge poses a greater threat to future generations in climate change. This was during his State of the Union address in 2015. All of us together, community members of a great city, are community members of a city with great vision. Let us not delay in taking the steps necessary to ensure that those future generations that he was talking about uh, live a safe and secure life that they deserve. Thank you very much and best wishes to Council Member Coombs. Thank you. Lisa Landers, followed by Eric Frazier. I'm coming on the heels of the dog attack victim that's also from my neighborhood. I wanna share this sign if you didn't get a chance to see it because I had firsthand experience with this last week as well. I was on Yalupa Avenue when a 100 pound dog seated on the church steps at New Vintage Church 
took off at a 50-foot offensive move and tackled the cyclist off his bike who was riding in the street. He then went after the gentleman's dog after he tried to bite the guy on the arm, but the guy had a padded jacket, so it kind of blocked that. The woman who owned the dog appeared to be a transient. She had multiple bags all around her. She slowly got up from her spot and sauntered to the scene of the attack. I pulled to the next corner to check on his welfare where he was shaking. I've never seen anybody shake like that. I said, are you really okay? And so I had dispatch programmed in my phone. I had him call Santa Rosa PD dispatch and tell, talk about the particular, particulars of it, that it was totally unprovoked. This dog chased him down like a rabbit. I'm from ranch property. We shoot dogs that act like that. We've had many dogs attack our livestock, and that was absolutely the way this dog went on the offensive. So SRPD kicked it over to animal control and told the gentleman, unless you're injured, you don't need to stay on the scene. So I followed it up with animal control the next day. Um, I'm gonna describe the woman's um, demeanor as curt and very unhelpful. I filed the e-file complaint from a witness standpoint with all the particulars. Um, I then notified city council with all the particulars of it. I then notified board of supervisors with all the particulars because there's overlapping jurisdiction with city and county on different kinds of issues. I see there's a city fine. Um, so I followed up again with animal control and I got a message from Santa Rosa Police Department saying it wasn't their concern that they referred me back to Board of Supervisors who then told me, why are you calling us? You should call City Council, it's their problem. So I'm gonna talk about accountability from departments. There's a lot of people with a lot of budgets and a lot of people on salary and a lot of people who apparently don't collaborate, unify and talk with each other. We should not have to go to these links to file a dog complaint about a dog that's doing this. That dog was 100 pounds. Uh, that's the bike route for all the kids. It would have taken a small kid out. It could have swallowed a kid's head. So I'm a little in despair over how everybody works together in, in coming up with a solution. Um, I did get a call back from Goran's office who said, well, it's not really our responsibility, but I'm gonna have animal control call you again anyway, where she informed me that they don't take a dog off the street unless it breaks the skin. And I said, well, what about being a vicious dog? This was obviously on the attack in prey mode. She said, oh no, that's a whole nother thing. So we need to address those dog issues. We need to figure out a new way to give people a feeling of safety and get those dogs off the street. Thank you. Eric Frazier. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. I appreciate uh, your time today. Um, I am very concerned about the comments I'm hearing about the dog attacks and other examples where you guys aren't doing your job, uh, quite frankly. Uh, I think what we see also in sitting through the progressive parking session is that we have a city now that has de devolved into one that depends on consultants. Uh, we are also, it's like you guys don't take responsibility for everything, for anything. You, you have consultants that do it for you, or you have consultants that support whatever attitude that you want to bring to the table. Or the consultancies, when they come forward, they're going to advise the formation of yet another quasi-government agency that's going to pick our pockets. You know, I think what also pointed out, and it is truly Orwellian, that here we talk about cooperation and information, but when we look from department to department at the reports that are published, they're not auditable, they're not correct, they're not complete, nobody's held responsible, nobody signs off on these reports. What you have is developed a kleptocracy, unfortunately, that people are going to flee from, not only from the dog bites, not only from the lack of ordinance enforcement when it comes to homelessness and, and bad behavior, but they're going to flee because they can't get a fair deal here. You guys are mirror bound to the quasi-government, you're beholden to them now, as we'll see in the CBD formation, and you ignore the residents. We heard from parking, for instance, where they have a discounted monthly parking rate at the parking structures that they uh, offer to businesses. Well, they don't offer it to residents. Residents that are also starved or have the low income or meet whatever cr criteria that they put out there, they're not offered that. We have to park in the structure at full cost. The other thing that happens is that here we are in various states of emergency and the power of shutoff situation continues to linger, linger on, but yet 
you use parking enforcement as a revenue driver. You can sit there and say, oh no, parking's not in the business of making money. They made $200,000 profit last year from enforcement. Millions of dollars flow through enforcement. When people have to leave their homes because they are fleeing a state of emergency or because they're responding to a PSPS, they come into the welcome arms of San, Santa Rosa, which will give them a parking ticket. It was interesting to see that, oh geez, when the progressive parking was first installed, where there was some waivers on those fees. I would expect it would have been huge based on the amount of emergencies that we've gone through. Thank you very much. Okay, those are the first 10 cards. If you do want to make comment on items not on the agenda, we will open it up on item 17 later in the agenda. And also just to give uh, update, Several speakers were talking about the uh, cell tower discussion that was previously scheduled for today's agenda. It's been moved due to the uh, number of events in our community, including the public safety power shutoffs, and that is on our agenda for a study session on December 10th. So with that, Mr. McGlynn, item 14.1. Item 14.1, report, third amendment to homeless outreach services team, host program agreement, housing first fund, and risk mitigation for section eight housing choice voucher program. Kelly Kuykendall, housing and community services manager presenting. Good evening, Mayor Schwethelman, members of the council, Kelly Kuykendall with Housing and Community Services. I'm the department's homeless services manager and I have with me this evening, Rebecca Lane, and she is a manager with our, excuse me, Housing Choice Voucher Program. So I will provide uh, a background on the Homeless Outreach Services Team Program, also referred to as HOST. Um, I'll also go over funding um, and our contracts for the prior fiscal year and the current fiscal year, 2019-2020. Uh, Talk a bit about the Housing First Fund, the proposed third amendment before you this evening, and then Rebecca will cover uh, the council direction we received on September 4th, including providing um, access to risk mitigation for the Housing Choice Voucher Program. So the city first sponsored a host program back in August 2015. Host is a street outreach team that engages individuals experiencing homelessness with the goal of bringing them into services, shelter, and housing as part of the Housing First model. Host also operates the mobile bathroom shower trailer known as Clean Start and is the lead outreach provider for our encampment team, the Homeless Encampment Assistance Program. Council first funded the Housing First Fund in March of 2018. I'll go um, into more detail on that program in the next slide. Just wanna cover briefly the 2018-2019 accompli accomplishments for the HOST program. So last year, HOST served 334 individuals, 171 were sheltered through the program, 137 were housed, and the housing retention rate is 77%. So last year, council approved a little over a million dollars for the host program. Um, 534,000 of that was for the Housing First Fund. That provided for landlord incentives, um, such as a sign-on uh, bonus and a support hotline, a risk mitigation, which is an insurance pool or access to an insurance pool if there is <clears throat> for non-payment of rent or excessive damage to a unit, and tenant assistance to help with things like transportation costs to apply for housing or to help with application and credit check fees, as well as housing assistance to, so to provide direct assistance for uh, moving costs, security deposits, short and short-term or long-term rental assistance, and operational expenses. So this boils down to salaries and benefits for specialized staff to support the Housing First Fund, including um, housing navigators, uh, housing locators, and housing um, stabilization case managers. At the end of the last fiscal year, there was a balance of $189,500 for the Housing First Fund, and those have rolled over for the current year. Um, 
Catholic Charities did draw down the full amount budgeted of the 534 for housing assistance. Moving into the current year, Council approved uh, an additional million dollars for the host contract, including the Housing First Fund. We have so far committed $557,350 via a second amendment. And Catholic Charities is rapidly deplo deploying the housing funds um, under this year's contract, which brings me forward to this evening to commit the balance of $443,100. To provide you with some information in terms of um, just how quickly Catholic Charities is deploying the housing funds, they've drawn down as of September 245,000 of the funding budgeted for housing assistance this year. And the Housing First Fund as of September had a balance of $174,000. We still have the full 100,000 budgeted for uh, the risk mitigation, um, a majority of the funding for tenant assistance, and uh, some funds have been drawn down for uh, the, um, excuse me, landlord incentives. The third amendment before you this evening um, is doing two, two things. We're, like I said, committing the balance of the funds already budgeted for this fiscal year the $443,100, and that includes an additional $350,000 for housing assistance, $50,000 for landlord incentives, and $43,100 for operational expenses, plus an additional $35,000 for um, support, administrative staff support to the Housing Choice Voucher Program, which Rebecca will cover in the next couple slides. So the total amount being committed this evening via the Third Amendment, should you approve it, is $478,100. Okay, thank you, Kelly, and good evening, council members. My name is Rebecca Lane, and I'm the manager of the Housing Choice Voucher Program for the City of Santa Rosa. And I'm here as a follow-up to our last meeting on September 24th, when Council approved um, the Housing Anti-Discrimination Code uh, that passed on October 1st of 2019, and the adoption uh, was 30 days from that date. Um, during that, or as a reminder, that ordinance uh, bans rental housing discrimination based on source of income which includes the use of housing choice vouchers which are issued by the City of Santa Rosa Housing Authority. Similar legislation is also going into effect on January 1st, 2020 at the state level under Senate Bill 329. The council during our presentation on September 24th requested that we parallel um, the ordinance adoption uh, with immediate access to the existing risk mitigation pool. And that's what brings us back here today to jointly present with Kelly uh, regarding this host contract amendment. Council's request was based uh, in the interest to have both the carrots and sticks uh, to address some of the concerns that we heard from owners during our outreach efforts regarding the anti-discrimination ordinance. The $35,000 that's being requested tonight would expand access to the existing risk mitigation funds to cover Housing Choice Voucher participants for uh, the risk mitigation. The Housing Authority will continue to explore long-term uh, loss mitigation strategies and other owner incentives, uh, where our interest is to open this immediate access, which is what council requested, uh, and continue to build on the momentum that we have uh, established with our uh, owner community as well as our participants to find ways to make the Housing Choice Voucher Program more successful and optimize the, the experience for both landlords and tenants through ways uh, that we can mitigate some of the known um, challenges uh, for, for owners and tenants on the program. Uh, so in order to support those efforts, uh, there we, we would uh, plan on coming back. Future general fund may be requested to support the efforts because the funds for the Housing Choice Voucher Program are limited statutorily to the payment of the rental assistance and then the administration of the program to, to cover staffing and things like that, and it does not include something like owner incentives. Um, the other communities that we've spoken with throughout this process, uh, 
those are the the mitigation and incentive pools are funded uh, through the general fund of the uh, jurisdictions where those programs exist. Um, so again, this uh, request tonight is to open the immediate access um, to the risk mitigation pool and going forward, we'll continue to develop uh, more comprehensive landlord incentive and uh, risk mitigation. With that, I'll cover the recommendation and we can move into any questions that, thank you, that you might have. So it is recommended by the Housing and Community Services Department that the council by resolution approve a third amendment to grant agreement for the host program with Catholic Charities in the amount of $478,100 for the continuing administration of a housing first fund. This includes landlord incentives, risk mitigation, tenant assistance, and housing assistance to include access to risk mitigation funding for the Santa Rosa Housing Authority's Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program. Bringing the total amount of the agreement to $1,035,450 for fiscal year 2019-2020. And lastly, authorize the chief financial officer to appropriate $35,000 from the general fund unassigned reserves to the homeless shelter operation fund for host administration of risk mitigation funding for the housing choice voucher program. This concludes our presentation. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great, thank you for that presentation. Councilmember Combs, do you have any questions? No, I really appreciate that this is moving forward and uh, thank you very much for uh, bringing this to us. Council, any questions? I have um, two questions. A, the um, risk mitigation fund amount, I see it's 100K, it wasn't tapped into. Um, how do we come up with that figure versus what if we made it 50,000 and applied that 50K towards other uses of actually getting people housed? The 100,000 is the original amount that council approved with the Housing First Fund last year, 534,000. And so we're keeping it at the 100,000. However, there's flexibility within the budget um, for this program to move money around should we need more for a particular use, specifically the Housing First Fund. Right now, Catholic Charities is over budget in the housing assistance line item in the at the budget as it stands before you approve it this evening. And staff has the flexibility to move money around within the budget so long as they don't go over the total budget. Great, thank you, that's very helpful. And can any of these dollars be used for master lease agreements? Our um, contract provides flexibility, so absolutely it's housing assistance, so we're looking at short term and long term and also being creative with that, so we would certainly consider master leasing. So if there are landlords out there that are willing to enter into a master lease agreement with Catholic Charities or other providers, we could use these funds to help realize those? Yes. Great. Okay, any, Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. I, I have a question regarding the mitigation fund. I know it was a concern of many uh, landlords as to the, um, uh, some of the consequences at times for um, re being required um, to move into the program, the Section 8 program. So I'm wondering if there is a if there is room for some more prescriptive or a little more specificity on how much uh, would be given to landlords that are uh, now potentially and under some circumstances required uh, to uh, move into the Section 8 program. Certain amounts that are tied to um, the, the the risks involved, uh, whether and then in, in time, hopefully those risks will be will not come to fruition and the program will be will be more embraced that is my hope um, but in the meantime there are to be able to encourage landlords is there is there a, a, some room for specificity um, with these amounts to, to help mitigate some of the landlords concerns Thank you, uh, Councilmember Sawyer, for that question. And yes, that's exactly what we want to do in the long term. So we'll continue to work on that. We, we've established great relationships with uh, many uh, owners and representatives that we didn't have before um, as part of the process of going through the anti-discrimination ordinance. And uh, so what we're attempting to do here is to basically uh, you know, piggyback, for lack of a better word, on the immediate access 
access uh, to the, the risk mitigation pool that already exists uh, through the city funds, uh, and that's administered by Catholic Charities. So $35,000 will allow Catholic Charities to expand their uh, administration of that fund to participants in our Housing Choice Voucher Program. And in the long term, that's where we hope to continue to address uh, other concerns and get more specific about what our local owner participation incentives will be for the program. Are you in receipt of the letter from the North Bay Association of Realtors regarding some recommendations for those mitigations? Yes, yes, and that's one of the, the foundations that we're working from. Okay, excellent, thank you very much. Sure. Any additional questions, Ms. Fleming? Thank you. Um, I, ha I do have a couple of questions. One is, um, so in the last uh, allotment, there was a, a surplus of $189,000. Was that eventually spent or drawn down through flexibility and in, in spending? To that slide, hold on. So this was the balance of the 534, 534,000 that council approved last year. That's rolled over for use this year. Catholic Charities is drawing on that. They haven't drawn anything on the risk mitigation fund that's just available should, um, you know, should they need it or should an, a landlord um, need to access that. They are spending down on the landlord incentives and also on the tenant assistance. Does that answer your question? It does. Um, I'm wondering if it's consistent with best practices when um, an organization comes so far away from target um, spending what we allot to continue to allot at that rate or to adjust to be more in line with uh, real spending rather than um, projected spending. I think the only response I have to that was this This was approved, I believe, in March of last year, and it took a few months for Catholic Charities to get the program up and running. So it's not, you know, it's not a full 12 months that they had access to the 534,000. I've really seen in the last probably three months or so that they have this program, you know, well established and they're starting to draw on those funds. So it's, is it your belief that they will be able to effectively deploy their funding if we fund them at the level that we did last year? Particularly with the um, housing assistance, yes, at the rate that they're drawing it down, we will use that. The goal with the risk mitigation is not to draw that down, but to have it available for landlords. So I don't anticipate seeing a, a decrease in the risk mitigation funding um, unless a landlord draws on those funds. Uh, I, I do anticipate them being able to draw down on the landlord incentives and the tenant assistance. And as I mentioned to Council Member Schwethelm, should we need more from housing, for housing assistance, we can draw from these other line items within the budget. Can you remind the council and the public what the current balance is on the risk mitigation fund? The current balance as of September, um, as of their last invoice was $174,000. So you're asking for an additional $35,000? These funds rolled over from last year and are, are available. What we're asking for this night, tonight is $35,000 from the general fund plus council's permission to commit what was already approved as part of the budget for this year. So the only piece we're asking for additional funding is the 35,000 from the general fund to support the housing choice voucher program. The balance of the funds this evening, I think it's 478,000. Hold on, excuse me. Sorry, I jump for a slide. Here's a breakdown right here. So you previously budgeted funds for this year that were approved as part of the budget, the 443,100, plus the 35,000 is what is in the third amendment this evening. Does that answer your question? It does, it does. And um, just where I'm going with this is that, you know, the council did uh, put forward a request for um, a housing um, support for um, our anti-discrimination. And I'm curious to know how far $35,000 can get us. I also am uh, eager to support that um, effort, but also reluctant to give really any amount of money out of our general fund without knowing the specifics of that type of program. And I invite you to come and share that with us um, back here or in any other forum. So thank you. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to appreciate, I think it was on slide three, somewhere in the beginning, you had the retention rate of 77% for the uh, 
for, the, for folks who had received services. Uh, that's, to me, a really key number, particularly when we're talking to the community about how these dollars are being allocated. The uh, number, I would assume, but correct me if I'm wrong, is from the time of the placement to now, or do we have a one year, what the retention rate is for one year number? I guess the better way to put it is, what's our metric that we're using there to determine retention? We look at we look back at six months and 12 months, um, and there's some overlap between the program years. Based on when people are entering the program, it might cover you know, last year and this year, but we do look back six months and 12 months, and that's typically what our system of care does okay, as so well. Okay, so is that 77%, is that 12 month look back or a six month look back? I'd have to look at the report. The 77% should be a 12, 12 month look back. And we're refining that in the report this year. I'd say each year with this program, you know, host started in 2015, we're looking at how it's performing um, and how we can be better tracking information um, to, you know, look at performance management. So we, we've refined that point for this year as well. I really appreciate that. I think one of the things that we're all very focused on is how we keep people housed and get people housed who are not. And I think that number is the key one for being able, being able to properly evaluate which programs are seeing that type of success. Great, okay, we have two cards on this item. I get my hand up. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Combs. If, if it's appropriate now, thank you. Um, I do. I do have a couple of follow-up questions. Um, I'm wondering if we have set an upper limit on payouts for risk mitigation. My understanding is it's not uncommon for cities to set an upper limit for risk mitigation payouts. Um, have we established anything like that? Uh Hello, this is Rebecca. Uh, yes, so we uh, are going to be following the existing uh, Catholic Charities policy for the risk mitigation funds, and there are maximum amounts uh, for claims based on the size of the unit. So it varies uh, from a shared uh, housing situation to at $2,000 to uh, two plus bedrooms at $10,000. Okay, and just to confirm that um, we have folks in place who are able to tell the difference between ordinary wear and tear and uh, really improper use that would trigger risk mitigation use. Yes, uh, again, Catholic Charities, uh, that's how they administer this fund. Uh, and so there would be a pre-inspection required of the unit as well as a post-inspection verification that the damage to the unit uh, qualifies uh, and is in fact beyond normal wear and tear. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, if we needed to move monies for example, if we decided we needed to uh, increase the amount of tenant assistance, do we have the flexibility to move monies among these pools? Yes, we do. As I mentioned, we've done this before for housing assistance, and so if there are other areas or need demonstrated, so long as it fits within what council's approved and the budget and doesn't exceed the total amount approved for the program, we have flexibility. Fabulous, thank you very much. Okay, uh, we have two cards here. First up, Alex Colfin, followed by Eric Frazier. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm here this evening in support of 14.1, especially um, the policy relating to access to risk mitigation for those property owners who participate in the Section 8 voucher program. Um, we certainly appreciate the effort of city staff and the council um, to have this conversation. And these are the types of programs that we fully support and encourage um, I also would like to mention that this was one of our one of our three concerns, and it's really nice to see when a conversation happens with staff and it happens with city council, and here we are talking about it with a possibility of it actually happening. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I I think that builds a certain level of trust that folks can look at and feel confident that this program is something that they can use. 
Um, additionally, I completely understand that the program is in the early stages and I'm certain that there will be an opportunity to have further discussions. What would be really helpful is to have a level of clarity of what is exactly available on at what levels. Um, so if folks are going to be using the program, they know exactly where they stand. So again, I understand that this is early on and I'm sure we'll have discussions and I look forward to working with the city to making sure this, this is a successful program as I think it will benefit all of us if it is successful. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Alex. Eric Frazier. Um, Mayor and City Council, I appreciate it. Uh, I did want to talk about risk mitigation. I find that to be a very compelling program. And um, uh, before I do that, though, let me just mention that, unfortunately, I find the financials and the reporting to really be deficient. I think the questions about the risk, meta risk mitigation fund being an item that's spent down sort of proves my point. That's a separate item in accounting. It's obviously a risk abatement pool that's only used from time to time. The whole point is not to have to use it, not to use it, not to spend it. So, you know, again, here is where the data just does not comply with reasonable standards for accounting, unfortunately. <clears throat> Be that as it may, I find certainly a silver lining in the risk mitigation pool. Uh, Mayor, you may recall a conversation we had a couple of years ago about the importance of risk mitigation funds and how they can be applied. And we talked about a different community, Denver, I believe it was, where their risk mitigation fund of about a million dollars is hardly used at all. I mean, just a couple percentage points of that fund is really called upon. And in fact, I think given the millions and millions and millions of dollars that people need to spend on security deposits in the city, and the millions of dollars, perhaps tens of millions of dollars, of those security deposits that are lost through uh, actions of the landlord. In other words, just keeping the security deposit, not giving them back, somebody has to fight in small claims court. Oh, all sorts of problems. Uh, I'm sure anybody who's been a renter here, been a tenant here, has horror stories about how they've been ripped off on their security deposit. And of course, there are landlords that are going to have stories about uh, their risk that needs to be mitigated. I think that it would be an outstanding opportunity to look at how risk mitigation funds can apply to the broad spectrum of landlord-tenant relationships. I think that uh, the idea that a tenant has to pay a security deposit is actually quite obsolete in the age of renter's insurance, for instance, that sh should help mitigate risk for the landlord. And it represents, again, a, a way to just sort of suck the tenant dry in the city. And you guys should be concerned about that. You guys should be concerned about the lowest common denominator in, you, in your community. And as you are with the, with the homeless and with the Catholic charities. But I have to remind you that the house community is struggling as well. This program could be a boon for helping people get in housing when they need it and save their money from unscrupulous practitioners who want to keep that security deposit. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Any additional questions from any council? Seeing none, Mr. Sawyer, I believe you have this item. So we'll introduce a resolution of the council of the city of Santa Rosa, approving the third amendment to grant agreement for homeless outreach services team program with Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Santa Rosa for fiscal year 2019-2020 for the continued operation of a Housing First Fund to include access to risk mitigation funding for the Santa Rosa Housing Authority Section and Housing Choice Voucher Program, authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to appropriate $35,000 from the General Fund unassigned reserves to the Homeless Shelter Operations Fund and delegating authority to the Director of Housing and Community Services to execute the Third Amendment and wait for the reading. Second. Any additional comments from anyone for a vote? I just want to thank you for all your efforts. And you know, this is, you know, as we heard from one speaker today, I think we are walking the talk and we're trying to do everything we can to be as a community together uh, to work on this challenging housing issue. So thank you for the um, presentation. Um, Madam City Clerk, uh, could we do a roll call vote? Thank you. Mayor Schwedhelm? Aye. Council Member Rogers? Council Member Combs? Aye. Vice Mayor Fleming? Aye. Council Member Olivares? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. 
It passes with Council Member Tibbetts abstaining. Okay. Thank you so much for that presentation. Okay, we now have, uh, moving to uh, item 15.1, we have three public hearings. So just for members of the audience here, we will um, listen to or handle item 15.1, the first public hearing. And the council who's been here since one o'clock will be taking a break, then we'll reconvene. We may have the results of item 15.1, but we will take a break before hearing item 15.2 and 15.3. So with that, Mr. City Manager. Item 15.1, public hearing, resolution forming the Santa Rosa Railroad Square Community Benefit District and levying the assessment in connection therewith. This item was continued from November 5th, 2019 regular meeting. Who's, is it Raphael, is it you? Raphael Rivero, Economic Development Specialist presenting. Good evening, Honorable Mayor Schwedhelm and distinguished members of the uh, Santa Rosa City Council. Buenas noches, uh, Concejal Combs. Greetings from Santa Rosa. So uh, the item before you uh, is a consideration as a resolution of formation, which is the final step in the potential formation of our second community benefit district here in Santa Rosa under the new CBD ordinance passed uh, in March of 2018. 18, which enables these uh, type of assessments. Uh, the City of Santa Rosa, along with the uh, Railroad Square Association and with the guidance of our CBD consultant uh, expert, New City America, with a record of forming over 98 community benefit districts throughout the United States, held over a dozen uh, series of meetings throughout the year to discuss the potential formation of a community benefit district in Railroad Square. These meetings um, included uh, property owners as well as business owners, members from SMART, general managers from the three major hotels in the area, and most recently the association also had a presentation by city staff members uh, on, this, on the topic or on the subject of the uh, downtown, station area downtown station area plan, which led to a fruitful discussion outlining the benefits of a community benefit district. So the first critical test, uh, as you know, came on September 10th when the property owners representing a minimum of 30% of the total assessments in the area under consideration for a community benefit district in Railroad Square needed to submit signed petitions for the resolution of intention to move forward, which then would trigger the ballot process. The threshold needed was met that evening and the council adopted the resolution of intention. Clearly, that's why we're here tonight. So as part of the process of community benefit districts on September 12th, 2019, following the approval of the resolution of intention, ballot packets were immediately mailed, or on September 12th, to property owners of the 95 parcels within the proposed district along, along with instructions and a self-stamp uh, return envelope. In essence, the district, uh, uh, may be established an assessment, assessments levy for the fiscal year 2019-2020 if a majority of the weighted return ballots vote in favor of formation. Place making, so Railroad Square, interesting place, uh, historical. The interest in creating an assessment district stems from the concept of the levying of assessments on real estate properties, uh, property within the proposed district to fund physical improvement, attract new customers, increase business sales, and make Railroad Square a destination for tourists as well as for nearby visitors and local residents. The Railroad Square Association has been watching closely how the downtown CBD continues to evolve uh, within its first year and the success that it's been having um, since its formation. The concept seemed very interesting and achievable for the Railroad Square property owners and business uh, owners as well. The assessment provides the opportunity to fund maintenance, special events and activities and other special benefits within the district, revitalizing the area, creating jobs, attracting and retaining businesses and reducing crime. 
Santa Rosa Historic Railroad Square is a great way to define placemaking. It is an area that inspires people to collectively reimagine and reinvent public spaces. It strengthens, it strengthens the connection between local and, and people from outside the area. It promotes collaboration, urban design, and cultural and social identity of the area. There are well over a dozen thriving restaurants, uh, two iconic coffee shops, exclusive uh, boutique shops, a major smart train shop, uh, stop, a visitor center, and a theater playhouse. And as of March 2020, we will welcome uh, a new flag hotel in the area uh, with a grand opening of the AC Marriott Hotel. So the values again are tremendous, uh, and the values and opportunities are tremendous. Um, we talked a little bit about this in uh, the September 10th meeting. So the proposed uh, railroad square CBD consists of approximately 18 square blocks consisting of 98, 92 parcels owned by 58 property owners, including a parcel owned by the city of Santa Rosa. The following include uh, the uh, different uh, benefit zones within the proposed Railroad Square Community Benefit District. Uh, three of the benefit zones are geographically, geographically based. The fourth is a land use based reflecting the unique nature of the residential condominiums through the district and that one is not uh, listed on the, uh, on the, on the uh, legend there. So zone one, the green one, is the core are the core, core properties north of Third Street from 101 from the 101 freeway on the east and the railroad tracks on on the west up to A Street on the north. Uh, ben, let me highlight that benefit zone 1A will be a reduced cost for office-related building square footage in in if office use is the predominant use for that building. Zone two, in uh, the color uh, orange, are the two large hotels south of Third Street and east of the rail tracks. And then uh, zone three, yellow in yellow, the parcels west of railroad tracks north and east of the Santa Rosa Creek and south of Sixth Street. Uh, and then like I said, uh, zone four, it's um, um, all residential condos in zones one and three. So annual assessments are based upon an allocation of program cost by accessible linear frontage plus lot or parcel square footage plus accessible uh, building square footage and in the case of residential condominiums by actual building and unit square footage. So current future residential condominium owners are assessed differently since condominiums include actual building square footage that are not necessarily on the ground level, therefore linear frontage and lot size are not relevant to residential condominiums. This alternate assessment methodology is created to respond to special needs within the growing district. And the slide that's uh, being displayed right now um, talks a little bit about the uh, primary factors. We, at the last uh, meeting, uh, we didn't cover this so well, so I just wanted to reiterate that the primary factors used to, in the determination of the proportional cost to the parcels in the district are linear frontage, lot size of, or the footprint of the parcel with deductions for lot size that is allocated to private parking for uh, adjacent uh, business or underdeveloped parcels and then building square footage, uh, designation for reduced office space assessments if they are the predominant land use for the building that is being assessed in zone one, zone one. Current and future residential condominiums that will be constructed within the district and location within one of the three geographic benefit zones of the district. So there they are right there. Uh, quickly, we also covered this a little bit at the last, uh, uh, during the resolution of intention. Uh, so the uh, total first year assessment, but I'll go through it quickly. Uh, so the first uh, year assessment revenue in the proposed CBD is calculated to be 
231,826,000. Uh, there's actually uh, a minor adjustment from the previous presentation, which uh, detail a uh, 232,822. There was an adjustment made to one of the lots, um, reducing it by $996. It is important to know that the special benefits funded by the district will not replace the city's funded general benefits. Um, as we can see here in the downtown CBD, um, city staff is working very closely with the uh, DAO staff. Uh, there's a big collaboration going on, again, to make improvements to the downtown uh, area. Uh, that obligation does not go away, so that's what I'm trying to uh, reiterate. Uh, the special benefits to parcel owners are over and above those general benefits provided by the city, however. Uh, in looking at this chart, if you take away the 19% of program management and administration contingency and reserves, then there's 81% uh, that will go towards programming. Obviously, the uh, administration costs includes uh, office rent space, uh, insurance, and all of those uh, items related to the administration of the uh, district. Examples of the program include civil sidewalk operations, steam cleaning, beautification, maintenance of existing and new public spaces, private security, maintenance of an attractive uh, appearance to the district. District identity, uh, marketing, and placemaking would include website development, social media, holiday and seasonal decorations, branding of Railroad Square CBD properties, a banner program, and public art display, and connectivity to downtown, uh, as well as obviously the smart serving as the gateway to Santa Rosa. And the city's uh, commitment is uh, for the lot uh, is uh, $3,384 a year. So on to the uh, ballot process, uh, which uh, will take place this evening. Uh, so in terms of the ballot process, um, once again, we're looking at a weighted tabulation system where the weight of the ballot is determined by the amount of each property owner, uh, uh, of each the amount each property owner will be paying. Owners with the largest property, properties, buildings, lot size, street frontage, and within a specific benefit zone will be subject to paying more and therefore have their votes count in proportion to what they will pay. Unlike the petition process where we had to meet a 30% threshold, the ballots are actually tabulated. The vote is simply counted by the ballots that are returned tonight so there isn't a percentage threshold uh, we're looking for this evening. At the close of the public he uh, hearing, city staff, including the uh, acting city clerk, as well as the assistant city attorney, will go to room seven, right here at City Hall, where we will tabulate the ballots. So should any property owner be present uh, this evening who has not yet submitted a ballot, we have duplicate ballots available and they can do so tonight. As such, if there is actually a property owner pre present who wishes to withdraw their ballot, they may also do so this evening. The tabulation process is open to the public for and for those who would like to uh, participate and witness the proceeding. Uh, we ask uh, that the room uh, is, uh, they're gonna be sitting in the room for the room to remain silent so that we can clearly hear the tabulations being called. If anyone has any questions, questions will be available to assist them. All ballots within will be considered so if there are any questions about a ballot, the intentions of a ballot or a marked up ballot uh, or any discrepancy on a ballot, something that is not clear, but validity or question, the ballot will be given to the assistant city clerk, uh, to the uh, acting city clerk uh, or the city assistant city attorney, and a ruling for interpretation for that ballot will happen at that time. When the ballot tabulation is complete, the city clerk will report the results to the council and the council will then make a motion. 
and uh, that went over the uh, process. All right, so, um, so this evening, uh, it is recommended by the Planning and Economic Development Department that the City Council, by resolution, hold a public hearing to consider oral and written testimony regarding the formation of a Community Benefit Improvement District, tabulate all assessment ballots return to the city pursuant to procedures set forth in the resolution of intention, and if the assessment balloting does not result in a majority protest, then approve the resolution forming the Santa Rosa Railroad Square Community Benefit District and levying and collecting of the assessment in connection therewith. Thank you. Great, Rafael, thank you for that presentation. And can you just let everyone know room seven, is that upstairs straight down, same level as we are? Uh, yes, uh, right out here, uh, room seven. So walk down the ramp and then make a right and there's uh, plenty of signage and uh, the rooms at the, at the end of the hall. Great, thank you. Council, any questions on that presentation? Ms. Combs? No, thank you. Me me gusta CBD for Railroad Square, and I look forward to hearing what the public and the local uh, property owners have to say. Great, thank you. Okay, this is a public hearing, so I'll open the public hearing. We have a couple of cards. Uh, first up, Eric Frazier, followed by Jeffrey Smith. So I appreciate your indulgence. Um, uh, given what I know about how the city conducts its business and having a chance to review these details, I would say that the people that I've consulted stand firmly against uh, the formation of the CBD at this time. There's a number of reasons for that. Uh, number one, the DAO that was formed a couple years ago has just started, and already there's some problems that have developed. There's problems in that the 12% administration costs that that contract with consultants said were going to be part of that is exceeded tremendously. Estimates have it between 50 and 60%. Why? Because the administrative costs of the contractor that you use are not included in the administrative line item. Basically, you're lying. It's all sleight of hand. The data that supports the performance of the DAO is also highly suspect and does not appear to be accurate. Um, and therefore, the formation should be tabled until you have a better handle on the performance of this DAO uh, scheme. Uh, the formation of the CBD increases the cost for tenants and their customers. Their assessments are passed on by the property owners to their tenants and the tenants to their customers. Uh, this is not the right time to have additional costs put on the shoulders of small businesses and the, and the residents. It just is not a good time at all. It's not well thought out. The city is using the CBD process to subject property owners to pay for these services they already pay through for the municipality. The report seems to suggest that this is all cut and dry. This is something, this is uh, sprinkles on the cupcake. But that's not actually what's happening. There's been battles ranging about what the city is responsible for as far as costs and what this newly formed DAO has to shoulder. The city is potentially using its interpretation of voting rights as a property owner to cast votes in favor of the CBD, when in fact this appears to be more of a collusion between the city and this quasi-government organization known as the Chamber of Commerce. That should not be allowed. Whose interests are you protecting? The city is willing to use defective data to promote the formation of the CBD. One example of this comes from the Chamber's own uh, organization called Visit Santa Rosa. According to them, they claim 61,177 unique visitors go to the California Welcome Center every year. Well, that number is a bunch of hooey. I mean, seriously, just stand there for an hour or two, you'll find that a couple people go in there, get some brochures, but there's not nowhere near the 177 people a day that would be necessary to meet those numbers. In fact, what it is, is the staff walks back and forth by the counter, and then those numbers are reported to Sonoma County Economic Development in the state. We'll get to the bottom of that, but that's all another reason to give you pause. With the disasters that we're dealing with and the lack of value creation, this is an ill-advised scheme that needs to stop right now. Jeffrey Smith. Uh, 
Is Jeffrey Smith here? Seeing no one raise. Uh, you don't have to fill out a card. Uh, if you want to make comments on this item to the city council, would you like to please state your name and three minutes. Uh, my name is Dee Richardson. I am a property owner in Railroad Square. I've been involved with the association for decades on the Railroad Square Association Board, and I'm a property owner. Um, and I sort of beg to differ with the prior speaker, but I do want to let you know that as businesses and property owners, we have already gone through an assessment district over 20 years ago when we assessed ourselves to provide parking for our employees under the freeway. And in addition, we were able to do banners, garbage cans, Pringle lights and provide highway signs, things that we could not do as individual volunteer dues paying members. And so we have seen the benefits of an assessment district and, and we're very excited about what the potential can be. Um, I just wanna thank all of you and particularly our city staff who have worked with us to get to this point. Um, we really appreciate it. It's going to make a huge difference in Railroad Square. It's a right time to do this. We, there's so many things happening with the new station area draft plan and the amount of people coming into Railroad Square and Santa Rosa via the train. Um, our goal is just to create a better little world and another district in downtown Santa Rosa that enhances the charm that we have, makes it safe for visitors and for the people who live there, and continues to make it an attractive place to visit. So we appreciate your help as in the last year and a half, and I'm gonna be holding my breath for the next time, hour, and hope that it, we have a positive outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council on this item? Thank you, Mike. Good evening, my name is uh, Mike Montague. I'm president of the Historic Railroad Square Association. I wasn't gonna speak, but I felt it's important that I do. This assessment district was uh, brought on by me personally. Um, I watched how Courthouse Square or downtown has started theirs and developed it, and I know most of you have been very involved with that. You see the positives and a little bit of the negatives. Negatives I take as a challenge. Um, and Railroad Square would like to copy a lot of the things that Courthouse Square has done, but not everything. So this mold will be put together by our new board, and we hope to share a lot of resources between the two to benefit both sides. Um, my family owns a couple of pieces of property in Railroad Square. The dollar amount that's gonna be assessed to our personal property is not gonna be assessed to our tenants, and it's not gonna be paid for by our customers. Um, and I feel a majority of the property owners are gonna do the similar thing. It's really not a lot of money to do much with, but it's a great foundation for us to get started. Our biggest key, it, in my opinion, is to work on grants, either grants that are paid 100% or 50% or portions. The more grants that we can apply for and get for Railroad Square and even Courthouse Square, the monies will go a lot farther. Um, I really appreciate your support. The staff has been incredible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the council on this item? That's, thank you. <laughs> Seeing no one else rise, we'll close the public hearing. And at this point, uh, make sure I get the terminology, we'll recess this item to tabulate the results. Correct? Okay. Correct. And then we'll also recess the council meeting so the council can take a dinner break. We'll reconvene in about 15, 20 minutes. Thank you. Tom, can you...
Okay, we'll reconvene the city council meeting. Tabulated results are not back yet, so Mr. McGlynn, item 15.2. Item 15.2, public hearing, ordinance adoption, ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, modifying chapter 18-33 to adopt by reference with local amendments the 2019 California Energy Code, Title 24, part six of the Building Standard Code's All Electric Reach Code. Jesse Oswald, Chief Building Official presenting. All right, thank you. The item we have before the council this evening is our second reading of the ordinance to adopt the all electric ready uh, reach code, which is essentially the, uh, our local amendments to the California energy code. So I'm going to go through the presentation much like I did before, just because there's such a high interest in this item and I will truncate it as much as possible and we'll go through questions for me uh, as necessary at the end. So back to the background, California building standards are published uh, every three years. California Energy Code is one of the 12 parts of this series. And it is for both uh, public, private buildings, uh, residential and commercial. The focus on our ordinance tonight is for residential low rise uh, construction, which is three stories or below uh, residential construction. The uh, California Energy Code was published in, on July 1st of 2019, and that started our work down the actual process of adopting it with our local amendments. If adopted, <clears throat> the effective date of the code will be January 1st, January 1st, 2020. Um, as I have spoken before, the potential for a bit of a delay on the adoption due to the significant number of reach codes being reviewed by the California Energy Commission, it could be pushed off till February, but they will let me know. My goal is to actually have this submitted once it's voted on uh, as early as possible tomorrow. Um, so we locally as a jurisdiction, can uh, adopt more stringent requirements from the California Energy Code if we provide analysis showing that the pro proposed local amendment, amendment will uh, save more energy than the base code and be cost effective. So this, this represents the uh, body of the codes, the California Energy Code, which we're discussing tonight is uh, part six of the entire body of codes. Uh, these measures that are shown here are the uh, some of the highlights of what will come in the base code. This doesn't, these are measures that we are going to get from the California Energy Code, uh, regardless of the outcome of, of our amendments. Uh, the highlights are the lighting efficiencies are increased. Uh, you will no longer typically see two by four exterior wall construction. Previous code would allow it. Uh, through certain measures. Now with these significantly increased insulation values, you'll typically see two by six exterior walls. Doors are being addressed for the first time in energy efficiency. Um, it, it is an, a measure for them to uh, go after something that uh, nobody, it seems like nobody thought to address before, and now they're specifically addressing uh, insulation values for doors. Uh, the HERS is a specific third-party inspection, quality insulation inspections, which were only uh, uh, recommended in certain instances. They'll essentially be required in almost every installation of insulation. Uh, PV, photovoltaic, are known as solar systems for low-rise residential will be essentially required on every um, new uh, building. And natural gas is not eliminated from the code, nor is propane. This information was provided by the California Energy Commission. The, uh, the cost savings that they have uh, calculated over a 30-year mortgage is $19,000. The initial increased cost for construction is $9,500. And here are some of the other uh, items that are proposed, the required photovoltaic, increased building envelope requirements, indoor air quality, and the appliances uh, significantly increase in the requirement for efficiencies. 
And here is another uh, depiction of the, the requirement for the local jurisdiction to adopt more stringent measures showing that they must be uh, more energy efficient than the, the base code and be cost effective. Um, all, all codes must go through, through the public process and all reach codes, uh, what we're talking about today, if we were to carry it on through another code cycle, we would have to make sure that the state agreed with our findings of energy efficiency over base code and be cost effective. So these are the options that we presented to the Climate Action Subcommittee and clear direction was given to go with the all electric reach code. Uh, the other options were the all electric ready which essentially required pre-wiring for the eventual potential upgrade to electric only. And then the all electric favored was a mix uh, that would allow uh, trade-offs to still allow gas appliances installed in, in the building, but increased efficiencies in other areas of the building, much akin to Cal Green tier one efficiencies, which would mean 10 to 20% more efficiencies in other either insulation, other, other appliances or other elements such as windows, doors, those kinds of things. Here's our uh, metric tons of carbon dioxide that ha are shown to be proposed would be um, saved over, we have the the current code, 2016 code, then we have the 2019 code shown with a re reduced amount of CO2 emissions. That's the base code. And then 2019 uh, efficient homes, which are a higher level of efficiency. And then we have the 2019 electric only uh, being shown with this significant uh, decrease in, in CO2 emissions. So we've spoke of the cost effectiveness uh, requirement before. Uh, the study was uh, implemented with, uh, with throughout the region uh, for use by all jurisdictions if they chose to use it to go down the path of, of providing the, the state energy commission with the backing to show that it was cost effectiveness. And our partners here have been implement, uh, uh, ex extremely valuable in, in this process. And here is a summary of the cost savings or cost effectiveness that the state uh, has accepted. And this cost effectiveness study was not specifically targeted to the North Bay. This was uh, averaged over the entire state. That way anybody in the state could actually use it. They, they addressed and targeted the cost effect effectiveness study to all climate zones. So this overall total cost savings is $6,171 per unit. Uh, we had discussed at previous study sessions and council uh, meetings about um, fire rebuilds and what the effect would be on it. Uh, the Assembly Bill 178 was signed by the governor in September that exempts rebuilds for uh, that are in a, uh, an emergency area declared prior to January 2nd, 2020 from having to install photovoltaic solar systems. By proxy, um, this has been determined and interpreted that that will exempt any rebuilds from the all electric ready ordinance uh, because the cost effectiveness studies only addressed uh, all electric homes with photovoltaic systems. They didn't, they did not, uh, analyze any, any uh, buildings without photovoltaic. And that uh, bill sunsets in 2023. So we had significant outreach and input from partners in the community. Um, our building officials, uh, RICO, uh, Redwood Empire Code Officials Group, have met several times. It includes uh, numerous stakeholders in the, the North, North Bay area, several counties and city jurisdictions and townships. Um, our rebuild meetings with our North Coast Builders Exchange have been very valuable in getting the word out on this. Uh, we have a monthly meeting specifically targeted at the rebuild effort, but this, this issue uh, came up very specifically and early uh, about uh, to, to discuss and get the word out. 
coffee strong meetings, our coffee neighborhood meetings. Uh, it's been an uh, item of interest at every meeting for the last several months. Um, our Redwood Empire Rebuilders, uh, that group typically isn't affected for new build uh, construction, but I went to the meeting with them in Windsor back in October and found that many of those are either subcontractors that this would directly affect, and some of them that actually do new builds. So they were very interested in, and were appreciative to hear the information and were provided uh, the forum here and there to uh, give feedback. We do have our city website that was started to contain all of the information that we've discussed, the public forums at the www.srcity.org backslash all electric. We continue to put more information there. Uh, radio interviews, Press Democrat, and then a list of the public meetings that we've held uh, over the last six, nearly six months. So there are 50 cities and counties interested in the electric reach codes, and of course we don't have 50 listed here. The list continues to grow about those cities and jurisdictions that have actually taken action. Uh, of, of note for local uh, interest is Windsor has actually passed the all electric only reach code. So the, recommend, the Planning and Economic Development Department recommends that uh, this Santa Rosa City Council adopt an ordinance by reference, the 2019 California Energy Code, California Code of Regulations, Title 24, Part 6, as adopted and amended by the state of California and further amended based on local conditions for use in Chapter 18-33 of the Santa Rosa City Code to modify the Santa Rosa City Code to reflect the new model code. Oops. And apparently you're done. Oh, there we go. I hit the wrong button. All righty, council, any questions? Ms. Combs, we'll start with you. I'm here, but I can't get to the, to the controller. Did you have a question? We could hear you. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't get the, uh, the mute off. Uh, I don't have a question, thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry, you said no questions? No questions. Okay. Mr. No Rogers. Question, no questions. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> so uh, we talked about some of these issues uh, last time you answered some of these questions, uh, but we did receive a fair amount of feedback and it, it did appear that there was a lot of misinformation that was out there. So if you don't mind answering some, some questions again for us. Uh, so first and foremost, does this make building cheaper? The increase in initial costs is more for the base code. The, there is a cost savings by the accepted cost analysis of 6,200 some dollars in initial construction to, for the upgraded reach code. So the difference there is not an overall savings. So for the, uh, for the study that shows an overall savings, who funded this study? I don't know who funded it. But it was through the California Energy Commission? It was presented through the, Ener the Ener to the Energy Commission for acceptance. Okay, and adopted at that point uh, for local jurisdictions to use for the justification? Correct. Okay. Does this apply to rebuilds in Coffee Park? It does not. At what point should I expect David Gewen to kick in my door and take my gas stove? If you already have one, you will not lose your gas stove. Excellent. Is there any intention in the near future of us trying to take people's existing gas infrastructure? Not that I'm aware of. Great, thank you. Any other questions? I have uh, a couple. First slide, if you can go to slide eight, the yearly per home emissions. There you go. Where would uh, all electric favored code fit on those bars? So it's the farthest, the, it's the red red bar. Oh, favored? No, favored. I'm sorry. Would it be in between the last two on the right? It would likely be in between the last two. Okay. And then regarding construction, going back to propane, any idea how many current Santa Rosa homes in the city limits of Santa Rosa have hard wire like we have natural gas, but it's not natural gas, it's propane. Is that a reality here in the city of Santa Rosa? 
I don't have an actual confirmation, but I saw data that showed it was 0.07% of households in the city limits have propane. And my, my belief is, it, through searching some of the old data, is that was established prior to natural gas being, uh, they were, those services were established prior to natural gas being uh, readily available wholesale throughout the city limits. So that's hardwired in, but even if we go with the all electric reach, you can still have your propane barbecue in the backyard. You can. Right. All right, any other questions? All right, this is a public hearing, so I'll open the public hearing. I have several cards on this item. First up, Ann Seeley, followed by Andy Ferguson. Thank you, Mayor. If I'd known this was coming up right away, the, the public part, I would have been up here faster. <laughs> <laughs> Anne Seeley speaking for Concerned Citizens for Santa Rosa. Please, Council, please do take this forward step in adding the all electric ready policy. There are many good reasons to adopt this. And you'll hear more about those from other people, I'm sure. But there's one that's really important to me. Most of California's supply of natural gas comes from the very environmentally destructive process of fracking. Something I believe must be reduced or stopped. You might think that this is not a big enough market to make a big difference here, but Every little bit helps. So I do hope that you'll pass this uh, this code. Thank you. Thank you. Andy Ferguson, followed by Bill Hauszak. Good evening, is this Mike? Okay. I'd like to relate a story, uh, distinguished council members and Mr. Mayor, a story that I heard last week at the Sonoma Clean Power Board meeting by board member Okrepke and Hopkins. They described the fight against the Kincaid fire. Computer models that were accurately predicting that fire's behavior and path indicated that it was going to burn all the way to the coast. Heroic efforts by firefighters and some luck with the wind saved multiple towns and communities in our county from devastation. It's hard not to believe that the fact that the five hottest months of July over the last five years in world history did not contribute to this problem. The only way to slow climate change is to massively reduce methane emissions from natural gas leaks that come from our aging gas infrastructure, as well as the large emissions that occur during natural gas development. Doing so, along with reducing and stopping other man-made methane emissions, such as from landfills and massive industrial animal husbandry, must take place to forestall the deadly march of climate change. The main point to remember is that methane is only in the atmosphere for about 20 years. The carbon dioxide that was put into the air when the first Whitney steam engine was developed is still there. Because methane occupies about 40% of the causes of climate change, taking methane out of the equation will give us time to deal with the carbon dioxide. Please pass the resolution as stated. Finally, I wanna thank the council for taking this issue head on. It's a difficult issue but it's one that needs to be addressed and you've done so admirably. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Howie, Zach, followed by Mike Turgeon. Bill here. No. Uh, Mike Turgeon, followed by Christine Weiss. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, 
<clears throat> last week a vocal part of the community, the builders in particular were calling for continuing business as usual. However, making some relatively easy changes to business will go a long way toward uh, reducing greenhouse gases. And we've made some good strides in that direction. Stopping methane's and methane emissions by ending the use of natural gas, of course, is why we're here tonight. But also reducing and capturing dairy farm and livestock emissions and not putting organic food waste in landfills are all steps that must be taken. And we've moved in that direction with the zero waste ordinance, which is we'll be studying again and taking up next year. And so the city council should do what we've spent almost a year putting forward and not shrink from carrying through on our reach code for home, new home electrification. But in, 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 in addition, it's gonna be important to educate the public as to why this is necessary for some of the reasons that Andy just mentioned, to ensure that there's a safe future for Santa Rosa as well as other communities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Christine Weiss followed by Kevin Conway. Oop, hold on a second, there you go. You're... Hi, my name is Christine Weiss. Um, I've been in Sonoma County for over 30 years. I grew up in the Central Valley in the Farm Belt, watching them build houses upon houses on the best agricultural area because of money. It saddens me immensely. I come to Sonoma County, um, I'm 28 years old, I bring my kids here to have a better future. I believe that we have had a better future, but right now I'm concerned. I too, I support this tremendously, and at the same time, I'm, I'm questioning it. How are we gonna replace what we have in place right now and, not prevent, uh, pre and how we prevent future problems? I hope that nuclear power is out of the equation. If you get rid of all the gas, that means more electricity. That means the power lines that caught on fire that created this last fire, um, where, what are we gonna do? I just, I just, I'm concerned because I wanna make sure we're thinking out of the box that we don't make a bigger problem for our future. I have grandkids and I'm, I think about it. The, I looked so forward to grandchildren and now I'm thinking, what do they have to look forward to? I'm an organic gardener. I have been since I was a kid. I have my own chickens. I use the fertilizer from my chickens. I use my eggs, they're all organic. I create my own mulch and compost pile. Been doing it for years. My whole, I have no grass, I have garden. I, I, I hear you, but please, I implore you to please make sure this is the right answer. And I say, think out of the box. This is Sonoma County. We've, we've got a lot of great collaboration here, but I wonder, I hope we're not just following status quo because we all have a great intention and we are all concerned. Is it the right direction? I don't think that all electric is the right answer. I don't think that gas is the right answer either. How can we even have a full, we wanna go solar, because I'd love to go solar, but there's a big tree behind my house that, that shades my yard. I'm not educated enough to really figure out how to get solar into my house so that I don't use the gas that I have and the electricity that I have. Maybe combining them, maybe combining stuff so that we use less of each. I don't know, I just, I just want people to please think out of the box, think beyond California's decisions, because I think there's more. And I think we're making a big decision here to go all electric when I think there's more that we can do. My father worked for pg and &E and retired. I watched him set up all of, um, oh, my time is up. I just, please think out of the box and please be open-minded. Thank you. Kevin Conway followed by Maddie Hirschfield. Good evening, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, thank you for the, the full attention and the hard work by the Council and the staff, with, uh, Jesse Owens and David Gew, and um, the work that's gone into having this come before us tonight. Over the long course of this campaign for going with this REACH code, I've heard the argument that we're moving too quickly, um, that we haven't done our homework. But as I've said before, the scientists have done their homework and the fact is that we should have been phasing out all fossil fuels 40 years ago. 
uh, when scientists first warned us that we had to act in order to avoid runaway climate change. As dramatic as it, it might sound, it's not hyperbole to say that we're facing an imminent threat to our existence, because we are. And with all respect to the prior speaker, I too have grandchildren, and it's, it's my concern for them and, and their future that I'm such a strong supporter of this uh, REACH code. Knowing what needs to be done isn't enough. Being willing to do what needs to be done isn't enough. It's only doing what needs to be done that can never be enough. And I think pushing the button tonight in support of this REACH code is the final step in doing what needs to be done, at least as far as this action is concerned. And I want to also uh, thank Julie Combs for her excellent service uh, to our city. And um, Julie, best wishes to you and to your husband for all that's ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Matty Hirschfield, followed by Richard Lane. Good evening, Mayor and uh, Council Members. Matty Hirschfield with the North Bay Labor Council. And I'm here to say that the North Bay Labor Council strongly supports this code. Um, there's a couple of things, though. It just while I was waiting for this item to come up, I got a text that the pg and is turning off all the power in a large swath of Sonoma County, so I'm sure that's going to be figured out uh, when we get there. But uh, we also would like to see a placeholder, if that's the right word, for um, for a just transition for all the um, uh, building, uh, building trades folks that will be out of work. Um, because they depend on other kinds of power. So otherwise, we're very, very much in favor, but we just want to make sure that there's a just transition for those who will be losing jobs and maybe transition into another. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Lane, followed by Ann Jordan. Uh, before I address the REACH codes, I just wanted to thank uh, Jesse and the Council for all the outreach you have all done on all of these issues. Um, and my assumption is that none of you ever sleep, and so I don't know when you recharge your batteries. Um, I spoke at the uh, Climate Action Subcommittee meeting in September and at that time suggested that we needed an alternate energy storage solution to go along with the REACH codes. And since then, we've now had firsthand experience with the power safety shutdowns and how difficult that reality is. And so I ask all of you, would you buy an all-electric house now, knowing that your energy may be turned off at any time for who knows how long? not a really viable option. I don't know that I would buy an all-electric house now with PSPS looming tomorrow. And I don't know when electricity is gonna be turned back on. Uh, to address uh, Chris Rogers' comment about the natural gas, uh, the, no one's gonna come in and steal your stove, but what's gonna happen to the natural gas infrastructure if all we're focused on is electricity? We've already seen what 10 years of a lack of maintenance does to a system. It's why we're having the fires, lack of maintenance. So now we stop maintaining the uh, natural gas system in favor of the all electric, and we are looking at a similar problem with natural gas down the line. Um, I'm with Coffee Strong, and I've talked to a number of my neighbors uh, who uh, are thinking about leaving Sonoma County now because of the fear and the stress and uh, the unsupported feeling that they have coming in the face of the PSPSs. And so I ask you all to add grid, res grid resiliency or microgrids or a program for affordable alternative energy before passing the REACH codes. Otherwise, we just have the REACH codes and no alternative to them. By having an alternative backup to go with the REACH codes, Santa Rosa would be a model for communities throughout California. Windsor, REACH codes, no alternative energy program yet. So I ask you all, take a step back, get some balance, and let the neighbors, my neighbors, feel like they are really being supported in this whole program. We will do all electric, we will give you an alternative electric solution rather than we're gonna take all electric and you're on your own. We'll see a mass exodus from Sonoma County with just all electric and no alternative. Thank you. Thank you. And Jordan, followed by Julie Etchell. Thank you for letting me speak, I appreciate it. Um, I have to add uh, the previous speaker, I agree. I think that approaching this in quite such a, a fast manner is a little premature. Uh, I would be in favor of the, I believe it's called the favored code, but this REACH code, in my opinion, I'm just speaking for myself as a citizen who's in touch with the community on, on Facebook and other social media here. Um, 
what I hear is people think this is just way going way too fast. Um, if I may point out, your own staff report says that uh, this is not actually required. Uh, you're, you're ahead of the curve, which is always great and wonderful, but in this case, I think it's not great to be ahead of the curve because you're getting ahead of yourselves. Having gas available in homes is really important. As I said, I've talked to a lot of people who lost their electric service during the recent PSPS that we had, uh, but they were still able to cook their food, keep their homes warm, and have hot water, especially for seniors, for people with small children, for people who are medically fragile. These are really important considerations, and that is something that you'll be taking away from people in new housing if you enact the REACH code as opposed to the favored code. I believe it's called favor, and you'll have to correct me if it's, the, the intermediate code is what I'm talking about. Um, and having gas, it's even more important now because on October 9th, uh, excuse me, October 18th, NPR reported the CEO of PG&E is predicting frequent strategic blackouts for the next 10 years. 10 years of blackouts all the time, and we're all supposed to sit around huddling in the dark. I realize not, you know, the rest of us, but the new people in their new houses, they will be sitting there in the dark or going to a hotel or something. And that is not going to be cost effective for them. You talk about cost effectiveness, that's not it. <sighs> Finally, it's easy to say this is a small thing, um, but it's not. This is the begin beginning of a much bigger change to the code. We all know that. You're talking about just the new housing, but in fact, we're talking about you know, the next step will be the, uh, it will be all electric for renovations and people, you know, changing their houses around and stuff and 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 uh, uh, repairs. So if your hot water heater goes out at some point, probably in the next four or five years, guess what? You won't be able to get a new gas hot water heater. You will be required to go electric. That's all that will be available to you. And your costs will go up, so that is not cost effective. Or a lot of people, I know people that have waited for 15, 20 years to finally get that beautiful kitchen they want. Well, they're not gonna get a gas stove in that kitchen. That's not gonna happen either. These are all, we're going too fast with this. We need to take a step back, watch Berkeley, watch Windsor, see how this goes for them. Give it a couple of years, give it three years till the next go round of discussions about this and see what happens. Because I think there will be a backlash. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Julie Etchell followed by David Petritz. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, thank you for your time this evening. Uh, my name is Julie Etchell. I'm a realtor here. I was born in Sonoma County, and I'm still here. <laughs> um, I kind of echo the last two speakers in that the recent power service shutoffs have me very, very concerned about what might happen if we move to all electric. Uh, my grandmother um, is in her 80s, and her home went to mid-50s. Um, overnight when the power shutoffs occurred. Um, tonight it's going to go to, I think, somewhere in the 40s. The next night it's going to go almost to freezing. Um, and if we have all power homes and no gas for furnaces, there's no way to heat the home. Um, so if, if that's really something that you'd like to do, maybe turn off your furnace overnight and see how that feels. Um, it's just, it seems like it's a little bit too much too soon. Um, there might be something like battery backups um, to put into place so that people can have some way to heat their homes and survive through these frequent power service shutoffs that we're seeming to come up on uh, with PG&E. Um, so anyways, thank you for your time, and please consider just taking a small step back from all um, all power right at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. David Petritz, followed by Chris Thompson. Yeah, um, thank you. 2748 uh, Lakeview Drive, Santa Rosa. And um, I would like to express my support for the REACH code, um, notwithstanding some of the concerns, but I think that uh, with climate change being as real as it is and as fast as it's coming, um, this is a, a good first step. And yes, maybe the, maybe as quickly as possible, um, really institute some things with um, battery backup. But I commend you for um, 
uh, taking this first step. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Thompson, followed by Tom Amato. Oh, yeah, waiting to see my name up there. Hi, good evening. My name is Chris Thompson, and I'm from the Oakmont Democratic Club. I am a senior. I've experienced I don't know how many shutoffs up at Oakmont, and I'm still here. This is bigger than the issues that some people feel are necessary to bring up against a REACH code. The REACH code is, is full of exemptions for people who uh, it would not be appropriate, and it's about new building. It's about new uh, structures. We're not talking about the existing structures. I don't understand why people I can't look into the future a little bit and look at our young people who are sitting right down in front of me down there, who's, they're gonna live with this. This reach code measure does not stop people from having and maintaining mobile propane tanks that can be used for cooking or even operating a generator during a power outage. New homes, by the existing 2019 code must already, right now, have solar panels. And technology is coming onto the market that will enable solar panels to be used for power without battery backup systems. Induction stovetop cooking is vastly superior, easier, and safer than cooking with natural gas and does not emit the indoor air pollutants, nitrous oxide and carbon monoxide, which pose health risks and have now been linked with rising rates of asthma. Induction cooking is also far safer because the stove burners and surrounding environment do not heat up or have any dangerous heat or flame during cooking that can accidentally harm children the disabled or the elderly. Please pass the REACH code. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tom Amato followed by Christine Hoex. From uh, the Oakmont area town. And uh, I expect to lose my power the mar tomorrow morning, but I would buy an all electric house in a heartbeat, uh, partly because I'm thinking about the future generations, not just my own convenience. Um, natural gas is not the answer. Natural gas systems in our county are plagued with leaks and faulty equipment. Gas was uh, turned off to many homes in Cloverdale, from Cloverdale to West County during the recent Kincaid fire, and faulty valves and leaks revealed a distribution system of pipes and valves around 100 years old in disrepair. Trying to fix, maintain, and upgrade this system promises to be an enormous waste of consumer and public expenditures in the future. Furthermore, natural gas homes, unlike uh, electric homes with solar pa panels with battery backup, will not operate during earthquakes, possibly for several months. Natural, natural gas homes can be disrupted as far as their gas connection. Uh, many years ago when the big quake hit in the Bay Area, that some of you might have also lived through. Um, I happened to be meeting, when the big shakes happened, I happened to be meeting with people in Shakey's Pizza, of all places, and one of the things they noticed is how much the city of San Jose rocked and rolled. The more gas we have is not an asset. Uh, all electric is the way to go, and we thank you for your support. Thank you. Christine Hoex, followed by Laura Nish. Christian Hooks, and I am with uh, 350 Sonoma. Uh, so I'd like to start out by saying that I have a 99-year-old mother uh, who lives in Rankin Valley, and she we've gone through several, and we'll go through another uh, power shutoff. Um, and yes, it gets cold. And um, but to not to pass this reach code now is not acceptable. We, it's a, it's a crisis. We, we are in the middle of a climate crisis. We are already experiencing existential threat from this climate crisis, um, from people who have lost their home, who are in danger of losing their home and their lives, caused by climate. And we're gonna, and we're going to be in an age of non sequiturs to get a propane, uh, generator or a diesel generator so you can have 
power during and to continue to use gas when we've when we're having for the power shutoffs because of fires that are being exacerbated by global warming. I mean, it's crazy making. So what we have to do is move forward in spite of these non sequiturs and moving away from fossil fuel infrastructure with natural gas and fossil and the infrastructure that it, it takes is the right thing to do now and we can't wait, we have to move forward. And we need education and town hall meetings to help answer all these questions that people are so concerned about. So we need you to be leaders and to lead with this because now is the time to do this for the future. So um, please, but please, let's let's engage the public and, and educate everyone about the solutions. There are tons of solutions. Um, for all of these things that people have had concern uh, concerned about. But going backwards um, and, and not passing this, it's not a solution. The solution is to move forward, all electric, ready, now. Thank you. Thank you. Laura Nish, followed by Philip Kerr. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Laura Nish. I'm the Executive Director of 350 Bay Area, which is a climate change organization. And we have an active group here in Sonoma County, 350 Sonoma, and I am a Santa Rosa resident and very pleased that this board is willing to take up this conversation and hopefully brave enough to uh, pass real action to uh, address the climate change problem. So I think it's been pretty clear that our survival really does depend in particular on shutting down the natural gas network. This is the beginning of the process. It is, again, said this before, it's kind of the least we can do to stop extending a distribution network that is causing so much trouble in our atmosphere. Um, it, is, it is quite heartening to hear from our community members deep concern about the public service power shutoffs. And I, of course, agree. Uh, just as a point of fact, 30, about over 30% of the homes in the United States, and I don't know what the statistic is here in the county, are already all electric using outdated technologies, which are more expensive. And I, I think there is some, I, sometimes it concerns me talking about our community as if there aren't people, a lot of whom are in our low income community, they're already on uh, all electric systems. So we do need to come together and take care of those people that are vulnerable in our community. So we're not, now we're talking about new homes, which is a slightly different uh, population that we're, that we're directing these comments to. Uh, these new homes by this code that you're going to adopt tonight will all have solar on their roofs. There exists technology today that is very inexpensive, allowing those homes to run their systems during sunlight, admittedly, on um, their solar power, their solar panels without having batteries and battery prices are coming down. So I think confounding those two problems is not wise and what we need to move swiftly to start shutting down the network and then figure out what the next steps are. Um, I'm not sure if we're ever gonna have hand-to-hand -hand combat over gas stoves, but you know, we are gonna keep pushing this agenda and see if we can replace some of the older gas technologies with newer and super efficient all electric technologies. Um, also, in terms of the all electric favorite option and the amount of carbon, di carbon dioxide that would go into the atmosphere, the, it wouldn't be a bar in between. It would totally depend on how many people replaced gas systems with electric systems because there would be no strong push to get them to accept that. So if you look at the difference, you have an opportunity to save four times the amount of CO2 going into the atmosphere. So thank you very much for your considered deliberation over this issue, and we encourage you to pass the all-electric reach code. Thank you, Phil Kerr, followed by Cindy Bishop. My name is Phil Kerr. I'm the CEO of City Ventures. I'm here as a builder, a developer, and a businessman. And uh, what I say next might come as a little bit of a surprise. Um, we're the largest uh, residential builder in California of solar all-electric homes. We've built over 3,000 solar all-electric homes in California. Uh, they've sold extremely well. Uh, we're right now uh, the largest, I think, largest residential builder in uh, Santa Rosa. And we're uh, pulling permits this week on 238 homes at Round Barn that will be solar all-electric homes. 
So uh, the future you're talking about is already here. We've been doing it for 10 years and it's not that hard. Uh, it's not that complicated and it's a better home. Uh, what we've been building is based off, the reason we went to solar electric is based off three things. It's based off livability, it's based off cost, it's based off safety. So in terms of livability, there's been some big changes along the way. Induction cooking, if you look on consumer reports, the top nine stoves are induction. Number 10, I think, is gas. The, the, the future's come in terms of cooking and induction stoves are just better stoves. Our buyers that, that come in, they might have a question about gas at first, they use the induction stove, they think it's pretty cool. Last power outage, I have my induction stove and power went out and I thought, oh, I'll go get the propane stove and I was like, I can't burn this inside. I was like, oh wait, that's what I was doing before. Um, so it's, it's, it's a better stove. Um, the technology's come a long way in terms of uh, heat pumps, in terms of electric hot water heaters, all that is what, made, is what has made it possible to build solar all electric homes that are better homes. In terms of cost, as a builder, as a businessman, as someone that is doing this for our business to drive returns for our investors, the reason we do solar all electric is you pull out the gas infrastructure, you save all that cost. But more importantly, you're not waiting around for PG&E to install a gas meter, which will delay your home closing by a month to two months waiting for that gas meter to be installed. If we can get rid of the electric meter, that'll be great. We're working on that. This, the homes in, uh, in uh, Round Barn, uh, we're working with Tesla to provide batteries uh, so that there'll be a battery option there as well to provide continuous electricity during a power outage with the solar. Solar standard, batteries coming as well. Last is safety. Um, from a fire standpoint, when we developed the Round Barn project, we pulled gas out on purpose. Uh, just for the safety of that system not being in there and having gas in the neighborhood, uh, as well as air quality and the safety within the home. So as a steward of the environment, but mostly here as a businessman and someone who wants to build the best homes, solar or electric is real easy. Thanks. Thank you. Cindy Bishop. Oh my God. Thank, you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council. It's time for us to do something. And I am in favor of the REACH code being passed. And I'm grateful that the council's considering passing it like Windsor and other cities. And uh, I'm also grateful for the comments of everybody, including those about educating the public about the different aspects of um, what's possible to address the concerns that some people raised against passing this. Uh, I think it will be for cleaner, safer homes. I think it's important to take the measure now, not wait, and the methane issue is pretty serious, and this is a great way to address it. So uh, I'm here not for an organization, just as a resident of Santa Rosa and the planet, and I hope you'll pass this. Thank you. Thank you. Guy Connor, followed by Ann Cummings, Jacopetti. Petty. Hi, hi, my name is Guy Connor, 1898 Bennett Meadows Lane, Santa Rosa. I first came to a city council meeting in 1984 in this, in the, in this room. I, w I was here because I was appalled by some of the things the city council was doing and I wanted to do something about it. I'm here tonight for a much better reason, a happier reason. I'm here to thank each and every one of you for doing something that makes us, makes us all proud to be Santa Rosans. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Jacko Petty, followed by Miles Bergen. Yes, uh, I'm Ann Jacopetti. I'm here from 350 Sonoma. Uh, I'm a retired teacher after 50 years in the classroom and mother and grandmother. So I come with all of these concerns and just can tell you that I have Greta Turnberg's words ringing in my ears as she spoke to the uh, assembled UN why haven't you done something? You must act. And I hear that I hear the feeling that I've had from the lack of action. I've known about climate change since the late 70s. I've been working and trying to live simple. There was a time, you know, when we 
thought small is beautiful was the way to go. And we're very far down the road and we have very little time left. So thank you for doing your due diligence, doing the work and coming to the point of actually making a first step. That's always the most difficult, isn't it? When you're up against people's fear of change and habit. But this is what we all have to deal with in our lives. Laura spoke my mind on uh, the energy aspects of this, Laura Nish, but I would just want to tell everybody that I've done the same. I've made my house all electric. My lovely wrought iron stove is now an infrared heater. My old gas range, which I thought was better than the old fashioned electric stoves, but it was polluting my environment. I now have an induction stove, a wonderful stove top that I got at, uh, I got it for $375 over where, what is it, the uh, place where you can buy used appliances. I couldn't believe it. It's fantastic. So the change is positive. Thank you for moving in that direction. I hope this is only a first step. Thank you. Miles Bergen, followed by Christine Byrne. Good evening, Mayor Schwedhelm and members of the council. My name is Miles Bergen. I'm a board member with Sonoma County Conservation Action. Uh, I know you guys have been here for a long time today, so I'll try to be relatively brief. Uh, Sonoma County Conservation Action strongly supports the ordinances in front of you today, because quite frankly, climate change is the single biggest crisis that we face. And the world's top scientists give us 11 years to keep our um, global, global temperature warming between one or below one and a half degrees Celsius. And here in Sonoma County, building energy is nearly one-fourth of our county's greenhouse gas emissions. And even though we have 11 years, we're still waiting for action at the federal level. So our local governments should be looking to do what they can in the short term, and this ordinance is a great step in the right direction. Um, we've already covered cost. We've already covered the carbon emissions and the climate impact of this ordinance. Uh, I want to touch briefly on, on fire safety. Uh, natural gas lines create danger in the event of wildfire. Uh, potentially igniting and spreading fire through our neighborhoods, um, a hazard that an all-electric system doesn't, um, doesn't create. Uh, I've also heard a couple things in public comment that I wanted to mention. Um, first, there's a lot of concern over moving too fast with this ordinance. And while I understand these concerns, we need to create, treat this climate crisis with the seriousness it deserves. We only have 11 years to keep warning, warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Time is our most precious resource here, and we have to move fast if we're going to live or leave a livable planet to future generations. In terms of gas stoves, i got to say, the home I live in has a gas stove, and I kind of like it. Uh, but Sacramento Mud found that 92% of folks who try electric induction stoves preferred them over gas. And all of that comes with no risk of carbon monoxide poisoning from natural gas stoves. Um, so for all of these reasons, uh, we would urge you to pass this ordinance today and thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Christine Berg, followed by Sierra Downey. and I organize with Sunrise Movement Sonoma County, and I stand in support of the all-electric reach code um, because I am deeply concerned about my future. Moreover, I am deeply concerned about the future of my three-month-old nephew, Aiden Kumar Rai, who just lived through his first fire season here in Santa Rosa, where my sister had to take a fire mask, a smoke mask, and put it over his tiny little face. Moreover, I'm deeply concerned for our frontline communities who are disproportionately affected by climate disasters that keep occurring time and time again in our community. And as I come of age to begin considering buying a home here in Sonoma County, my concern is not whether I get a old fashioned, luxurious gas fired stove or whether I have an electric stove. What I am most concerned about is that you stand before us today and you make a decision for my future, the future of Sonoma County, the future of those that I love. Um, and make sure that we do everything possible to cut fossil fuel emissions. So what I ask you is whose side are you on? Do you stand um, uh, towards the uh, electric reach code and a livable future? Or are you going to stay on the side of polluting um, out-of-date technologies? Thank you. Thank you. 
Sierra Downey, followed by Michael Kennedy. My name is Sierra Downey, and I'm an organizer with the Sunrise Movement. I've lived my entire life here in Sonoma County, and I've actually often envisioned my future here. But that future is becoming more endangered every day. I'm 25 years old, but I am already tired. I am tired of walking out into a windy, warm October night and feeling anxiety squeeze the air from my lungs, wondering if tonight's the night for the next fire. I am tired of seeing the fabric of my community fray under the pressure of each new blackout, no matter how Sonoma strong we are. I am tired of watching the CEOs of dirty energy companies toasting each other, while small family businesses and local restaurant owners deal with crippling losses in the face of energy cutoffs. But most of all, I am tired of complacent politicians bartering away my future for short-term profits. I and my compatriots are staring down a future darker than any generation before mine. We need clean, regenerative energy, and the time to act is now. You in those seats down there, you hold the power to help lift some of that darkness from our future right here in Sonoma County. I urge you to be on the right side of history. Please, please reach for that regenerative and equitable future for all of us. Reach out your hand and Generation Green New Deal will be there to hold it, will be there to take it. We are the future and we are watching you. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Kennedy followed by Steve Bertelbaugh. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Kennedy. I'm here as a member of the Climate Emergency Resolution Group in Santa Rosa, and also as a member of the Sonoma County Sunrise Movement. Um, hearing some of the comments earlier about this being too fast and being too much is, I don't know if it makes me sad or angry, but I stand before you, I'm sure as many others, with friends and families who lost their homes during the Tubbs fire in 2017. I also, had um, completed my undergrad at Chico State, so I have friends and family who lost their homes to the, to the campfires in 2018, and I'm someone who was evacuated a few weeks ago during the Kincaid fire. And so for me and my community, what we want from our city council is for you all to demonstrate that you are fully committed to fighting the climate crisis and Supporting the, the all electric reach code is a significant way that you can do that. Um, and it's a step in the right direction and it's, it's something we need. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Bertelbaugh followed by Amy Ryder. Thank you, Mayor Sweat Helmand members. Um, my small contribution to this issue is that one of my first jobs was riding around Chicago in a truck with 80 other trucks roaming the city looking for leaks in gas lines. I try to think about the number of years that leaks have been contributing to what we're dealing with right now, and it's more than I really want to think about. Gas does leak. It's very hard to keep it control. It leaks at every stage of the process. This is a small step to deal with a very large problem. I commend you for taking it. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Ryder, followed by Daisy Pistiline. Good evening, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Amy Ryder, I'm a local energy and sustainability consultant, and I heard some misconceptions that are really common about all electric construction, and I just wanted to take a moment and speak to the resiliency issue in light of the very real concern we all feel here in Sonoma County um, around the public safety power shutoffs. And so one thing in particular, again, in new construction, um, New appliances don't have pilot lights. They have electric ignitions. So if you have a new construction project, 
with a furnace, even if it's running off of gas, it will not work during a power outage. So the technology actually, for better or for worse, puts us in that situation. The good news is we have a solution. We have many of them, in fact. And so in addition to that, um, I should point out that uh, we've, we've heard some comments about battery storage and storage in general as a potential solution. Because all of these, these projects will have solar on their roofs, they have the automatic opportunity to really bank that um, an on-site solution. So I encourage any developers in the room to consider that as a feature. I imagine that those of us in the, uh, might be in the market of looking for a new home if we could upgrade to an all-electric home with a battery backup system. So I just, I just want you to, under, to hear kind of some of the challenges that I've heard uh, come from members of the public who are really concerned about this, and rightfully so, and know that there are some solutions. Induction stoves are a really good example. I've heard many times tonight the magnetic technology that's far superior to gas and uh, is really well accepted within uh, famous chefs uh, around around the world, really. Um, but just in our backyard, Thomas Keller of the French Laundry uses one. Um, so this is not new uh, technology. It's actually, uh, California has been a little bit behind the curve when it comes to all electric homes, and I'm excited to see it come here. So thank you. Thank you. Daisy Pisty Lynn. Good evening, my name is Daisy Pistiline, um, resident of Santa Rosa. And over many years I've worked on climate change, I've um, been away from Santa Rosa and engaged on this issue quite deeply and I can say that this is an extremely important step that we are taking not only because it's important for the health of our communities but also to set the precedent. Santa Rosa will be among one of the first cities in the nation to do this, and Sonoma County has a long history of always leading the way on environmental issues, and we can't stop now. This is, as many have said, the crisis facing our globe, and we have mandates from the voters of every city in this county from about 10, 15 years ago to say we need to move away from emissions and the city is far behind on its climate goals. So this is an important step forward that you can take. Furthermore, most natural gas, 90% of it comes from outside California um, by getting our power from local solar installations and local battery producers and getting it from the sun. We're getting away from bringing in a commodity that destroys communities. I have been in communities in Pennsylvania, in Oklahoma, in Ohio where natural gas fracking has destroyed the water supply and has damaged the communities, has given cancer and numerous other diseases to people in those communities. There's no reason from a climate perspective or from an environmental justice perspective to keep extracting natural gas from the ground when we have a plentiful, endless supply of power that we can get that is clean. And when I was a kid growing up, I lived in Guerneville. I remember how great it was to have a gas stove when the floods would come and the electricity would go out. But the reality is that when I was a kid, there were a lot of things that we did that we no longer do because we recognized that they were bad. And I would much rather these days be getting a solar and a battery as that backup generation during the PSPS than relying on gas, which a, doesn't work when the electric ignition doesn't, or the electric pilot doesn't exist. B, explodes during fires. And C, is something that I know is damaging this planet and my future on it. There is very little construction happening in Santa Rosa, but what there is should be paving the future, paving the pathway to the future for what we need to be doing. and. It will save money. A good friend at SoCal Edison was talking to me about this um, study that they did along with SMUD and LADWP that showed that it saved eight to $10,000 per home to get away, to get off of gas. So really there's no argument against it. And all we can do is say, yes, this is the future. This is what our community and our health and our planet are all calling for. So please vote yes. Thank you. Those are all the cards we have. This is a public hearing, so you don't have to fill out a card. If there's anyone else who would like to address the council on this item, please go up to one of the podiums up there. 
Seeing no one rise, I'll close the public hearing. Uh, council, based on any of the comments or questions that were we just heard, are there any additional questions for staff that you might have? Julie, any questions? No, thank you, and thank to, thanks to the public for coming out and speaking up on this. Okay, Ms. Fleming, you have this item? I do, thank you very much. Um, It is my honor and privilege to move this ordinance of the City of Santa Rosa adopting by reference with local amendments the 2019 California Energy Code, including all electric low-rise residential code and wave further reading of the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Comments, uh, Ms. Combs, did you wanna make any comments before we vote? Uh, no, I'm delighted we're at this point. Okay, Mr. Rogers, you had a comment? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And it's no surprise to people who've been watching these discussions that I've been a, a strong supporter of this. Uh, and just to be clear to the public, because we have seen a lot of concern from folks uh, based around misinformation, uh, there is no credible response to climate change that doesn't include decarbonizing our housing stock. It's not a question of will we, it's a question of when. And I think that's really where we've been trying to get at is there's never going to be a perfect time. There's always going to be additional challenges. Uh, but I will point out that uh, just today, the governor put a moratorium on fracking, uh, understanding that there are additional climate challenges that come from the uh, extraction of natural gas and we can do our part as well. I think uh, in our subcommittee, one of the most interesting and substantive conversations was around doing the full all electric versus doing the all electric preferred. And where we really got an interesting, I think philosophical conversation was about the need for individual change versus systemic change. And I was joking with John after the last meeting, uh, I, I think of it very much in terms of the ban that government put on CFCs when they started to see the ozone being depleted. It is an excellent example of where government intervention was actually able to stop and now reverse, the studies are showing, the depletion of our ozone layer for the good of the public through a systemic change. That's really what we're talking here about here is systemic change. We have been offering the all electric. We know some people have taken advantage of it, but there are misconceptions that are out there that are preventing people from utilizing it. I think that this will help a lot. I know it's not perfect, but I also feel very strongly that our council can't be paralyzed by fear when it comes to addressing our climate uh, crisis. And I did appreciate uh, the speaker who talked about her nieces. I have two nieces, uh, Miriam is four, Fiona is two, and I already know that even if we take these steps, their lives are going to be impacted by decades of inaction from other folks as well. So I will be moving this forward today. I'm very happy to be moving it forward, uh, but I've also been a strong supporter of climate justice from the dais as well. We can't continue to move forward if we don't bring people along with us. So I do hope that the council will circle back with our partners in labor to make sure that the workers that are displaced do have options as well, uh, so that we are moving forward as a community, not just moving forward as individuals. Any other comments? I just wanna make, oh, go ahead, Ms. Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is an issue that is close to my heart. Um, I believe that the discussions that we have around convenience um, are unfortunate because I think we're really talking about survival. And this is a situation where our personal conveniences have to be set aside so that we can survive as a society. I, I really do answer to the young people of our community and to my daughter who has what she's developing as what she calls her dark look, which is when I do something that crosses her, she's practicing giving me this look, which is not pleasant. So um, as painful as change is, um, it is, really beats the alternative in this situation. So I wanna thank the community for coming out in force and speaking in, in favor of our future as a civilization. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to comment, for those of you that <clears throat> follow our Climate Action Committee, it was a two to one vote and I was in favor of the all electric favored ordinance um, because there's that power of choice in the community also. And thinking about it, the long range impact and how <clears throat> quickly can a, can a community accept that change. 
In other words, a, a thought was, and I've heard some members of the community say that if you give me the choice and I'll be your biggest advocate as we start incorporating these different changes to all electric. Use myself an example earlier this year, got my electric vehicle. Just today we're starting the um, uh, solar installation of my house. It doesn't happen overnight. <clears throat> I know there's some other colleagues on my council that started with electric cars much earlier than I did, but it's that rate of change that we can all accept, whereas in the long run, I think it's gonna do us much better. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but for me, with the compelling reasons and the urgency of this, it, it is no time to delay. I was, you know, I missed the last week's vote, but I was impressed that it was a unanimous selection. And I'm um, pleased to be able to join uh, council. I know we haven't voted yet, but I anticipate it will be a unanimous um, direction and that uh, we are taking leaders in not only the North Bay, as our mission statement is, but hopefully other communities can model what the city of Santa Rosa is doing, not only with our decisions, but about the community discussions that we've had that have led us to this point. So with that, um, Madam Assistant City Clerk, could we uh, do a roll call vote, please? Thank you. Mayor Schwedhelm. Yes. Council Member Rogers. Aye. Council Member Combs. Yes. Vice Mayor Fleming. Yes. Council Member Oliveris. Aye. Council Member Sawyer. Aye. Council Member Tibbetts. Yes. That passes unanimously. Wow. It, what's nice about that is actually unanimous seven zero. We've had other unanimous votes, but we haven't had to seven. So, um, Madam City Clerk, are we ready to go back to 15.1? Hello? Council Member Combs, we are just transitioning back to item 15.1. Okay, we will be going back to item 15.1 once our abstaining council member is able to leave the chamber gently. <laughs> and it appears as though he's safely out of the chamber. So the city clerk provided me with the, the following report. Um, report of the protest hearing results. Again, this is item 15.1. Folks, if you could take your conversations out of the chamber, please. We still have city business. So report of protest hearing results. There was not a majority protest, meaning that the ballots cast in opposition to the establishment do not exceed those cast in favor when weighed by dollar amount. Council may now act to adopt the resolution establishing the downtown Santa Rosa Community Benefit District and the levy of assessments on properties within the district. I will need a motion and second to proceed with the vote. And Mr. Oliveras, I think it is in your court. Excuse me, uh, move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa forming the Santa Rosa Railroad Square Community Benefit District and levying the assessment in uh, connected in connection there with. And wait for to read the text. Second. We have a motion and a second. Are there any additional comments on this item? Seeing none, shall we do a roll call vote, please? Thank you. Mayor Schwedhelm. Yes. Council Member Rogers. Aye. Council Member Combs. Aye. Vice Mayor Fleming. Aye. Council Member Oliveras. Aye. Councilmember Sawyer? Aye. That passes unanimously with Jack Tibbetts, or Councilmember Tibbetts abstaining. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now if we delay just a bit so we can transition who has to abstain and who shall not abstain. Clean up. 
Mr. McGlynn, item 15.3, please. Item 15.3, public hearing, ordinance introduction, ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa modifying chapter 18-44 in its entirety in subsection B of section 18-04 dot zero one five of the Santa Rosa City Code concerning adoption of the 2019 California Fire Code is amended. Ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa modifying chapter 18 to adopt by reference with local amendments the 2019 California Building Standards Code, not including the 2019 California Energy Code, the 2018 International Property Ma Maintenance Code, and the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination Permit, permit and Waste Discharge Requirements and resolutions setting a public hearing for adoption of the ordinances. Jesse Oswald and Eden Hartage presenting. Okay, before us, before the council, we have our first reading of the ordinance for the building and fire codes. Uh, we also have uh, Chief Moon here to assist with any technical assistance and input as well. So this will look familiar. Uh, every three years, the codes are uh, adopted local, uh, by California. Uh, the building and fire codes uh, en encompass two general codes, but make up the set of 12. Uh, this ordinance we're specifically talking about, again, does not include the California Energy Code, which we just adopted locally. Um, and much like the other codes that we discussed, they were adopted in, or published in July of the California Building Standards Commission, and the effective date will be January 1st, 2020, and these codes, we don't anticipate a delay like we did with the uh, potential delay for the energy code. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the, the California building standards are statewide standards for all public and private buildings, just like we discussed before, and it includes the building, fire, plumbing, mechanical, electrical, energy, uh, disabled access, green, and other standards. And as a note to make sure we're clear, does, this adoption does not include the energy code. Uh, updated every three years by the Building Standards Commission, and they would be mandatory regardless of local amendments to uh, be enforced by local jurisdictions. Uh, much like we discussed in the other code adoption, local jurisdictions may adopt additional amendments based on local or regional topographical, climactic, or geologic conditions germane to each local entity. The uh, 2019 was adopted by the state January 1st and published uh, July uh, 2019, July 1st. We have until January 1st to adopt any additional amendments, and which would be effective the 1st of January and are effective and enforceable statewide. Uh, city staff have collaborated internally with other external peer organizations, many of which were identified in the previous code adoption uh, to, to be consistent throughout the region. Staff had significant outreach again with two city council study sessions, various me meetings with stakeholders, such uh, as building and fire code officials, informed developers, contractors, and general public. And the meetings were held throughout the city. All right, so just to continue on the stakeholders that met, we had the RICO Redwood Empire building officials that represented Marin, Sonoma, Mendocino, Napa County, uh, involved with the development of our building standards and building and fire codes, along with all of the Sonoma County Fire Authorities, fire prevention officers, fire marshals, chiefs. Um, representing Sonoma County Fire Chiefs Association um, involved in these, as we have in past years. So um, very collaborative, involved all the stakeholders, did the outreach. We've gotten uh, very little um, comment back other than can you send me your ordinance? We'd like to use what you've done. Um, <clears throat> That this is just a list of most of the agencies that participated and have in the past years as well. So some of the examples uh, as it relates to some of the stuff that we've been asked to look into because of our recent wildfires 
where our our new construction uh, building standards and how are, how are we addressing some of the existing built environment. Um, We've done that and we are continuing to do that through various processes. We have a CWPP process, which out of that will be a vegetation management ordinance. Um, so in, in light of that coming on in the future, we've added a couple permits so that when those do come online, we have the permits already in the standards to um, affect those ordinances. So we have a vegetation management and a fire protection plan uh, permit along with um, some of the ever-emerging uh, cannabis industry. We brought in some nationally recognized standards from NFPA 1, Chapter 38 specifically, to help regulate some of those new uh, emerging technologies there. <clears throat> As it relates to a lot of the collaborative efforts between the building and fire code officials, this is where the most of the work was done, and that's your Chapter 7A and the home hardening stuff. Um, and residential code section R333, essentially chapter 7A in the residential code. The code already addresses uh, fences and connections to structures in the WUI area and will require a non-combustible or limited combustible material to be constructed and attached to the building within the first three feet. As all these new homes will be built, they'll be sprinklered, so three feet would be the threshold for them. Substantial remodels in, and significant additions or remodels in the built environment, um, if they're not required to be sprinklered, would have a five foot uh, threshold or what we're calling a, an ignition free zone around the house. And this is to reduce the amount of combustible material up against the house, including fencing connections, veg, uh, combustible vegetation, landscaping, gorilla hair, bark, et cetera. You know, those types of fuels that are sitting right up next to the house. Um, based on some of the experiences we had in the most recent tub fire, 2017, ember cast was obviously a factor that can continue the spread of the fire. So like many agencies, our surrounding county being one of them, we're moving to a, an all class A roofing throughout the city, whether you're within the WUI or not. And that's to help protect those people not in the WUI from Embercast um, being an ignition source. And then within the WUI, um, we had wood shingles and wood shakes that you know we found, whether they were treated or not, were significant fuels in the spread of the fires. Okay, one of the other significant <clears throat> measures that we're bringing forward to be adopted, uh, we have discussed over the, the past year or so, uh, HCD, Housing and Community Development, the state agency provided some interim emergency housing measures uh, that were uh, available for use and adoption by jurisdictions in 2017. And then in 2018, the HCD proposed that they be permanently included in the code and they have provided those as uh, appendic appendices for both the residential code and the building code. So we're proposing to adopt those in their entirety and these, these uh, measures provide minimum standards that jurisdictions can look to for uh, a wide variety of emergency housing measures from uh, tents to to other other measures that you normally wouldn't find in a code. So it gives us those minimum standards that we can uh, have something to land on comfortably and provide input and, and approvals. And so uh, next steps, and, and start with our process and then go into the next steps. So we did our peer review with numerous agencies, fire agencies, building agencies, and, and those entities that we talked about, uh, RICO and our FPOs group. Uh, much of the final language has been incorporated into other code adoption packages uh, for fire and building agencies throughout the county uh, and the greater Bay Area. And I apologize, the slide is incorrect. Uh, due to some changes in our, our meetings. So tonight being the 19th will be the introduction of the ordinance ordinances for the building and fire codes. And then the uh, we're gonna be asking for a hearing set for December 3rd. 
So recommendation, it is recommended by the fire department and the planning and economic Develop department, development department that the council introduce an ordinance adopting by reference the 2019 edition of the California Fire Code as adopted and amended by the state of California and further amended based on local conditions for use in chapter 18-44 of the Santa Rosa City Code repeal existing sections not applicable to new codes and mod modify the Santa Rosa City Code to reflect the new model code. Recommendation to introduce an ordinance adopted by reference with local amendments, the 2019 California Administrative Code, 19 California Building Code, 19 California Residential Code, 19 California Green uh, Building Standards Code, 19 California Electrical Code, 19 California Mechanical Code, 19 uh, California Plumbing Code, 19 California Historical Building Code, 19 California Existing Building Code, 19 California Reference Standards Code, and the 2018 International Property Maintenance Code, along with the National Pollution uh, Discharge Elimination Permit and Waste Discharge Requirements. And Adopt a resolution setting a public hearing for December 3rd for adoption of the ordinances. Thank you, Mr. Owens. Um, <laughs> council, questions? Mr. Rogers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I appreciate the comments about embers being thrown, uh, which is something that we've seen. There was a question from the public that I think went to you, Mr. Moon, about uh, loose tan bark. Uh, and the potential for that being thrown in the wooey Was that contemplated at all in this discussion, whether an outright ban or some way to make that safer in the event that it does get thrown? That was brought to our attention at the fire department. We did speak directly with that caller. Uh, based on the conditions at the site, it was evaluated. We did inspect the area that was of concern, and our observations did not find there to be any issue with the current condition and the materials actually being applied to different areas within that location. And at this point in time, as I mentioned, we close that matter. Yeah, so pulling back from one specific mm -hmm. location, uh, my understanding is that you still have that throughout the WUI uh, as a permissible type of landscaping. Mm -hmm. Has there been any conversation about potentially eliminating that option for folks? Well, what we looked at for the newer structures and through our conversations in the study sessions, we wanted to take the step of the new construction moving forward. We would implement the three to five foot combustible free zone, if you will, and that's where we'll see that implemented initially. Moving down the road, we may look at coming forward to council and presenting maybe a retroactive type of ordinance as we roll through the CWPP process into a um, vegetation management ordinance. Okay, I appreciate that. And I know uh, there was a focus a number of years ago about assisting people in switching to drought tolerant landscaping. Perhaps there's an approach that we can do there from the city as well to try to incentivize uh, existing homes that have that type of landscaping. Definitely. Ms. Combs, do you have any questions? No, thank you, actually. That was uh, an area of concern of mine was the continued use of wood chips. Um, so thank you very much for addressing that. Uh, and I look forward to when it comes back uh, on the CPWW. Any other questions for staff? Okay, this is a public hearing, so I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any cards filled out? You don't have to fill out a card. Anyone in uniform can come down and talk. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. And Mr. Sawyer, I believe you have this item. Thank you, Mayor. I have two ordinances we'll see. and a resolution. I'd like to introduce an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, repealing Chapter 18-44 of the existing Santa Rosa City Code and adding a new Chapter 18-44, adopting by reference with local amendments the 2019 edition of the California Fire Code and wait for the reading. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional questions? Seeing none, can we do a roll call vote? Mayor Schwedhelm? Yes. Councilmember Rogers? Aye. Councilmember Combs? Yes. 
Council Member Fleming, or Vice Mayor Fleming will be marked to abstain. Council Member Oliveris? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Tibbetts is marked as stained as well. This passed by 502. Thank you. Mr. Sawyer, continue. Thank you. Next, I'll introduce an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, adopting by reference with local amendments the 2019 California Administrative Code, 2019 California Building Code, 2019 California Residential Code, 2019 California Electrical Code, 2019 California Mechanical Code, 2019 California Plumbing Code, 2019 California Historical Building Code, 2019 California Existing Building Code, 2019 California Green Building Standards Code, 2019 California Reference Standards Code, 2018 International Property Maintenance Code, is that correct? <laughs> And the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination Permit and Waste Discharge Requirements and wait for the reading. Second. We have a motion and a second. A roll call vote, please. Mayor Schwedhelm. Yes. Council Member Rogers. Aye. Council Member Combs. Yes. Council Member, or Vice Mayor Fleming will be marked abstain. Council Member Oliveris. Aye. Council Member Sawyer. Aye. Council Member Tibbetts will be marked abstain. This passes with five, five positive, oh, good Lord. Five yeses and two abstentions. Thank you. And finally, I'd introduce a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, setting a time and place for public hearing for the proposed adoption by reference of portions of the 2019 California Building Standards Code, California Code of Regulations, Title 24, and the 2018 International Property Maintenance Code each with local amendments, the proposed adoption of the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination in PTES permit and waste discharge requirements and the related repeal of selected sections of the Santa Rosa City Code that are obsolete or no longer relevant and waive further reading. Second. Do we need to specifically mention the date where we're holding this hearing or no? Okay. No, but you're welcome to. I'm good. I want to do a you know, perfect for three of them, so that was wonderful. All right, roll call vote. Mayor Schwedhelm. Yes. Councilmember Rogers. Aye. Councilmember Combs. First, let me thank the uh, presenters uh, for the hard work that they've done and continue to do on outreach on these issues and vote yes. Vice Mayor Fleming will be marked abstain. Council Member Oliveris? Aye. Council Member Sawyer? Aye. Council Member Tibbetts will be marked abstain. This passes with an affirmative vote of 502. Okay, thank you so much for that presentation. And nice job, uh, Council Member Sawyer, on reading all those. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Okay, we have no written communications. Do we have any cards for public comment? Yes. Gentlemen, it's approaching midnight here, and I very much have appreciated the opportunity to take part in this council meeting. Good night. Good night, Julie. Thank you. Uh, a couple cards. First up, uh, Craig Murphy, followed by Max Crone. Is Craig here? No. Max Crone? No. Brenda Gilchrist? No. Marcy Murphy? No. Michael Taroni? I'm very sad to see that there's a lot of willingness and sometimes even enthusiasm to perform another suite on Joe Redota Trail. Um, in addition to the fact that it, it's not paired with any willingness to provide a public piece of land for people to go on, which would then make it seem as if we're going to be doing the same thing that we've always been doing with homeless sweeps. We ask people if they'd like a shelter bed or if they'd like to go with Catholic Charities, and if not, then you have to leave or you're under arrest. These policies haven't worked in the past. There's a, there are major trust issues with Catholic Charities for people on the trail, and there are major problems with shelters that I think you're all aware of. Um, people with PTSD, people who've been abused in the shelters in the past are unwilling to, to go there. 
we've heard a lot of complaints from the residents. And I think this is a, this is a natural uh, result of us not providing places for homeless people to go is they go on the trails. They go on other pieces of, of public land where they weren't invited and this can create problems for the residents. And there may have been failures to address cases of grievances that the residents had. But failures to address those grievances does not justify sweeping everyone from the trail. Uh, it never has. And it is, I believe it's, it's cruel and unusual. I think it's a cruel and unusual practice to provide beds for people that we know they don't want or have them arrested or to tell them they, to go somewhere where they, they don't have any other place to go. And I think if we want to prevent ourselves from, from violating the Eighth Amendment, from, from, from actually carrying out cruel and unusual punishment, we need a policy that, that actually prevents that from happening. Not just taking, oh, this, uh, this sweep or this sweep. Did this one violate the Eighth Amendment? Were there enough shelter beds for this sweep? Or were there enough shelter beds for this sweep? We can't even normally find out from Catholic Charities how many shelter beds they have preceding a sweep. It always varies a little bit. Uh, you know, we don't really know. It's, it can be up or it can be down. But we know that there aren't enough shelter beds for the total homeless population in Sonoma County. So we need a policy that we need, we need practices in place that actually provide people with places that they can go. Not just judging this sweep or this sweep. Is this one, do we have enough shelter beds for this sweep? You know, that, that, is, that is something that I think would, would really actually make, uh, that, that, would, that would be embodying the ideals that we, that we represent. And housing is a human right. I think it's great that we're reaching out to private landowners, but a human right shouldn't depend on the whims of private landowners. This needs to be a piece of public land. Thank you. Thank you. I'd Mr. just like Sitting to give the council an update um, on our upcoming PSPS. Uh, the number of customers to be impacted within the eastern area of Santa Rosa city limits by the, P the P and G power shutoff event has been reduced um, from PG and E's uh, previous predictions. Uh, the most recent update from PG&E suggests that the power shutoff could affect uh, approximately 4,800 customers, uh, which would be a roughly 15,000 residents in areas within eastern Santa Rosa city limits. The shutoff is still expected to begin as early as 7 a.m. tomorrow, um, Wednesday, November 20th. Uh, PG&E anticipates the restoration of power will begin on Thursday, November 21st, around 8 a.m. And they have indicated that they will make every effort to restore power by that e by Thursday evening. Uh, a Nixle message went out with this information and updates have been posted at all of the City of Santa Rosa social media channels, next door and city's emergency webpage. And I would just like to thank the staff uh, that was working in the EOC, assisting in, in preparing our community and getting this information out. Thank you so much. I'll make the assumption that's all posted on the city's website that you gave earlier in this meeting. Great. Seeing no other items on the agenda, meeting adjourned.